and welcome to Saturday Showdown. We are here for the last Saturday Showdown of the regular season of LCK Spring 2024. I am Valdez, with me is Wolf and Chronicler today, and we're going to be breaking down DK up against Hamalife Esports. How are you guys doing today? Feeling pretty good. I'm going to this series feeling like I could tell you guys that anything could happen and we have no idea. But we're going to kind of try to walk you through what we think will happen, what our expectations are for this series, because it could be a wild one. Guangdong's 2-0 victory over DK, while amazing for Guangdong, and I, it was a really heartwarming moment, did uh, cast a lot of shadows on DK and also, uh, you know, knocked Fear X out. And there's just a lot coming together that I think if we had a different timeline that we went into, where DK would have just been Guangdong, this would be a very different series, especially after the Gen G series. But now, we're not feeling so hot. We're just gonna have to wait and see how it does go. Let's take a look at this. It's not over until it's actually over, Chronicler. Hamalife Esports contesting for second versus DK contesting for fourth. Hamalife Esports still do have a chance to make second. It would require T1 losing to DRX in our second match today. Yeah, I mean, it gives up the opportunity, right? D plus, on the other hand, they have never placed fifth. Um, so if they do not end up getting a big win here uh, and KT pass them, it would be their worst finish ever as an organization. On the side of Honda Life Esports, of course, did have some uh, rough seasons in 2022 when they went with that super budget roster, but 2023 end up buying a, a larger super team and now still maintaining top three here. So Hanwha looking much better this year, and it's already only spring, so we had to see some improvements for them last year, this time starting off strong. Big thing here is that if Hanwha do lose a T1's second round, or T1's second is confirmed, so they're in the second round of playoffs, in case DK lows, they are also locked into fifth. So there are still some stakes here, even though KT and DK are probably going to end up facing up against one another with how volatile those two teams are. I think you really want side selection. So still a very important setup here. There are some uh, more elaborate scenarios that we won't really get into because I think most of those are not I looking uh, too likely. Yeah, the tiebreaker is technically possible. Yeah, um, it would require DK to 2-0 first off and then KT to lose 2-0. Um, so not super likely, but you never know. It's not over until it's actually over. Um, let's take a look at some of the highlights from this matchup from round one, because Hamalife Esports versus DK, even in round one, was quite Hamalife Esports' favorite. Yeah, I mean, back in the early part of the season, we were seeing Hanwha play a little bit more comfort. Zekka sticking with picks like the Akali. Early days, we were like, oh, okay, the Akali's really broken with Storm Surge and stuff like that. Also, D plus really not having the coordination that's somewhat come through towards the latter part of this season. And, you know, if you look at the comps at the bottom of the screen, you can see, yeah, we did send a Nautilus, but we were still kind of figuring that out. It's the, the Quantum series really is so insanely uh, overpowering for how we look at this team because this was DK when they were, I think, at their worst, when they really were floundering all across, when the team synergy was nowhere to be found. And then after this, like two, three weeks later, Leading up to the Gen Z series, we saw them slowly get better and better. And it really felt like the series against Kwong, they went kind of back to this. They went back to a team that just wasn't able to match, that seemed completely clueless as to where they need to go on the map. Really disjointed between all the different parts. And I hope that they can bounce back from Kwangdong because otherwise it's going to be very reminiscent of this series. And this isn't even when Hanwha, I think, were at their best. I think Hanwha have really been continuously working on their synergy, leveling up over the split. And some small Doran moments notwithstanding. And Zekka obviously wanting to play as champion. They've been so much more consistent. Yeah, I agree that this the form we saw from D-plus in this round one series is what we did see from them in their most recent game. And... You know, I, I feel like that hasn't been a consistent thing for D-plus, though, in round two. They've mostly been better, so I don't think it's going to look the same way it did against Kwangdo, but that's the fear, right? And the shot-calling issue that's plagued this team for really the last four splits uh, still seems to be an issue, although the early game looks a lot cleaner. So maybe if you could just win the game super hard early on, maybe it won't necessarily matter. Yeah, we should also talk about Hamalife Esports and how they have been experimenting a little bit this season around. They have actually turned from a team that, you know, does kind of just play their champs into one that does go into a lot of different and new picks that people are talking about, and they're not scared to be the first ones to pick them up. 
and we are we're not looking at absolutely insane uh, priorities here, but there is just a lot of champions that are considered strong, but just not necessarily part of the meta. Fresh, the Jace top comes to mind as well. That I do think really give Humble Life a lot more versatility than this roster has had in the last couple of years. It feels like a lot of the players on this team are really happy to just lean into whatever they can get, which gives them a lot more versatility because I think their drafts last year were something we very have uh, very often were very unhappy. Yeah, about. I, I completely agree with Kronger because last year we had a lot of drafts where it's like, uh oh, it's the R5 comfort pick that makes no sense for the comp, and now we're seeing a little bit more of the oh R5. It's a little bit unusual, but it is going to actually be quite strong here. You know, the support Camille was really interesting. It didn't end up working out uh, in this game, unfortunately, but it was pretty cool to see that Delight's willing to experiment with stuff like this. They've been practicing it, preparing it. You see this dive here that works out. They'll end up ultimately winning the game, but Hanwha Life, definitely a team that is no longer as predictable as they often have been in the past, and I think that gives them a bit of an edge. You can see also Peanut, when targeted here in draft, you can see all the jungle bands there to the top right of your screen or the top right of the draft. Five. Yeah, he still ends up, you know, being willing to play the Xin Zhao, even though he's not as comfortable on it right now in this meta. And Peanut has just leveled up so much this season. We say that every season, but it's usually summer where we're like, oh my god, Peanut is it. Uh, but his early games have been fantastic. He hasn't been just a, I'm playing Poppy every game and winning. He's playing anything and winning. Yeah, Peanut, only, uh, his only problem is that he's not Canyon, and he has, of course, also had some Peanut moments. Uh, the OPGG player of the game score uh, oscillating between 10 and 1.3, I thought was a very comedic highlight. And what really we want to show with this as well is that Peanut specifically, uh, and it, it's it's not in the way that you see someone like Canyon show his dominance over junglers that are on the struggling side right now. It's really what he does for the team. Peanut isn't the type of jungler to get a lead and then start farming camps, but he will secure objectives, he will set up vision lines, and he will continuously dive enemy laners to the point where they can't play the game anymore. He makes the other junglers look bad, honestly. Like, if I if I can say it directly, because as you're saying, you know, Canyon will get massive leads, he'll make great plays in team fights, but Peanut will be like, no, I'm just gonna destroy this guy. <laughs> like, he even did it to Owner, right? Who's a fantastic jungler, right? So, um, Peanut is that guy, especially in regular seasons, and uh, we're expecting him to show up big when the time is right here in Saturday Showdown as well. We should talk a bit about DK now, and uh, some of the ups and downs of this team that we have seen, especially in their yeah. gold grab. <laughs> so, oh! So talking about, you know, Peanut crushing early game against uh, less experienced players like Lucid, that is going to be a problem potentially in this matchup because D-plus have been so good at early games and they always come in with a strong plan. Lucid Showmaker mid-jungle has been fantastic and they can get and extend these massive leads. Canyon did it for the squad as well last year. And then we get to the late game where you have to make decisions, where, you, where things aren't set in stone, you're not following a plan necessarily, and that's when things can go a little bit wrong. I will say that Lucid, you know, he's spent his entire career in challengers, crushing early games just like Canyon did, just like those win cons we were just talking about there where you get early leads and then finish games. In some of the games we saw from especially against Gen G recently, he's actually been very clutch and has been making really great decisions despite his team starting to lose the advantages they've had. And it's been great to watch because that's just a new look for a player who otherwise has just been sp spent most of his career snowballing. The big thing though is that for DK, it's the actual winning of the game, which is so funny because I think in many ways they feel like a Western team, but then when it comes to closing out the game, their issues are very similar to a team like Kwangdong, where just they, they keep, as uh, Kwangdong did actually very funnily, just beat them finding much better team fights. And that is something that even with the uh, Lucid, I think, having a little bit of a glow up, it, it's not enough to just win the early game, particularly against Peanut, who is part of some of the most notorious uh, hair loss comebacks of all time. <laughs> yeah, I think in this Kwangdo series, one of the big takeaways for me is that it felt like D-Plus didn't really understand how to play around Kwangdo's comp because it was somewhat unusual, right, with the uh, Aurelian Soul coming through and then Cuz having another carry performance on the Viego, as he often does. And just kind of trying to dive this Aurelian Soul that's fairly mobile and can turn fights really well did not go well for D+. And they did end up falling on their faces in a matchup that was really important, of course, going into our standings. And Quantum Freaks were able to secure playoffs off of this one. But I think D+, going into today's matchup, there's a little bit less pressure on them, I think, in terms of what this means. Because, again, Hanwha, to get second, has to have T1 end up losing to DRX. But I hope the pressure isn't on for these guys in, in a way that affects them. Because some of the drafting we saw and some of the play, and this felt desperate when it didn't need to be.
Yeah. It's just a team that I think is struggling to put it all together, you know, and uh, they have the pieces, but um, as a full unit, just haven't really seen it in some of their matches. And sometimes they randomly show up like against Gen.G, so wonder which kind of DK we are going to get today. Let's talk about our mid laners here, because we do have um, kind of wildly different champion pools. We always talk about Zekka's one, but Showmaker just kind of throwing darts at a board and saying, okay, I'll play this one today. Yeah, Zeka. I think we've said so much about his champion pool. It's it's exactly, uh, it's still the same, right? Obviously, plays great on melees, plays great on his champions, and should stay away from Corky. And for Showmaker, as you were saying, I think it it really is such a good microcosm of what is wrong with DK as a team, and that they're like he's played everything: supportive mid laners, like the Annie, like the Karma, where he gives up a lot of farm just to make impact on the map, hard carries, melee picks but they're not sticking to anything because it doesn't continuously work. Almost all the picks you see here for Showmaker as well are picks that give you prior or early game leads um, and picks that will give you the ability to snowball games. And that is what their MO has been this entire season. For Zekka, one thing I will say is his Talia has looked much improved at the end, which I think is a pick that we've been very critical about uh, for him over the course of this season and, and previous seasons. Very important right now in this meta, an S tier pick that he started to level up on, so that's a big boon for them going into this series. Yeah, the Talia is very important in this match because if Showmaker plays it, then we might see Zekka's Corky again, which uh, is one of the picks we're not exactly happy with. Um, let's talk about the bot lane as well because our 280 carries have been um, kind of different here. Viper definitely going for the high hyperscaling, whereas aiming going for a bit more of the early game. Different is a very, very good yes. uh, key, key word there, Valdas. The, the reality is Viper has been, as he has been in the past, but now with a team around him, extremely consistent. I think that Hanwha Live's love for the scaling champions is not by necessity. I think Vi uh, Viper is great with early game champions as well. But Viper is, I think, the most reliable individually, Pays obviously is very reliable, has a team that plays around him, whereas for aiming, it's the opposite. It feels like aiming, even if he does get an early lead, even if he does take a lot of resources, we're not sure that he can actually pull it through. Yeah, he's draining resources off the map, so it's hard to have a well-rounded win condition for D+, when it goes later, when he's already playing a comp, or rather a champion into a comp, where he doesn't scale that well, and he's taking all the money anyway, so some of the other picks on the team that could give them a well-rounded team fight are actually pulled back. He has a less tanky jungler, for example, to set up for him, so we haven't really loved this playstyle from him in recent weeks. Yeah, and I think it's very important for DK that both Lucid and Aiming show up in a big way because that's kind of what got them across the line individually against Genji as well. Let's talk about what our coaches had to say about this one. Always our favorite segment as they offer deep insights into what they think about the upcoming match. It's the last match of the regular season. We plan to close it out with a victory. Sick plan. Rather than a loss. Uh, that's a good one, Dandy. I agree with your plan. Uh, a master strategist here in Dandy. <laughs> no, I mean, look, these coaches aren't going to say too much going into this one because there isn't a lot of smack to talk uh, going into the series. And Zephyr says, you know, it's our last match. We're going to try our best because they want to do a good match for their fans, which is the most important thing, I think, for both of these teams. Dandy knows that this win doesn't necessarily get them second place. It's up to T1, so... I don't want to say anything too bold. I just wish at some point a coach, like, we are going to give away our draft strategy in this in these comments, and the teams <laughs> aren't going to know what hit them. We're going to, we're going to be one Lucian, then they ban it, and then you're in their heads. Yeah. And, uh, you know, maybe you just uh, say you're going <laughs> to do it, and then you actually do it, or you, like, really... Or if maybe they don't do even it, look at they, the coach's They're like, what is comments, going on? Because they're so used to seeing just we're going to play our best, and then it's like, oh, they just gave away the strategy. I wish we look at that. Um, <laughs> let's talk about our predictions for this matchup. We all went for Hamalife Esports. Keep in, note, uh, keep in mind, this is after DK won a game against Gen Z. We still voted for Hamalife Esports at the beginning of the week. And this is before DK lost to Kwangdong Freaks as well. I think that was just an overperformance from D+. Uh, I think the Kwangdong loss, unfortunately, is a little bit more close to reality um, and, and what we know D+, is weak at, which is late game decision making. I think Hanwha is, is much better in that regard. They've got Peanut, they've got late game Viper. I still think this is going to be a 2-0. Yeah, and if it is a 2-1, which I think is not that likely, it, it will probably be through some combination of Doran having, uh, having a moment and that mid-jungle 2v2 plus aiming really popping off on the side of DK, but doesn't seem that likely. I think the picks are going to be very interesting too. You know, do we deny the Lucian? Do we deny the Lee Sin away from the side of DK? And uh, it's all going to come down to the draft, which we will eventually get to as we do get ready for the opening, guys. We are done here on the pre show that's handed to the opening and then the casters for our Saturday showdown.
저희를 이길 수 있다는 그런 생각을 버리시길 바랍니다. 쏘리쏘리 플러스 기아 입장에서 최강 팀들 상대로 갚아주고 싶은 게 많긴 하거든요. 플러스 기아를 가볍게 보지 마세요. 2024. I am Atlas. I'm joined by Orcs as we look to delve into our Saturday showdown. An absolute banger between Home Life Esports and D Plus Kia. Both of these teams with a lot more to play for than what we saw yesterday. Yep, and with both these teams likely uh, potentially going to go up against each other in the playoffs, I think this will sort of set the tone. I think yep. Home Life Esports, especially after they beat T1 in round two, expectations are pretty high. You know, the hope is that they can challenge. T1 and Gen G, and maybe it won't be a repeat of the finals that we've had yep. consistently. And for D Plus, uh, Redemption sorely needed after the Quantum Freak series. Not to mention the fact that they still want to challenge KT for that fourth place. Of course, between fourth and fifth, you get side selection between one another, most likely, uh, unless the crazy outcome that the third place is not going to pick Quandong Freaks. That third place is not necessarily set in stone as it relies on Hum Life Esports winning today, and then theoretically, if DRX takes down T1, then second place could belong uh, to Hum Life Esports. However, unlikely. Yeah, and I believe D plus to uh, match KT, they need to end up having a 2-0 here uh, if they want to catch up in terms of game score uh, and hope that yes. KT end up getting a 0-2 as well. So a lot of work to be done, um, especially in such a hard matchup. But you know, all you can do is go into it with your best effort. Exactly right. And these teams are going to playoffs anyway, right? And so having momentum moving into it is going to be an important thing nonetheless. The last Saturday showdown of spring as well, of course, as this is the final week and the standings race is still unfinished. Very cool that we've still got a lot to play for with only a couple of days left of the regular season. You can see here, things are a little bit murky between Hummer Life Esports and D Plus Kia, despite the fact that uh, generally you'd, uh, you'd see the past favoring D Plus Kia quite a lot. Yeah, and I feel like we had... Uh you know, last, last split we had pretty big upset when Final Life Esports was able to take down D Plus against expectations. Yeah. Um, I feel like, you know, the, it has shifted though now to this powerhouse with three pieces of the Gen G roster uh, on this lineup has really raised them in people's expectations. And the dynamic has definitely shifted to one where D Plus is the 
so favor coming into a matchup like this, and now Hanoi Esports definitely in that position. Yep, Kellen is also knocking on the door of 3,000 assists as well. Uh, huge milestone. Uh, very cool that we still see Tucson and Wolf there on the list. Lots of uh, big names, of course. Life over in the LPL doing some crazy things as well. Uh, looking forward to uh, seeing whether we uh, catch him at an international event or something like that. We find it difficult to watch the LPL as we generally play in the same times. Fan prediction is pretty overwhelmingly in favor of Harmer Life Esports if you factor in the point that D Plus do have a lot more fans yeah. in general. Yeah, there's definitely fan uh, sentiment swaying this a bit because I feel like in terms of expectations for the series, this is good odds for D Plus. I would say so, yeah. Yeah, 35.7, I think they're doing pretty well there, but obviously... Whoa! Definitely a fan. That is a dope afro. Is that like a Bob Ross reference? I, I, I would assume so. Yeah. Uh, I do like that they made sure that his afro was dark as well to really let us know that it's a natural peanut afro. Yeah, uh, yeah. That they they didn't drawn just there. stick like a fake one on, you know, he grew it out. Yep, yep. Absolutely fantastic stuff. Great to have fans back here as well. And this guy took 24 different trade, uh, train rides to support D+. I think he, he came from Cambodia or something like that. Wow, that's some heavy commitment. Yeah. Um, gotta respect it. You know, there are definitely some super passionate fans who just want to see their teams do well. Absolutely amazing stuff. But let's welcome Hummer Life Esports out into Lowell Park to start this one off. The team with overwhelming predictions uh, from us especially. Well, we do believe that they should be able to take this one down, keep themselves in that race, put some pressure on T1 to take down DRX in our match that's coming up immediately afterwards, and to put them in good standing moving towards the playoffs. Yep, that's the thing, you know, we haven't always had a fantastic performance from this team. There's been a couple of hiccups, you know, where we thought, hey, the gap between them and T1 and Genji might end up being a bit too big to overcome, but they have firmly cemented themselves that it's a three-horse race for the title, uh, and not just a two-horse race. Whoa! So, okay, just stepping in front even though they're on the camera. Absolutely crazy. It is uh, just a complete cacophony out here uh, uh, in Lowell Park, and it is standing room only. As we saw, that guy standing in front yep. of, uh, of those fans there. Uh, now it is time to welcome D Plus Kia, the team that does have so, so much pressure on them to try and uh, find a better performance moving towards the playoffs. Otherwise, it will be a difficult task to take down even a flailing KT yeah. in the first round. Yeah, and realistically, you know, first round's one thing, but like, there's gonna be more to playoffs. Like, even if they yeah. somehow manage to make it through round one, I don't think things even remotely get better. So, definitely a breath of confidence for fans needs to come in here. Even if they don't necessarily win against Hot Life Esports, taking a game or just putting on a competitive series would make such a difference um, and be a big confidence boost, which they sorely need. No, absolutely. I think that there is a lot of potential to this team. They haven't quite found it just yet. Let's have a look at some of the stats here for both of these mid laners from round two, though. As we can see, Showmaker hasn't really found the same sort of success that he did find in round one, and you can see that mirrored in the stats. Yeah, I mean, honestly, neither of them really killed it in terms of the stats, but I uh, still think this matchup is a super important one. Mid jungle has been so vital so far this season in terms of uh, having impact on the map. A lot of picks like the Talia who are really high priority yeah. and a huge impact. And surprisingly, it kind of feels like with Azir being globally banned, it's really opened up the pool uh, and allowed a lot more flexibility there rather than people just slamming fist because Azir every single game. Yeah, I'm actually kind of okay with just keeping this global Azir ban for the rest of the year. Yeah. I'm okay with it. Maybe we can just like take away Azir's Q or Maybe something like hit, that so that he's just never played again. We can hit, hit up Vandral and just ask him to find a new bug every month. You know, yeah. Just say, fix it. Boom. Here's another. Just yeah. Lay it down. I reckon we could probably uh, work something out. We'll uh, we'll send him something on Twitter or something like yeah. that to figure it out. All right. Uh, Doran here. Let's see whether he can have an improved performance. I think the the most question marks from the previous Harmer Life Esports series up against KT was um, was Doran and uh, the things he was and wasn't doing and the teleports he pressed and didn't press. Yeah, I honestly feel like he kind of got gapped a decent amount and this isn't new for Doran. We've definitely had moments in his yep. career where he's just been outclassed in the 1v1, but typically brings it back in the team fights and finds a way to have impact there. I feel like I can definitely agree he wasn't really that on point in the last series, uh, so hoping to bounce back in this one. King in another player who I feel like is quite volatile. Oh yeah. Uh, we have seen him peak high at, I would say, the perfect time, yep. um, but definitely not always at that level. 
Yeah, and I think that he has been improving over this season as well. I think in round one, if you especially asked me, I was a bit of a, a king and ante, as I have mentioned in the past, but uh, has definitely had some better performances uh, and hasn't been the problem for D+. They have problems elsewhere um, yeah. around the map, and often it can change from game to game, and we'll just have to see whether they can all fire at the same time, because if they do, this team has a lot of potential and a lot of power, and we'll see whether it's maybe today. And I think get that. one of the concerns that's been talked about is the uh, decision-making in the mid to late game for this team, and I feel like... Over the last two, three years or something like that. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's not a new issue. Ever since they lost Barrel, man. Uh, yeah, you know, <laughs> Perhaps pe people who are like, yeah, it's all about the mid jungle uh, back in the Canyon Show Maker days. Perhaps they were missing the the extra key element. Yeah, um, and that is a crazy person in the bottom lane. That's what they needed. Yeah. Kellen is way too level headed. Yeah. That's not what you need. Uh, if you're D plus, a little bit unhinged and go for the crazy plays. Well, we're going for the crazy bands. The rumble is going to be taken. I don't know whether it's a crazy band. I was just looking for a segue. I didn't find one, and uh, that's just what we're going to have to get. We are here into pick and ban, though, for the very first game of our Saturday showdown. The rumble removed from King and does make a lot of sense uh, because he has been playing very, very well on the champion, and there is Lucid Lee Sin taken away. Yeah, on my Esports going very targeted with bands. I, I have to say, it feels like recently there hasn't been much room for this in the first three. It's very much been. There's a lot of power picks that are available in the current meta, and they just be have they are just being heavily targeted. So this puts weight on T Plus to really carefully decide on what you're banning. You know, Senna, Ooh. Varus, uh, still things like the uh, Lucian, the Smolder available. We often see so many AD carry bans uh, in the early rotations. Callista, I think, might end up just being that third ban coming through. And do you, you know, first pick Smolder in that case, though? <sighs> You know, I'm not huge on the first pick Smolder. I feel like Smolder, you know, there's definitely other things you need to kind of make it work. Um, but I think it's something that you can definitely leverage power with with Hunter Life Esports. Like, we often see, like, the Karma first pick into Smolder on three, things like that. They um, don't, yeah, they don't seem like much of a, a, a Karma team, though. Just no, because you have Zekka. Definitely not with Zekka. How about Smolder Yone? Is that a combination that works? You know, we're not seeing it. Maybe they can, maybe they can show it to us. Yeah, if that's uh, a strategy they can go for. Whereas, obviously, you know, D plus. I think if Smolder was left open, you know, it's an option to go like Karma Smolder them. Showmakers had a really good Karma games. Yeah. In the past, but Ooh, what they what? have to go for should just be the Quister. Yeah, no surprise here. Um, and then the first pick for Hon Life Esports. Um, Zeri first pick. Yeah, Nautilus and Vi open makes that dangerous. They could end up yeah. going for uh, the Vi themselves, but I think they would like to keep that open because they often like to go things like the Poppy for Peanuts. So they'll just go for the Lucian, uh, a pick that has had very mixed success recently. Yeah, uh, this, this first pick actually yeah, probably the best possible outcome for D plus Kia. Yeah, we have seen, I mean, even Gen G, their only series loss uh, against KT was back to back Lucian games. Yeah. Uh, Lucian, is, Lucian has been very good at losing yeah. uh, here in the LCK, but also very good at being priority picked. That isn't a Felios. That is not what I was expecting. As Lucid thinking about picking away the Poppy. A lot of options here, and of course, Poppy has been a champion that Peanut's been going to recently, but he's 8-0 and zero on Malkai as well. Um, doesn't do a heck of a lot of losing, uh, as they are in third place by a decent margin here on the side of Hummer Life Esports. But still, lots of options as far as denial, and it will be the Vi taken away. I think the, the Vi is such a good call because it's also a denial. Uh, the Aphelios can really struggle. Often people like to drag. I mean, this is true for a lot of AD carries, but because he's got a limited range, Nautilus Vi, very effective against him. Because Lucian's already locked in, you know Nautilus is going to come through. And by denying the Vi, you will move those really powerful point-and-click, uncleansable CC for the enemy team. Obviously, Maokai is going to come through, still has that point-and-click element but doesn't have the ability, uh, it is cleansable. And yeah. undoubtedly we'll see aiming either go cleanse or there'll be a Mikhail's coming through or something along those lines. Now, I'd expect if they want to go support here, they could just bring it out. Uh, they could go for the Nautilus if they really wanted, or they could just go for an Enchanter to pair up. You know, the Milio is a possibility. We've seen that matchup a lot in uh, earlier in the season. You could even go the Lulu. Or Mordekaiser, yeah. Yeah, um, I mean, that for sure. I think that's what everyone would think in this yeah. situation. I was assuming that it was going to be Mordekaiser, but instead they're going to stray away from that. Will be the Aphelios Lulu towards that bottom side. Um, basically works uh, the same way that the Zeri Lulu is going to, but I feel like you do have a little bit more fighting power maybe yeah, earlier on. A bit more early pressure even in the matchup. So we'll see how... Obviously, I feel like it's pretty straight up 
It's early draft, you know, both teams picking the bot lane, both teams picking their jungle, nothing too crazy going on here. And I feel like that does give a bit of an edge over to D+, simply because of the fact that, you know, they can start banning away mids here, they can pick mid on four, and then they can take counter pick for King in, in the top lane. Uh, there are already a few top lanes, well, two top laners banned by Honolife Esports, so if there's something else they're worried about, they could look to trim it down here. Yep, the Perhaps Aatrox the could Aatrox. be looked at. Yeah. yeah, I've heard Kingen is a bit of an Aatrox player. Yeah, I hear about that. Um, yeah. Not sure where people are getting it from, but uh, that is uh, word, word on the street. Uh, the Karma taken away from Showmaker makes a lot of sense. I think that um, Ari is sort of sneaking through. Uh, yeah, Ari got... Vi. Super... Oh, let's see. Ari Vi and Talia Vi are both so strong, and they're yeah. both open. Uh, Honor Life Esports is going to be banned one of them. Well, TF is going to be taken away here. Something that Kingen actually debuted, but... Not wanting to see that, not wanting to give that one the opportunity as there is a uh, Cassante ban. So the Ari, the Talia, all of these options still up and available. And I think that Hammer Life Esports did kind of do this on purpose to be able to take the other one um, after one of them is picked up. And we'll just see exactly what Showmaker does want to do after aiming cycles through every champion in the universe uh, before getting there. Shout out to Effort for the hover on the, uh, <laughs> the Nasus, as Udia will be the lock-in. So instead, Kingen is going to take his pick, and we're going to leave counter for Showmaker in the mid lane. Kind of yeah. dangerous, I feel, into Zekka, because I think that Zekka doesn't really care about what you're playing as long as he can play what makes him happy, and Yone makes him happy. Yeah, I feel like it's a bit of a weird decision. I feel like he could have gone in with confidence in that four pick. Uh, and take some of the pairs while the vibe. I'm gonna see the Yone come out. So Zeka going back to uh, something he's very competent on. Kind of, you know, I, we were thinking about like the Ari, the Talia, you know, one will get one, one will get the other. Uh, nope, he will get the Yone uh, pick that he is obviously very strong with. And also makes me wonder what we're gonna see in the top lane because, you know, it does pair well with the Maokai, but it makes me think maybe they have an AP top laner there. That yeah. Perhaps. Weird with Rumble being banned, but we'll see. Gwen or Cannon, I guess, but Nah could just come through. Of course, there yeah, is no. some mixed damage available with, uh, you know, Nami empowering things, Maokai existing, and Yone doing a um, bit of hybrid. So now, Showmaker, what are you going to show us as your answer to the Yone in the mid lane? Doesn't necessarily feel like a hard counterable champion, but uh, if you just lock in Ari Vi, you're probably going to be okay yeah, with uh, the outcome. I think I honestly would have preferred the Talia in this situation. Just Talia into Yone into Lucian is so good at just checking them. Um, yeah, with true. Unravel Deer. So there is a lot of playmaking power with this combo. This combo is obviously very strong, but I also think you're going to have, you know, it's not the best into Maokai as well. You know, uh, a lot of responses from that pick to pin you down. Uh, but I still think it's a really solid draft for T+. Plus. I do think the top lane matchup isn't that fun. Uh, so perhaps they could have just gone for, you know, either Ari or Talion 4 and given that kind of pick to King. And but regardless, I think they're pretty fine with their lane matchups on the bot side of the map uh, and a lot of strong scaling elements in the late stages of the game. Yeah, and uh, having a strong mid jungle for this team that has relied on Lucid and Showmaker playing that early game out effectively. I mean, it is very, very important for D+. So I do kind of like it on their side, but a lot of cohesion for Harmon Life Esports in their composition. Uh, Peanut doesn't know how to lose on Maokai either. Uh, and so there is a lot of setup. Plus, Yone for Zeka is always something that we're going to look at and feel uh, pretty good about if you're looking on uh, Harmon Life Esports' side. So definitely positives across the board, but only one team can win. And the thing is, there's a lot of pressure on aiming this game because if you get into a late game team fight, like, all you have to do is kill the Aphelios, and I feel like the composition for D-plus loses a lot of weight, you know? Yeah. You'll have a tank left, you'll have an Ari, but Ari's kind of reset reliant, so... I think the objective in teamfights is pretty clear for Hunter Life Esports. Just matters whether they can get to that point, uh, but I think they should be should be confident. Yeah, and a lot of peel going to be required as well, and need to get those wild growths out from Kellen at the same time. So it's time to get onto the Rift for our Saturday Showdown. Feels like D-plus fans quite loud here in LOL Park. But uh, we're also I, next to them. We are next to them. Uh, and look, we haven't had fan chance for a little while, and so maybe um, I am just getting pranked once again by proximity. Still, yeah. uh, you, I could feel it, you know? I could feel the desperation <laughs> wanting to see their team actually find a good performance yeah. uh, before the playoffs. Yeah, last chance to put themselves in a bit of a better position uh, in terms of 
that first round. Uh, obviously, it may not make a difference. Depends what Honor Life Esports, or I mean, I guess potentially T1, but likely Honor Life Esports end up picking. Yep. Um, but also, this this series could be telling. I think everyone expects Honor Life Esports if they get third to pick Quandor Freaks, but maybe if they absolutely destroy D Plus here. Uh, <laughs> Like, well, you know, we could just take D-plus and, and run it back. Um, I think you never do that. No, never. I don't think you do, but you've always got to consider the possibility. Yep, remember, like, I mean, KT chose T1, remember? Uh, <laughs> <so>. <laughs> Crazy uh, things could happen. Uh, you know, you just know Chronicle is going to be hearing yep. that and so mad about it yep. right now. Oh, it's beautiful. Anyway, Kingen is just going to follow Doran towards his turret, realizes that he can't actually walk that way as well, so he'll take the long way around. The first Ari game for Showmaker this season as well. Hasn't necessarily been an Ari guy um, over his career. More the uh, the Syndra comes to mind uh, when it comes to these sort of mid lane mages, but still uh, looking forward to seeing what he can get done here. And it certainly fits his play style. Just haven't seen it so far this spring. And just adding another one to the champion pool of uh, things he's played so far. Yeah, it's season. it's pretty a little absurd. bit absurd. You know, if we were to do a lower third in it, we just wouldn't have space. No. Um, on the graphic, it would be just too a little bit too much. I think it's his 16th unique champion. Doing some quick math here, counting up the images I can see on my uh, on my screen. Yeah. So 15 and then add one. Yeah. Um, it's 16. So. Wow. <laughs> I uh, we managed to do it. Yeah. Got, got there in the end. Uh, yeah, you can see bot lane uh, the. Aphelios, Lulu, actually pretty strong, level one, with the Calibrum available, so doing a good job of zoning out uh, Honor Life Esports bot lane, but you saw Viper hit level two immediately, took a window to trade. Yeah. And some return pressure. Zeka using his health bar here as a resource, as we often say, but is going down relatively low, still farming just fine. That is the main thing to watch out for. Amy and Kellen get themselves a crash. Viper doing his best to try and farm this one out underneath the turret, and it is just not quite working. <laughs> Missing the majority of those. So six ahead is aiming as the dust is starting to settle. And I'm still looking for the, for a lane that Lucian Nami does okay into um, in the early few levels. It hasn't yeah. really been very many of them. I think it's also just tricky because you have to really delicately balance it. Um, if you, like, dash straight in, you can just end up getting caught into an all-in that you don't lose. You really have to... I think a lot of the good Lucian players, you kind of saw Viping do it in an earlier trade. They're like, dash at an angle, quickly trade, and immediately disengage. It's like, yeah. I got my damage off, we're done. You know? Uh, not going for any more damage, because the longer you get locked into a trade against pretty much any bot lane as Lucian Nami, the worse it gets. Yeah. Uh, but he's going to get a decent little uh, cheater recall time, although he does cancel it. So never mind. Yeah, something that's interesting is you've seen the ghost from aiming. <gasps> no. Nah. You know, we often see like barrier taken into Lucianami to mitigate the trades, or just cleanse because you're into a Maokai. So you know, picking up the ghost for team fighting power, but does mean I expect Kalen will probably pick up an early Mikhail's. Uh, just because the, the power that Maokai CC is so powerful, and even against things like Delight's Bubble, it has a lot of value too. Yeah, I would suggest that Kellen is going to buy the earliest possible Mikhail's, as now Delight is going to do a lot of damage to nope. Kellen. I'm just going to say, it's very fortunate that Viper is the one with Ignite. Uh, yeah. Not Delight there, because uh, I think we might have seen a solo kill come out. Indeed. Good charm here from Showmaker to try and mitigate the damage, and isn't going to be able to get the return of the Orb of Deception. Doran going to get pushed out of this lane, though. You can see Kingen, actually, with a fair bit of pressure up here, but Teleport going to be utilized uh, to get him back, although he does cancel. Yeah, having a rough time. Uh, I think a big factor is Nar's range is so short. Something in mini Nar, he scales with levels. So early on, matchups like Udia can actually give you some trouble if they're able to get on top of you, able to take some heavy trades. Do feel like once he gets you know a few more levels behind him, um, should just be able to manage the Udia comfortably and still be that huge presence in the side lane later on. Yep. Well, Zeka going to unbind his soul once again. He gets a Tide Caller's Blessing as well for the extra damage as another charm does come through. This time, the angle of the Orb of Deception does certainly work out in Showmaker's favor as Lucid going to be pushed out of the pit. Still, uh, that is first Bub going on over to D+, so he gets all of that extra experience that he really wanted. He's going to go back uh, to his business farming things up in the jungle. Yep, he's pretty happy with uh, well, not happy with the outcome, but he's happy with getting this one void uh, grub and uh, moving away. Ooh, Bubble is going to miss there, as now Viper is going to get snared by the Gravitum. A lot of damage onto Kellen here, but he's still moving forward. Viper the target here for DK, as they will shove this wave up. So a large minion wave here for Viper and Delight to deal with. 
Yeah, and you can see there with the Gravitum from the Aphelios is where it gets pretty scary. Uh, both combat summoners burned by Hollow Knight Beast Bolt's bot lane, only for the Ghost in return. So D Plus pretty happy with how they've traded up in terms of summoners. Yeah. Viper was uh, taking a bit of that annoying damage from Infernum as well. A very frustrating ability as a big old Gnar into the wall as Kingen presses W and it denies everything about all of the buttons that Doran just pressed. Yeah. Very annoying. Didn't really achieve much with that, but I think Doran just expressing his feelings on playing into Udia. Yeah, and uh, I think we're hearing it loud and clear as now Kingen could potentially go for a back if he would like to. Also could wander around and uh, help secure some vision in the jungle. Peanut going to be moving on over as he's still here. Just going to catch the next wave as well. Slightly dangerous with the fact that Peanut's proximity is so incredibly close. As Showmaker is definitely showing that uh, if you do unbind the soul, uh, you can definitely just uh, always land those charms. As Lucid's coming on in here, Doran does have that Mega Nar coming up, but it's a really good avoidance of that wallop. And Okay, Nature's Grasp comes down, CC to assist just to go through the CC, and there's First Blood. Still, Zekka is going to rotate in, and I don't think this fight is over just yet. Still, he gets underneath the turret with Showmaker moving in. Looks like D-Plus are going to get away with it. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, Doran didn't have ult available, and also just took so much damage on that play uh, up against the, the Udia. Got absolutely mangled in close range. So I think just took far too much damage on the initial play and it ends up backfiring pretty massively. Absolutely. And we often just expect Anar as he transforms to have the, uh, the ultimate available. Just because oftentimes, even if you use it every time you turn Mega, it doesn't actually matter. But not at this level. When he's just level 7, um, you're not going to have that one up and available. And so a little bit uh, awkward. And missing the wallop was just the biggest part. Yeah, missing the wallop, honestly, I think is the... Uh, roughest part of that one. Uh, but even then, like, he was so low in HP, like, the Mega Nar kind of saved him out of this play. Yeah, let's have a look at it again. Yeah, I think just jumping in was the mistake. You know, he ends up on the opposite side of Kingen for no actual benefit. He was the same distance away. Could have used that, that uh, hop to save more time. But misses the wallop there. Then here, he sees the Vi. Doesn't flash the uh, engage from Lucid, unfortunately. And then here, Zekka's obviously trying to make something happen, but with the RE coming over, they really can't overstay in this play. And yeah, I think definitely a misplay there from Doran, but a good good punish from Lucid. Absolutely. Well, Doran is still within touching distance when it comes to CS, as we can see here. Hamalife Esports also with the inside track on this Drake. So first dragon gonna go over their way, and it is just the first blood gold that is in the back pocket of Deep Plus here. But I think it's setting up D-plus for a pretty fantastic mid-game if they can play around this uh, strength in the 2v2 mid. Seen already that a lot of respect had to be paid by Hammer Life Esports when the Ari and Vi are on the same screen together, even if it wasn't necessarily too much aggression. So, Peanut hanging out in the area. We do have Lucid clearing out wards just north of him. Yeah, got to be careful in these Zeta skirmishes because it's, it's red-white from aiming, so in the extended fight, he has a lot of power. And on top of that, Lucid has ult. So if you imagine this 3v3 playing out, if Lucid presses R and Viper and Viper dies, you have a Nami and a Maokai. Hmm. Yeah, not that sure that's going to pay off. It's not going to be a large amount of value. As now, we do see Lucid moving down. Delight flashing, not wasting any time. Not going to be beaten around the bush. And that is just going to be a free summoner spell. And Lucid can go home if you'd like. Yeah, I mean, it could flash. I think he's probably just dead there if he flashes uh, later. So, responds to the threat, manages to get out, but still, as you said, summon a burn for Final Life Esports, so not ideal. Yeah. 81 CS apiece here on the top side of the map. Feels like Kingen could be further ahead. Um, unfortunately, is not. As the Gnar will still just be able to do Gnar things, even if he does uh, die in the early game. And, and he's well, well, unless he just annihilated. gets clobbered and, uh, and just dies, that would that would mean that no, he wouldn't be able to do nar things because he'd be dead. Yeah, he's just getting absolutely butchered, honestly, at this point. it's. Uh, I haven't seen uh, Udia do, do this well um, for quite some time. Yeah, I mean, he did kind of fall off and we didn't see him. Oh, yeah, there's a dash in from Viper. Gets slowed down here by the Glitter Lance as Tidal Wave coming on in as well. They get the knock up. There's the bubble onto the Lulu, who's going to flash. Does still have Wild Growth, but opted to flash instead. And they are just going to back all the way out of this one. Lucid getting started on these Void Bubs, and that means that this bottom lane should just 
lose a bunch of plates. And in fact, these backs are going to get stopped as Peanut could have just thrown a sapling in there. So good that they do step away, but this is going to be a lot of money and a lot of money missing yeah, and I, uh, in this trade. Uh, we see Zekka moving over already. He needs to be here yesterday if he wants to prevent this play. Well, uh, Nabar is not in a great position, and the CC is just chained to high heaven. Zekka moving on in now as Showmaker wants to land this charm, but Zekka is going to ult his way out. They do take some plate gold on the way through here as D+. Plus. Still pretty happy with how things are going on the top side of the map, even if the bottom lane is kind of a disaster. Yeah, uh, they don't get as much in terms of plates, but the fact is they get the kill, so the payoff ends up being bigger for them. Zekka's going to be able to cover this wave and pick up the farm, but couldn't really achieve anything in the turn round play. And I think the main takeaway was T Plus were aware that Zekka was moving and preemptively TP'd Showmaker in just to ensure no play was possible in return. Yeah, really nicely done. Aiming also going to pick up the farm in the mid lane as well. And DK not losing out on as much as they could have otherwise. Only two plates went down on the bottom side as well. I actually kind of thought it was going to be more, but losing the wave, kind of the biggest part. As you can see, level 8 for Viper, only level 7 here for aiming um, after that one. So still important to get a bit of a lead for your Lucian, who really wants to thrive at around now, you know? Like, this, yeah. is, this is the start of uh, Lucian's dominance in this mid-game. Yeah, He's already doing all right. The do need a uh, mandate completed by Delight. Yeah, true. That'll help a lot. So very close on that. It's like 400 gold for the final upgrade. So we might end up seeing Delight find a window to recall before the next dragon. But I'm not actually sure it'll arise. Maybe he has it here. He potentially, if he does. Ward. It's uh, somewhat dangerous, but. Yeah, I think it might get stopped by aiming. Yeah. yeah, it does. He just wants to get back, get the uh, mandate, and then start setting a vision for this dragon. Uh, one already in the pocket for Hunter Life Esports definitely uh, sets him on the right trajectory for the rest of this game. Yep, King and slapping minions and stuff like that here towards the bottom side. Still a very happy Udia. Uh, still extraordinarily mandate. even when it comes to CS and things like that. But having picked up a kill now, I think he is going to be happy. There is the Mikhail's done for Kellen. And so that is why uh, Aiming was allowed to go with the Ghost. Just relying on Kellen's reaction time instead of his own when it comes to getting CC'd. Gonna check this play out one more time. Doran just really getting singled out this game. Yeah, empty Narbar as well. Uh, there's just no real chance for you to outplay this one. I honestly think he could have just saved the flash, but clearly he was trying to buy time for Zekka to get here. And then this looked like it could be scary for Zekka, but the old usage is pretty good just to disengage him from the situation. Maybe if he hit King with the old, could have killed him, but possibly would have just died in return. Yep. Um, He's also able to kill the minions as well to prevent him from being dove any further. Yep. Um, Viper just setting up in this mid lane. You can see that mandate you were talking about is going to get completed. So now is where the happy times begin. Yeah, and I think at this point, it's so hard to contest mid prior against the Tsunami. This is one of the, it's not just the item spikes, but at this point of the game, if you walk up, uh, liable just to get a heavy trade pumped into you. And especially with the fact that we're seeing Lucians go this shiv, it becomes really difficult. So D plus don't even opt to contest the dragon. They go towards a herald instead. And you can see aiming in Kellen's position. Like Viper's permanently up in the lane, and aiming is just forced basically to just be a screen away from his turret at all times. Yep. And now just doing what they can. But that is going to be an infernal soul. Also a culling. A lot of damage onto both aiming and Kellen here. Still able to clear out that way very comfortably. Rift Herald was secured by Lucid in response, so it's not like D-plus gets nothing. You, and you can know, see uh, the gold's still in favor of D-plus as we head towards the mid-game. We had ample opportunity for this to be like an Ocean or a Chemtech. And I know! Getting the Infernal Soul, what a high roll. This is uh, absolutely massive. I honestly think you've outdone yourself today, Orcs. Uh, just incredible work. I, I feel like we don't celebrate enough when you get it right. Thank you. You know, no, because we're we're always punishing you for when you get it wrong. Yeah, it's always the orcs sus in yeah. the, you know. It's it's there's there's never the, the orcs yay, you know? Yeah. And yeah. if we could get some of those, that'd be really good. Just to find some balance. And I think that that's important. As Lucid moving into this mid lane, you can see uh Viper will respect it. As DK they just want to throw down the Herald, they will be able to do so as Kingen is very, very strong. Still, they get the teleport out. And that means Zekka's going to come in and say no to this level of aggression. Showmaker was moving towards the top lane, didn't opt to use his teleport as he wanted to catch this wave that was moving forward, understandably so. So, Yep, good move from Hanolife Esports. Uh, keep that tier 1 turret in the mid lane alive. Managed to mitigate more pressure coming out from the Herald. 
Uh, and Zek had actually proxied a wave behind the top lane tower before he teleported, so no chance for Shomi to do anything but pick up the farm. Yep, ult gonna come on through. Spirit Rush is going to be the response here. So ult for ult. A lot of confidence just to fire the ult out, because if you miss slightly, then you could just end up wasting it for nothing, but uh, forces the ult from Showmaker, which is a lot more valuable for the Ari. Uh, so definitely Zekka going to be happy with that trade. Oh yeah. And you can see if you look at the ult timers yeah. next to the portraits, uh, Zekka is already a quarter done. Uh, this is against like an Ari with Malignant, who, I mean, to be fair, you look at his, and his is actually gaining some ground, so I, I think they're both going to be fine. Yeah, I think it's, uh, it's going to look relatively similar. And... If they're going to be fighting, it will likely be over this next dragon. I think imperative that D plus doesn't uh, continue to bleed Drakes. You can see here that Hummer Life Esports have, yeah, they lost a couple of kills. Uh, Doran dying is something they're very used to uh, over the season and something that Delight and Peanut certainly have a lot of experience with. Um, and so they're not going to be too worried about this. They've been keeping this gold advantage uh, about where it is for a really long time, between 1 and 2,000 and doesn't really mean too much. Still, they do want to find some uh, some team fights in this mid-game when they are feeling strong. Not exactly a massive scaling difference between these two compositions, though, is what it kind of feels like to me. Is yeah. that what you're kind of getting? Yeah, I mean, obviously, a lot of people are going to look at the Ephelios Lulu and think about how relevant they can be in the later stages, but I think in terms of damage threats, if you lose the Ephelios in the late game, your composition really starts to struggle and between like the Maokai, the Yone, the Lucian, there's a lot of threats for aiming. So I think it's more about how the compositions interact and how they set up their win cons than just a... Uh, it's not like small though, it's like, oh yeah, we get to this point and we kind of just win. Yeah, and even then, uh, that can sometimes not be true. As Viper, collect the cinders, man. Collect the, the cinders. There's one literally just to the south of you. All right, this uh, could be something. Viper's going to move on over. There is the Rift Scuttler, consumed by Lucid. Yeah, looks like they're trying to set a trap for Lucid there. Um, when able to pull it off, though, he played it a little bit sheepishly, which is the right call in that situation. So, picks up the Scuttle without really being punished. Yep. And overall, you know, there's been a lot of movements, a lot of attempts to make things happen, but it's been a pretty quiet game overall. Yeah, uh, just those couple of kills under Doran. That is kind of it. Uh, Showmaker wanting to take down this turret if he can. Needs um, one more yeah, order. There we go. He's going to be able to lock that one down. So it does have to sacrifice a bit of his health bar, but otherwise he should be all right. As aiming, collecting this wave in mid as well. Yeah, 45 seconds, I think, is uh, that's that's the timer on when the action is going to begin. But it's um, I say was, hopefully. That was the first tower of the game going yeah, down there. Yeah, nutty. Which is, you know, I had to look at the map and then I had to look at the score, but I was like, yeah, that's the first tower taken at nearly 19 minutes, so... I feel like both teams are playing very defensively in terms of protecting their structures. Uh, but as you said, 25 seconds till that dragon. I'm certain that D-plus will want to be setting up for this and trying to secure it. The, the, like, the classic thing for having the, the pacifist game would be if Hummer Life Esports just gives it up and says, we already have two, we don't oh, need this go. one, we'll continue scaling. Uh, look for a team fight around a Baron or something like that instead. You can see now Lucid is moving towards the south, but we are going to get rewarded. Humble Life Esports moving towards this Drake as well. Decent vision available also. Uh, Humble Life Esports have done their homework. Is now Kingen looking to walk towards them. He is walking menacingly as now Viper finds aiming. That is so much damage. Onto the Aphelios and he might have to go home. Yeah, this this is a true pacifist game where they don't fight because someone on oh, D-Bus yeah. gets chunked. And now Showmaker's lost all as well. This is really bad for them. Yeah, Charm is going to connect here onto Zekka who does lose a decent amount of his health bar, but they're going to have to give this up just not going to be an option. This turret is also going to fall. That is bad news. It's now Viper is just happily farming in this mid lane at the same time. Humlife Esports get exactly what they want and more. Yeah, I mean, that was played so well. The fact that Viper found that angle onto aiming with the rapid fire completed, able to use that extra range to punish him. And I mean, you saw before that he was trading onto the UD and doing literally zero damage. Yep. Um, definitely not the focus point, but you know, Aemon gets chunked out, Showmaker's ult gets forced, and suddenly you don't have a team fight anymore for D+. Yep, not able to do anything. And so now the next fight is going to be dictated by Harmon Life Esports. As now Peanut, he'll press the Nature's Grass button and now look for an opportunity to go in. Kellen is going to the Kales himself. 
That is actually the right call here as Lucid happily able to tank things up. Now Showmaker moving in on the flank angle. Cease and assist comes down. They found their target as Zekka is in trouble, but he's ulting. He is going to get himself out. And D-plus now have to work out who else they can kill. Peanut might be the target they opt in for, but he's just going to Bramble Smash Flash, and they're able to take down Kingen. Humble Beast was playing this out so incredibly well. Orbit Deception flies down. Moonlight Vigil is decent. But it is not quite good enough as Showmaker looks for the backline. He finds Viper, who then dashes forward. It's aiming, it's able to cut him down, but he dies himself. It's a double, though, in the end, as now Lucid going down low. And Doran getting some revenge here onto DK. The Nah does come through, and it's a triple. Just welcome back to the game, Doran. The difference made by Zekka surviving there and being able to TP back into the fight is night and day. I think they honestly just lose flat out. It looked so good for... Uh, D plus the back end until Zekka rejoined. And here, you know, they go quite aggressive, but it's with a Yone, you're not back to middle. But you see this flank coming in from King, and he feels so hard to kill, like the amount of damage he soaks here. Uh, we find this ult coming in onto Zekka. But bear in mind, Showmaker burns all three charges of his ult to, kill, to try and kill him. Doesn't get him, doesn't get the reset. And if he has the reset available, this fight I feel like goes very different. Yeah. King ends up going down, sending the momentum is in favor of Han Life Esports. But this swift turnaround that comes in, I think Showmaker lands a beautiful charm on a Viper with a flash. And Viper tries to kill uh, Kellen here in return. But it's Zekka returning with a TP that makes all the difference. Absolutely massive. The fact that uh, Showmaker then gets punished immediately afterwards and now welcoming Doran back into the game. Feels like bad news for D+, Plus because we know that his late game Nah is definitely what Harmalife Esports is pick it for. Such typical Doran, you go 0-2-0 on lane, one team fight, you're 4-2-0, you know? Yeah. He just bounces back. That's how it works, you know? He's uh, he's the team fighting Nah guy, and it works. As Peanut can take some Fox Fires here. I don't think we're going to see too much aggression as now a fight around the Baron. This does feel like one of those games where you've just got, if there's there's like an agreement from both teams, we're going to be 5v5ing as, okay, Tidal Wave going to be avoided, and now the turret just goes down. Delight just booped over the wall, is now Viper by himself. He's going to get taken down oh! so incredibly low, but that's still a massive ulti from Zekka. The answer is still there for D+, though, as Lucid just punches the Lucian. They are going to be able to stay alive for this one. D plus get themselves the pick, but not the team fight. Yeah, honestly, it was a horrible fight setup for Honor Life Esports. Uh, and I think Zekka, you know, maybe that ult, the damage he dealt, might have just been enough to discourage D plus from going straight to the Baron on the back of that. Uh, Zekka really getting a lot of value in these team fights. And yeah, still lost for D plus, but. You know, they're trying to defend this tower that's so low, and it's just an immediate old follow-up onto Viper. you got to remember, it's Viari. There's always going to be someone to follow the Vibe. But yeah, that ult, the damage done to Showmaker on Kellen, the ult being burned from the Lulu, I think we could have seen D-plus just start at the Baron if they didn't take all that damage there. I feel like he could have stayed in there for like a little bit longer, got a little bit of extra damage as well. That might have been a kill. Um, not actually the case, and may have actually had the Unbound Soul timing out there as well, but still absolutely heroic from Zekka. Uh, still looked great from Lucid as well. Uh, the Cease and Desist pushing Delight out of the way to make sure that Viper was singled out in that moment. Actually, yeah. very, very cool use I mean, of the ulti. You don't often see the knockback being yeah. utilized. I mean, Lucid's had a, a really solid game so far, uh, and actually it's a substantial lead over Peanut, and you know, some of the space was saying before the game how Peanut has a tendency just to shut the enemy jungler out of the game make them look useless. It hasn't really occurred here. It's not something he does on the Maokai so much. Less so, yeah, for sure. Oftentimes, he just presses his R button at the right times and the game is kind of over. And that's happened eight times so far this season and every Looking time it's been a victory. Um, and with Infernal Soul in 15 seconds, if you get the right ult here, that's all you really need to do. You know, securing that would be such a big boon oh, for yeah. Honor Life Esports. And D Plus have no choice. They have to fight for this one. There is absolutely no way they can give up an Infernal Soul. As one second, now it's up and available. Oh, well, they've got so much control over this area, though. D-Plus need to try and buy back some ground if they can find it. Doran, Snarbar is going to wear off, though, and so now this could be the time. This could be the moment for D-Plus to try and find an angle. Showmaker collecting some cinders as the Drake is going to get picked up here. And if Hamalife Esports don't like this, they can just back away, but it looks like they're not going to do so. A showmaker taken down. That is going to be a huge cease and assist on to Viper, but the ulti into the backline is just as good. Both of the carries just immediately wiped out.
Delight in trouble, but Kingen has no damage. He's not going to be able to get this one done. It's Doran able to lock down the last remaining kill here in the river. They'll grab themselves an Infernal Soul, and Zekka, congrats on the POG, mate. Yeah, I think we're seeing the value of these point-and-click CC ultimates, right? You can't dodge the Vile, and apparently you can't dodge the Yone ult either. Yeah, I was going to say point-and-click CC, 100%. No on point. Uh, <laughs> so obviously we saw my focus was very much on Viper getting pinned down here by... Uh, the vibe, but look at Zeka, he catches, not with the ult there, but the follow-up with the Q2 on both Aiming and Showmaker. Just explodes them, and yeah, you got Viper, you lost both your carries for it. And it must be so frustrating to be in the position of Lucid there, where you get the ult, you're like, we got Lucid, and then you look back at your backline, you go, oh. Yeah, everyone's just dead. And now you got Viper, he's an entire item ahead of Aiming here. Does have the Infinity Edge, and then both of those uh, energized items, the Twisted Flution build, as we like to say, or as I like to say. I don't think anybody else really likes it that much, but it's just fun to say. You should try it if you're at home. Uh, and so Viper just very, very strong at this point in time. And if this, like, this is exactly the kind of pace that you want for a Lucian composition. This is what feels really good because they found a few of these team fights, and now closing it out from here, you just throw Cullings in, you're doing so much damage. And as you can see, yeah, uh, Kellen just has to flash as soon as Viper says that he has to. You know, and we, we've been so critical of the Lucian, and it's definitely a finesse pick. And even though it's been getting like blown up in the team fights, the Vi clearly being a big issue for it, the power we've seen Viper display with it in these setups on the mid lane has really been something. Just poking out members of D Plus who step up. Yeah. Maybe not Kingen. <laughs> Broke a shield, at least, uh, but yeah. Uh, oh, Lucid, he might just die. Yeah, he may. Cease and desist going to come through here as there is the knockup onto Showmaker. Wow. He misses the charm and just gets chopped up by Zekka. Not sure about this one, and it feels a little bit like D-plus have ran out of steam in this moment. Infernal Soul, of course, is so incredibly powerful. The fact that Harmer Life Esports just kind of cruised towards it as well is really dangerous. Is Doran? Not sure about that. I don't know really what was uh, going it's on there. Zoning ult, zoning ult. Yeah, definitely zoned. Did a bunch of zoning. Is now the ultimate going to come through here from Peanut as well. There's the flash twisted advance. Really wants to take down aiming. Not going to be able to do so just yet. Lucid, very tanky. He's able to take out Viper. And now Zekka, he's at full health. So he is an absolute monster. It doesn't matter that they've lost the Lucian because they still have this Yone who is just so incredibly huge. Three dead on the side of D+, and so these inhibitors are sure to follow. And maybe with this Baron buff, they're going to be able to push through for even more. Aiming is still up, but I just don't know whether he's going to be able to do too much here. Showmaker showing back up again, though. That should be enough. As look at all these cannon minions. There are five. Yeah, lining up to take down these turrets. They're going to be able to take the first one as uh, Peanut. It's going to be difficult for him to be able to get out. His tidal wave just sails by majestically. It's a great charm to connect there as Kingen, not quite as tanky as he otherwise could. Oh, wait, maybe he is. Never mind, he is. Yeah, I mean, saw those cannons. The Nexus Tower ends up going down despite members of D Plus being up to try and fight back in return. And sure, D Plus hold on to the base, but. Uh, just barely. Yeah, what, what base, you know? They hold on to a bit of the base. Yeah, you know, not looking really structurally sound right now. No, not so much. Uh, we'll see a replay, and Lucid just ends up, I, I don't know, maybe looking for a flank angle or something overextended, but then Showmaker's the one who ends up pay, paying the price. Zekka coming over the wall at the perfect time. It feels like he always has the Q3, the tornado, like, set up. It's just, like, permanently ready yep. whenever he needs it. Uh, finding great angles with that here. You know, Aiming gets chunked out, perhaps a little deep from Peanut, the Mikhail's uh, making him pay. And Viper, you know, he's been having a time. I feel like Lucid has yeah. personally said he is going to be uh, just ruin his fun, you know, throughout this game, and he has kind of stuck to that so far. If that was his goal, he has achieved it. Oh, so yeah. I guess, uh, you know, Lucid can feel happy about that. The outcome of the game, however, is not really a happy time. 6,000 gold and the base in tatters. Yeah, and now was probably looking towards a minute and a half. Grab themselves an Elder, maybe follow that up with a Baron, take Exodia to the Nexus, and bring us to a game two. Honestly, I think ideally you don't even ever take the Elder and you just force D plus to contest it and then never let it come down to a flip, you know? Yeah, just For take the Nexus instead. Yeah, I think that's a better option. I think the only way D plus actually win this game is if they steal, if either Hunter Life Eastwood make a humongous misplay or they steal that Elder. So. Looks like they're just going to get some Whoa. down here. Um, 
Yeah, Viper's angry at Lucid. Just took half of his health bar there with that was one little combo. That's, that's a bit ridiculous that he has been targeted so much. As Showmaker wow. not able to find him. The sidestep just gorgeous as the tidal wave almost takes down Showmaker here. He makes it to the fountain. It's good bubble on to King in to stop that follow-up. Aiming is still at full health, though. Has decent guns for this one as well as into the back line goes Zeka. Doesn't find the Aphelios, but still able to cut down this Udia Peanut. Not a lot left in the tank, though, as far as that health bar. So D+, plus, I think, might be able to keep this Nexus turret alive. Um, but that's uh, that's the end of the good news. Yeah, the damage has now been done, though. Going to be lots of super minions spawning in here. Doubles in each lane. And as a result, Homelite Peace will just get out, reset. Now you can set up for the Elder. If D-plus leave their base, they might just lose their Nexus to the Super Minions. Yeah. It's going to be so hard to contest this. And to be honest, Homelite Esports, as soon as they come out of the base, you can just fight them head on. This from Viper was so well played. That sidestep there. It's just absurd. Make it I don't really even know high. how that missed. Yeah, I think Showmaker might be reviewing the bots on that one. Yeah, no, um, I think so. It was maybe, almost a pause, I could yeah, imagine. Yeah, check Viper PC. Um, <laughs> Just not normally. Uh, yeah, the GA having a massive amount of value from uh, uh, Zeka there. So at least they take that out. But still, you can see in the picture in picture, they are trying to set up and find a pick in the lead up for this Elder. But they are on a timer. Oh my mean, goodness, yeah. In. This is, uh, you can see, knocking on the front door are these super creeps. There are so many of them just cascading up these lanes. As King, and he's not going to be able to hold on to it by himself. Still, he's teleporting in. They're going for the flip. As now Lucid wants to get over the wall. He is going to be able to do so. But there's another two-man ulti from Zeko, who finds yet another angle. Aiming now, having to deal with Doran. Will get stunned up, not into the wall. Thrown around like ragdolls. And D-plus, they went for the last-ditch effort. But it is only Lucid left standing. And Viper gets his final revenge. That is going to be the Nexus turret falling down as well as Doran wants to get out of this game as quickly as possible. Look at these supers. And that is going to be that. They even take the Elder just to celebrate. Yeah, and I think I've got to say it is such a fantastic performance there from Zeka. Oh, yeah. Uh, I mean, it's it's not always we see his Yone. You know, he's been bringing out a lot of other picks in the R recently. The Talia. He looked really good in this Talia recently. But when he does pick that, you only have a game like this, you kind of remember why he is just so feared on this champion. You know, there was potential for him to pick a range of the really strong meta mids, uh, but Yone is just kind of always meta for him. Yeah, he and just he says, why. And he, he just says, I'm going to win. And it was with D plus investing so much into making sure that Showmaker gets counterpick in the mid lane. And the Ari was just not the answer whatsoever. I just find it so mind blowing that, like, I can get, like, I. Thought we'd see aiming struggle quite a bit on yep. the Aphelios, but he actually wasn't caught by... I mean, there was times when he was caught by Zeka, but Helen's mostly... Helen's Mikhail's usage was actually phenomenal yeah. the whole game. For sure, but I, I feel like the amount of time Showmaker on Ari was getting caught out by Zeka, you know, for a champion who's so mobile, you, you, it's it's hard. It's not easy just to pick him out, and uh, Zeka really had an eye for it. He just finds the angles, this man. Give him a melee champion, and he will crush. So, we'll see what happens. We're going to go to a short break when we get back. The space. We'll break that one down, and we'll have game number two. Uh, 
아, 아 돌았어 이. 아래 그냥 타입 박아줘 거의 있어 나 일단 많이 써볼게 야 이거 나 궁각 나오거나 한번 써볼게 아, 아 봐봐 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 아래 세금 봐도 돼 일자로 다 묶인다 바위 먹거나 아, 아래 가졌어 아래 가졌어 어디 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 노플이야 아어 노플 차트 셀타 하나 끝나 바위 노플 나 바위 볼게 나이스 Comprou uma briga contra dois, porque o Yamp não deixou a backline o resto do time da PEN chegar por aqui. O Damage agora abre o escudão. Carioca lindo, Engage de novo. O problema é que o Dinkedo tá Mais muito é? detonado. Cure de novo. Como, como da PEN agora sim, vai. Funcionando e funcionando muito bem. Só tem o Ninja aqui e mais sozinho. Ele não faz verão. A PEN vem pra ganhar o jogo.差一点可以把他丢给留住哎有漏直接秒阿水大绝甩的是纳米在这里盖了墙过来之后在空中直接被击败接下来阿水被留住被被的冰块闪现过来然后所以这里波比把人给锤走锤的是一头猪在这里开
and welcome back to the space here for Saturday Showdown. And that was a game number one that was pretty interesting. DK getting some interesting leads here in the top side of the map, but that wasn't quite enough to get them across the line as well, if Esports just collected all the drakes. And uh, what do you guys think about this draft? The Aphelios coming out kind of kind of surprised us, caught off of uh, off guard. I don't think aiming was super comfortable on the pick. Uh, the gun rotations weren't amazing. It wasn't the problem this game, don't get me wrong, but it is interesting uh, that teams are still trying to find a different solution to this Lucian problem, which I think we did so uh, the power of the Lucian here. Credit to Viper for that one. I like the draft inferior for DK. You have a really strip, uh, strong mid-jungle 2v2, but it's all the weirder that Lucid and Showmaker at no point felt like they actually linked up, which was the strongest part of this team at the beginning, it was instead King and, and Lucid that did really well in the early game. Yeah, they didn't play around bottom side, they played around top side, so I think that there were a lot of things that they could have done differently they decided not to do. The Aphelios is fine, I feel, in this draft, but Zarya was available, they could have played that instead, and just felt a little bit bizarre. It is obviously a champion that later on is going to be a fountain laser and can carry team fights if you can actually get to those team fights on even footing, but aiming left us a little bit puzzled with some of his gun management this game and positioning as well. Zarya is great. For, for our life, uh, great draft. Drafted the melee champion for Sekka. Peanut got got That's all I have guy. to do. That's all you have to do. <laughs> uh, it's free. Doran entered. Who cares? Doesn't yeah. matter. I'm glad we got to see the power of the Lucian as well. You know, part of the reason why the Sizz get picked up a lot. There was that one team fight where Viper just like two tapped aiming, and then it was like, oh, soul point. Well, I guess we just get the soul point Drake then. Just like that. Like, I dashed forward and I two-tapped and it was over. Um, let's take a look at these highlights, though. We have to talk about this early game for the side of DK, including a lot of plays around the top side with the Sudir. Yeah, I wasn't really happy with how Doran uh, played this one out because he's trying to get his Narbar here, but he's chasing because he wants to bait into this fight where Peanut comes over and then they win this 2v1. But unfortunately, this is super obvious and Lucid is up here to cover for the proxy. And he takes so much damage off that exchange that he just ends up dying here. Doesn't flash. Uh, Lucid's engaged there, and from this point on, there's just really nothing that Zekka and Peanut can do. Yeah, I think he thought that he might be safe because of the twisted advance, but doesn't end up actually clipping him. But that's the real... Uh, we got these little Drake moments interspersed in between, because that's what is actually happening here. Because this is the only snowball that DK, uh, DK got towards the top half of the map. Zekka, very nicely uh, uh, done, ends up not dying here, is really big because if he ends up going down, I think they can actually snowball to the point that is necessary for a comp like this, but instead, they lose another Drake. And the problem for DK is that if you are as good as your opponent, as to this is after the Viper or a two-tap on aiming, I think you can actually win team fights, but we just their team fighting just isn't up to par. Yeah, and they just weren't setting up for dragons. Me and I, Ari, you've got to be setting up proactive vision. You have to be looking for picks on the, the person who's starting the dragon up, even Doran going over there, oftentimes just getting away with the start. And where's the map control? Where's the proactive play? Where's the shot calling here? You have a Udir who is somewhat accelerated. You have a Vi that's accelerated. Use that to, to clear vision, clear wards. And I think that D plus really just kind of were like, I mean, you got this later on. We're going to give you all the gold like we always do, and you'll pop off and carry the team fights. He didn't, unfortunately. Well, they got four Void Bubs, so um, yeah, it didn't Yay. actually matter at all. Um, and a lot of early Drakes picked up by the side of Homolife Esports, which led into our soul fight, which is essentially where Homolife Esports won the game. This is also where, and the cost has mentioned it as well, for Showmaker in particular, I think this really was a, a continuance of his really rough streak at the moment. Is not able to get a whole lot done in this fight and gets clipped here uh, by the Yone. And, and, and the moment that you don't have the damage of this Ari, the backline threat is enough. Zekka basically kills the entire backline. And yeah, you killed Viper, DK, but left your backline wide open. Uh, if aiming like has flash, if Showmaker is able to dodge away, then maybe they can win that. But this was Soul, and the game was done. Yeah, a lot of the... Um the fights and the engages for the Yone can often even be shut down by the Ari if played correctly, and you can, you know, chuck him down to half health, so when he does finally ult in, you just focus him, but Showmaker saw the opportunity there with Lucid. They were definitely calming on Viper there. The Tidal Wave was actually layered really well there, too, for Zekka's uh, counter engage there on the other side. Aiming also had uh, red and blue guns going into that fight, which just didn't feel like he had really been able to prep and set that one up, so very much felt like D-plus were hyper-focused on, if we kill Viper, maybe we have a chance. Super desperate. 
Yeah, it does feel like sometimes their team fighting is a bit all over the place, and some of the little moments you guys did highlight there kind of did show that off. But Hama Life Esports, a great job this time around. Let's see who does pick up the POG for the first game of Saturday showdown on the side of Hama Life Esports, as it will be Zeka. Not a big surprise here. Question is, is it a 12 for 12? Does Viper get some votes? Because what I think does the right media guy do. That's my question. <laughs> there, there were definitely some some other considerations for sure, but I think in the most critical moments, it was all Zeka. And he also media ox, media ox. He'll, he'll get Zeka. Don't worry. They actually only put this highlight in, which is wild to me, because I think he had a lot of other good plays on the earlier dragon fights as well as trying to bail Doran out. Like he he did try. Yeah, also, I think in some of these fights as well, Peanut on the Maokai, he's not going to be the focal point, but it helps so much for Zekka. The setup that he's able to provide and the amount of damage that his jungler tanked, I think, was a really big part as to why he can play it really slow. And Zekka's eye for these angles is just exceptional. Uh, as uh, some unfortunate flashing there, not going to get you out of the straight line skill shot. I think it's going to be a 12-er. I'm, I'm, I'm trusting optimistic. Ox. Hey! It's a 12-er! He did it. <laughs> it's like, how dare you d doubt me in this one? I didn't um, doubt him. I trusted. I had a little bit of doubt. It's actually true. A wolf was like, no, I think it's going to be a 12-er this time. And he Noom. was right. So, Zekka, the deserved praise from the Yone play. Just put him on Yone more. Just give him melee champs. He's so good at them. But guys, we're done for match number one, game number one here of Saturday Showdown. Let's go back to the casters. Thank you so much, gentlemen. And uh, yes, uh, pretty obvious that uh, there was, I think any other vote is 100% illegal. I, don't, yeah. I, I think that actually when the little pog sheet came out, uh, there was only mid uh, no, listed actually, in all five boxes. I accidentally, like I wasn't, I just grabbed it. I was like, I put it, put it in the wrong box and then like scribble it out and put it in mid. Oh uh, man, it was, was actually hoping, almost a disaster. Because the person who came to collect it, I was like, I hope they don't think I was thinking jungle. Oh no. That, oh my god, I'd be so embarrassed. Yeah, that, that, that would not be it. Um, Although Peanut did just go to nine and zero on uh, Maokai. Yeah, I mean, it's a good pick for him, but like that was that was all Zekka all the time. Oh yeah, 100%. Um, yeah, uh, you know, I just feel like sometimes they give me grief because I dare to think differently. You know? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think that honestly, everyone's been holding you and media down this entire season. Stop associating me with media! <laughs> it's Wait. different, okay? Everyone media. was associated with media this time. Media. It was 12 out of 12. Media just votes the boom boom damage, okay? I don't do that. I think who had the most impact? Who was the one who made the... You know, and the I think beat? that that's what media thinks as well. Oh. <laughs> He's really having a hard time. Let's dive into the draft here and see who's going to uh, be media's choice in this game. Uh, it is going to be D-plus moving over to the blue side, so maybe with a little bit of extra flexibility when it comes to these bands. Already they're exerting that with this Poppy being taken away, and Hummer Life Esports will pay the center tax. Where is the Smolder going to be this time around? Of course, was completely ignored in the previous game. Well, it looks like D-plus are like, you know what? It was a peanut POG. Let's ban every champion he plays. Yeah, um, there we go. On the back of this one. I do feel like, you know, the Ari particularly, were like a pick that normally has a lot of value, but really struggles into picks like the uh, the Maokai, the Poppy for Peanut has been huge. Poppy, Talia, uh, a pretty massive combo. So, from all of those jungle options out, there's still like a ton of AD carries open. They will actually ban the virus. Callista is still open and available. Lucian's still open and available. Yeah, I uh, think. I don't really want to see aiming on Lucian. I believe that the Callista is what they're sort of aiming for, yeah. and so therefore oh, they're I, aiming for aiming yeah. for yeah, yeah yeah yeah. And so now they're gonna first pick Lucian, and I we're gonna oh I like this way more. So yeah, the I like, is I, actually gonna come in for Lucid without the Maokai and the Poppy as uh, available. Lucid was the best performer on D plus in that last game. Uh, able to make some early plays, able to put Doran behind, able to actually find Viper consistently in team fights, and this might make you second guess going once more for the Lucian. Uh, when you know you're going up against the Vi again. Zeri, another champion who also hates playing into Vi, but will lock it in anyway. Yeah, um, why not? At least you can slide over a wall and hopefully pull the Vi far away. What about Smolder Nautilus with Vi already locked in? Yeah, that's a pretty pretty strong duo, honestly. I feel like if you take that, it's kind of guaranteed that you get late in the game enough. All you do is press R on the Zeri and let Smolder do the thing, and you should be in a good spot. I'd like to see it. Instead, uh, yeah, Gangplank does make a lot more sense, actually. Um, 
as Gangplank getting he's, carry, yeah. You know, Zephyr is having a bit of a giggle at the whole situation here as uh, Renekton and Talia are going to be locked away. So instead of actually locking away a bottom line, bottom lane, they will just get some priority picks in these solo lanes that they can then protect immediately afterwards. Zeka now will see whether it is going to be Doran's pick that's going to be shored up or whether it's his. And I think that mid lane is going to be where they're going to be looking. And this is a bit of a worry, right? Because now, if it is going to be one of these standard pickups, then uh, it could be a little bit difficult. Yeah. This, though, is a Zekka pick. Yeah, I mean, this is the thing. Is this is a good pick for Zekka, but playing Ari into Vi Talia doesn't sound like an enjoyable experience. I guess at least you can make the argument, well, they can only Vi ult either Viper or Zekka. They've got to choose one. Hey, so. true. <laughs> um, at least you can build the Seeker's Arm Garden and the Zonyas on the Ari, but regardless, we see the Ari come out. We've seen this matchup a fair bit in the LCK, and Zekka definitely confident in this champion. And uh, now we'll see the bans more towards the AD carries, because, you know, no love gone towards the bot lane of D plus so far. Lucian going to be targeted. Maybe the Smolder as the next ban. It was hovered for a while by D plus. Yeah, um, might have been a cunning ruse, but we'll, we'll just have to see. I think uh, Zin Zhao makes a little bit of sense here, but I think Lulu probably should be banned. Potentially, I mean, it really depends what D plus want to go. Um, because I would imagine it's going to be top lane picked on four for Honor Life Esports, and then on five they will take that support pick and get the max information possible. Uh, if Lucian would be left open, it was Lucian Nami. Obviously, we'd expect to see the uh, the Lulu, but you know the Nautilus is still being left open and available, uh, and that could just end up being the pick for the side of D plus. Yeah, they could even go just a Felios Nautilus or something like that. You know, just a a bit of a classic. But instead, Nautilus is just going to be banned. They will ban it away. Um, a little bit interesting, I guess. You know, maybe they want to play a bot lane with a double range bot lane, but a lot of early presence to bully out the Zeri, and they don't want to deal with. Oh, Ash Nautilus. is available. You are Ash high. is potentially available. The virus isn't. I wonder if that. Oh, that's true. Limits them a little bit in their want to play that, but we'll see. Regardless, we're gonna get the Cassante uh, come out from Doran in the top lane and the Renekton. Uh, I think it makes sense because this is a. Oh, Caitlyn Ash, just do it. Don't be scared. That'd be fun. That would be. A lot of laning presence, and with the Nautilus gone, I'm not sure what you could pick that would really have a good time into that. I feel like for D+, for D plus, this composition is very much played towards the top side. Uh, a lot of pressure there, a lot of side lane power for Tania. So Cassante good at defending against that, but then what are they going to pick for the bot lane? A lot of AD carries being jumped over, and they're going to settle with the Jinx. Do they just go the Thresh? Or Dinks, Jinx Tom? That's another one. Yeah, would certainly uh, make things a bit more difficult for Zekka, but I think the Rel is still very effective. Uh, against that. Well, Thresh is going to be locked in. So that is going to be the choice. Delight, what are we going to be playing is they were the, uh, they were the ones that banned away the Rakan. Of course, one of Delight's absolute favorites. And with the Nautilus now gone as well, not a lot of engage options as... Oh, Nocturne. So we are just going to put the Rel into the support position, which is something that they could have obviously done uh, from the beginning there. Uh, and so Peanut going to be diving into the back line, making things dark. And Nocturne Ari is a pretty powerful combo. Yeah, I mean, there's so much dive threat on this composition, and it's not that easy to peel. You know, uh, there's a lot of peel tools on the side of D+, but one of the issues with Thresh and a Nocturne is if you're at a good distance to lantern someone, you can't actually see them. Yeah, true. Um, so, you know, against Nocturne, the tendency is for teams to come together, stay close. That's perfect for Rel and bad for Thresh. Still, I do think that a lot of the picks for D+, make sense. They got a pretty strong top side. They got a strong mid jungle. A lot of early pressure could be laid down. Um, but I do think the knocked in and put the rel support was the right call from Honor Life Esports to give them that full composition dive threat when it gets to team fights. Where you know if they kill aiming, if they kill uh, showmaker as well, they'll be in a fantastic spot. Yeah, I also think that both of these compositions are very snowbally when it comes to team fights. Right, like it is whoever gets that first pick is going to feel so so much better. And I think that it's either ace or nothing. Um, for both of these squads, if you do manage to get that first little bit of lockdown. And there's a lot of that available here for D+, if they can get their cards in the right position. As Lucid can just press R on someone, lock them down, get the Jinx excited, make things happen. However, on the other side of things, Peanut, he dives in, and then we'll see whether the Zeri can take over. Let's dive onto the Rift for game number two of our Saturday Showdown. Alright, Lolpark erupts 
as the fans cheer for their teams here on this Saturday showdown day. It would be fantastic, wouldn't it, if we got three games? I oh, mean, yeah. that would be the dream. And I think that D-plus do have a composition that is an improvement from the last game. I think that Showmaker, if he does have a better performance this time around, does have a champion that can certainly look absolutely fantastic. We've seen some really good Talia play uh, from so many of our mid laners over the last week or so. Yeah, especially when you have uh, Vi Talia. That is so hard to play into. Yeah. Um, if you land yeah, the Vial, the Seismic Shove is going to come in too, and most champions just die immediately to that. It's also, we've seen Talia have so much value against Cassante. Um, the Arrival Deer just completely shutting him down. And actually, one of the few mid laners, like if you're playing Ari into Cassante, you just don't have the damage to kill him. Um, definitely not through like a rotation, but like the su sustained damage from Talia will eventually cut through him. Yep. Showmaker setting up his big rocks as Kellen going to be walking behind the wards here. Both of these teams mirrored ward positions. Very cute. As aiming will have the range advantage. Yep, and also just to thresh into Rel, um, unless D plus make a mistake or like there's a gank setup for the most part, Kellen's going to be the one controlling this lane, able to disengage the Rel, able to threaten. And you can see uh, Unlife Esports already playing quite defensively. Going to get that melee minion there and then might have to back off after that. Um, Going to stay in range with XP of that cast and I think now have to be cautious about the level 2 coming in. Yep, it's pretty dangerous here as aiming switching over to the minigun. Now, Kellen, like you say, on the prowl, wanting to make sure that they stay honest. As level two going to be that next minion. Aiming going to lock that one down. So, able to shove this one forward. It looks like Humble Life Esports not going to suffer too much there. But still, full lane control here for D. Yeah, and considering, you know, you have the lane control here, you look at the top side, and Kingen already setting the. Oh, good dodge. King and already uh, having... Oh, there's a nice charm from Zekker. Showmaker continuing to have a rough time. Foxfire not going to be quite enough to lock him down or anything like that. Gets a few of these yeah, and I was, uh, threaded volleys. I was going to say, it looked like D plus had prior in all three lanes. Like a really good start for the side of... Uh, particularly Lucy had been able to basically do what he wants when he has triple prior lanes, but Showmaker takes a really bad trade there. Uh, and is actually going to recall and TP back in, pick up the tier in the back of that. So I'm not going to suffer too much for it, but... Not ideal, obviously. Yep, very early back as well, so not exactly getting uh, what he wants. As uh, Extendo Beam coming on through here, we'll see how close to a plate uh, Amy and Kellen are going to be able to get here, because that is a lot of cast minions. Yeah, one thing I will say is of all the AD carries in the game, Zeri is one of the best at CSing in a tower, just because you can use your right click as well as your yeah. Q to secure minions. So uh, does fall behind a decent amount in terms of farm regardless, but you know, manages to pick up a lot of the ones under the tower there. Well, Showmaker is, now that he's back in lane, feeling a bunch better. Zekka also went for that early teleport. And Peanut going to share the Rift Scuttler. Takes this one towards the top side. Both of these jungle is very happy to just farm it out until level six. I feel like, honestly, you know, you get a lot of power from the fire after level six, but I feel like if you can find an angle pre-six to gank, it's really fantastic because, you know, you're kind of, you do you at least have some form of uh, yeah. engage CC. Yeah, the Nocturne gets more from his level 6 than Vi does, even though they both have really strong ultimates. Uh, and if Lucid can you know, be in a summoner before level 6, like let's say you got Zekka's Flash, then when you do hit that level 6 point, that's a really easy, far easier target to take down. We'll see whether they do actually go for something like that. You can see Delight set up to try and... Uh do something to Showmaker here as the Charm connects, so does the Seismic Shove, and now Delight is making his way in. They find the Crash down, and that is going to be the Flash out from Showmaker. So I think they might have heard you, Orcs, but um, it was Humble Life Esports that decided to take that information. Yeah, and actually, I think Showmaker got hurt quite a bit there, because I think he procced the Phase Rush and then got Charmed, so it was like running towards uh, Zekka, because obviously, oh, normally yeah, when you get Charmed, you're like slowed um, as you're walking towards them. He was speeding over. He's like, come here right now, Zekka. And <laughs> uh, that actually worked against him a decent amount. Obviously, just get away with just a flash, but a really nice roam there from Delight to set that up. Yeah, now he's back in this lane as well. No harm, no foul. Still going to be a decent advantage for Aiming and Kellen as Doran continuing to have a rough time as Kingen just going to slice him up. That's a solo kill. Welcome back, Kingen. It's good to have you here. 
And uh, Doran is, yeah, he's just having a rough week this time around as Lucid is going to be able to secure his uh, Raptors. Peanut you know not going to be able to steal that away. You say welcome back, and I say welcome back, Doran. This is just the Doran we know. <laughs> oh, no. From last year, I feel like this guy was just solo killed so consistently in matchups where you wouldn't expect him to be. And then won the game yeah. most of the time. So not a great move by him, but not too uncharacteristic. Feels like he's slipping in his own ways. Uh, ways. But I am happy with seeing King on a carry. As you said uh, at the start of the series, King has been performing much better over the weeks. Uh, and seeing on the Udia, he had a good game, but... Definitely felt like in the later fights, he just wasn't, he was just there, he was just tanky. Yep, he was. Uh, whereas on a Renekton, we've seen him really able to deliver if he can get into the right spots on yep. the enemy team. Certainly can do a heck of a lot of damage. And that is a ghost on uh, Viper as well. So if he can ever uh, lock down that Ruthless Predator onto the Zeri, it is danger. So I'm going to check this out from Kingen's perspective. Just sort of waiting for those cooldowns to come back up again and clears out every single minion. And it's a very comfortable slice of dice. Yeah, so the, the Q just to clear the minion wave and immediately get the level 6. Like, he even saw the experience bar. He was so far away. One shots the whole wave and very clearly caught Doran off guard. We've seen so many Cassantes where, like, ult for ult is traded and it just ends up being a disengage. Like, you know, Cassante yeah. and Aatrox, yeah, they yeah. both ult. Like, okay, I can't fight Cassante ulted. I'll back off. But obviously, Doran didn't have his ult there and was pretty free pickings for Kingen. Well, now you got Harmon Life Esports doing that thing where they take dragons. Um, that is going to continue here as they'll lock this one down. I kind of thought that maybe Zephyr would have this conversation with his players about dragons are kind of good. Maybe we should do more killing of dragons, but perhaps that well, is did... more of a second dragon focus or a third one. They did hover Smolder, so. You know, ah, true. Um, maybe that's what they were thinking about. But then they decided against it. So they were like, you know, dragons are all right. Yeah, Lucid going to go for a little bit of denial here as King and moving into the river. You can see Lucid just wanting to get over, continue farming his jungle as much as he possibly can. As Viper is going to get himself out. It's a decent hook onto the Rel, but the ulti through from Viper does do a lot of upfront damage to aiming. And so they're getting the ult out of Viper, definitely good. But you can see the trade still going to be heavily won by Harmalai. Yeah, I mean, been in the ult's massive. The Ghost as well taking down. Ooh, Honestly, true. the the ult for Zeri at level 6 is like such a massive all-in threat. I feel like a lot of Zeri lanes, you see them just kind of do nothing. They hit level 6 and suddenly the all-in potential is there. So the fact you burn it and force the light to go back, I think uh, D plus pretty happy with that one. 100%. And so still a 22 CS advantage here for Aiming and Kellen. Much better performance from them thus far. And I think... With a Jinx, the just general playstyle of aiming and D plus in general, as far as like feed aiming all of the money, it feels a lot better when it's onto Jinx, right? Yeah. Um, unless she's got six items and they're the optimal ones, in which case, stop taking fun. Uh, Supermaker Death Rocket oh. just barely uh, misses onto Viper. Bit of adrenaline, you could imagine. As now Lucid gets the flash off. That's just not spell shieldable. They chain the CC gorgeously. And Peanut is just going to be eradicated. And now, is this another one? Kingen, as the Q is going to miss, will we have a slice and dice? The answer is no. And the Ghost is going to be enough to get Doran out of there. Yeah, Doran Q's the wrong way. Doesn't use ultimate in that fight. So ends up having the Ghost away, but we'll just get out of it. But uh, yeah, Lucid, when he's played by, has been so crisp on this. You know, not allowing spell shields to really have any impact against him. Or even against things like Seek's Arm got his onions by Comboing the flash with the ultimate, you just don't give the opportunity. Oh. Uh, well, ooh, King and I actually kind of thought that he was going to stay under there, but didn't want to risk it. Yeah, I think with the ulti available, it is danger. Once the stun ends, the Cassante can kind of lock you in place for like six seconds or something. Yeah. Uh, when you're in a tower, a little bit dangerous. You know, if he gets the Q3 into W into R, you're just going to take a million tower hits and die. So King and makes the right move to back off. But yeah, I mean, Lucy's just been so good at like. You know, typically the Nocturne doesn't feel much threat from the Vi, which is why I think Peanut was so confident there. And he does end up getting punished. Yeah, and so now, Hummer Life Esports on the back yeah, foot. Like, this might translate yeah, into a dragon. Yeah, Let's have a look at this from Kellen's like perspective. Oh, the, the flash, oh. the chain. Yeah. It's beautiful. And unfortunately, Kellen takes the kill. Thresh <laughs> carry, eh? Thresh carry. <laughs> 80 Thresh, you know. Yeah, I know. It's, hey, it was a thing. You get that extra flay damage. Oh, baby. Those autos. Blood Song Thresh. I used to have, I actually, I remember 
a, a, a friend of mine used to just build only Bloodthirsters on Thresh over and over again. Um, that was his build, and he'd sometimes build a Warmox. There is definitely some devious people yeah, there were in, in, legal, in Legal Legends. This was a while ago as well. Yeah. Um, I feel like there, there is just some people in the depths who just have, this is what they play every game, and that's yep. just what they do. As there is the flash forward, Paranoia comes down, Peanut looking for some revenge, and he'll get it. As now, once again, a little bit of aggression on to Showmaker, but this time he lands the seismic shove, and Zekka not going to be able to find too much more. Of course, with the Unraveled Earth down, makes it very, very difficult. But still, Life Esports on the board now. As, all right, Charm going to be flashed here, as Showmaker needs to be careful, but he does have support from Lucid. The flash out from Zekka, and Peanut does find the fear, as now Delight coming on in. Good, Charm is going to connect. DK still looking for a little bit more, as the Seismic Shove does come on through. So make a Death Rocket, and oh! the flash out from Peanut! Oh man, he was definitely dead. Really, really nice flash. Yeah, and he he knew that Zeko would uh, survive that ult. Yes, oh, yeah. yes, of course. Of no, course. I knew you'd be okay, bro. No, that's why I flashed it. You know. Yeah, except he's had a heart attack now. Um, thankfully he he got better. Um, that was that was a rough moment. As Hook going to connect here onto Doran, and it sends a message and not much more. Yeah, that's one of the ones where you just like, yeah, I can hit it. Yep. You know, and Doran's like, okay. That's your that's your first warning, Doran. <laughs> Doran's like, what? I don't care. Completely that's, unfazed. Yeah, it's been uh, Doran's kind of mo throughout this series. As uh, Viper just collecting farm towards the bottom side uh, has actually closed that CS gap just a little bit. And uh, teleport to the top lane for I believe Showmaker. As uh, never mind, oh, it's uh, it's game back into this one v one. And Humble Life Esports doing it again. Uh, this is going to be second Drake going on over. It's going to be a cloud and an ocean. And we'll see what soul it's going to be. Mountain soul. Pretty good. Yeah, that's not a bad one. Yeah, but Maybe we'll D-plus will fight for it. We'll see. It feels like we see uh, both Showmaker and Lucid kind of positioned together, but then Lucid starts to move top to try and help with that play, but it's already over. Yeah. Zeka finds a really nice trade onto Showmaker, and then it gets very scrappy here. You know, forces a flash with this knockback from Showmaker. So good. Allows Lucia to find the vial, and just so many summoners burn on the back of this play because Zeka loses his flash. Uh, then we see the light going in to try and create some space, and then because of the ult from Pina, uh, sorry, from aiming, Pina has to be in his flash as well. That flash was absurd from uh, from Pina. Oh, <laughs> yeah, wow! That's, that's what I expected. Okay. Yeah, it's a big wow. D plus fans devastated. I know, but aiming showing us that he can actually hit those. So yep. we'll see whether the next one is going to be a little bit better. As uh, Zeka, perfect timing. You know, he lined up so well. Even with a flash, he still hit someone. Yeah, gorgeous. Still aiming now in this mid lane, tidying up the minions. And Viper has just been pretty cool, calm, and collected. 10 CS behind, but does have the extra kill. And we're just waiting to see where the D plus can fight for a dragon. Three and a half minutes for that one. They are dragonless this entire series so far. Yeah. Um, so obviously something you normally want to pay attention to at some point, uh, but for now they're looking towards the Rift Herald it feels like with the vision setup coming in. Uh, the Void buffs were actually just kind of ignored this game. Uh, Three of them were picked up by DK, but otherwise the rest were just left. Yeah, I think those ones were quite late, so this the follow-up spawns were later. King in. Oh, this is a bit dangerous. King in is very strong. Uh, Zekka is just going to get dashed on. Look at that. The Eclipse complete, and Zekka is going to throw out the ulti. He doesn't get the charm, though. Well, if you weren't sure if Final Life Peaceful were able to fight Rift Herald, I think after that, yeah. definitely not. <laughs> yeah, you're feeling a bit more sure now. Yeah. Um, I mean, while Showmakers is kind of in a very comfortable matchup, um, Thornmail, not so good against rocks. No. As that is a decent charm, but uh, Lucid just seems unfazed by the whole situation. Delight moving on over. Kingen is here, though. And so I don't think that they're going to be able to defend this turret. Um, yeah. Shock horror, I know. Uh, but Kingen is going to be able to just take that one down. That will be first turret block going over to DK once again. And the thing that worries me, um, if you are a D plus fan, is that. We saw this kind of happen in the last game. Yeah, this is like a shot for shot repeat. D plus got the early lead. They don't get any dragons. 
something, something, they lose. <laughs> yeah, um, something, something, the soul's good and they lose. Yeah. Uh, so it's, so it's, it's about this next fight, right? So the next time uh, this dragon is going to be spawning, we'll just have to see whether Deep Plus do actually have some vision around the area, whether they have just considered that a dragon is going to be an important thing for them. Yeah, and last time the third dragon went over to Harmelite Esports because Viper got a really good chunk onto aiming in the setup. Not really as plausible this happens in this composition, but if someone from D-plus missteps, so easy for an engage to be pulled off, that could be what ends up happening. Or you know, even in the fight itself, if there's a, a flank angle that comes in, liable just to uh, blow up D-plus, especially we've seen Rel be so potent when a team ends up grouping up. Yep. Let's see whether Delight can find that angle. It's a possibility. Uh, is aiming with his rocket launcher, very comfortably able to take down these minions. Quap ticks down to one minute, and the vision is being cleared out by Hanwha. Very happily making it dark for D+, but they have a Rift Herald that this time they're going to use at pretty perfect timing uh, as aiming. Um, I guess maybe clicked it by accident. Not sure about that, but uh, thankfully didn't just pilot his way in and that do they don't get the charge and it's just It's a, not as it's bad as disaster. the other one he did where he ulted all the way bot and then they lost mid tier one because he went bot with it and then Showmaker yeah. also died. And Showmaker looked the angriest I've ever seen him and we've all seen that clip where he wants to punch the camera, so you know yeah. he, he was It was worse than that? It was he was <laughs> he was not happy. <laughs> um, oh, nice little charm there. On to Kingen, who does lose half of his health bar. Almost. Uh, still has Cull the so is otherwise going to be fine. Peanut going to be spotted on this ward as in comes Lucid. Peanut can, of course, get out the spell shield, but this is going to be dangerous. Great crash down from Delight as the Paranoia comes on through. There's the slice and dice from Kingen, though. Gets on top of Peanut, but it's a trade of junglers. And meanwhile, Doran just trying to get back to the rest of his team. Unfortunately, Kingen, he finds a big cull the meek, but it is not enough to lock down a kill, and the Crocodile is turned into a handbag right when the Drake has spawned. 30 seconds, he does have teleport, but I just don't think they're going to be able to stop this dragon from going down. Yep, and Hunter Life Esports still have a smite, and by smite, I mean Rel'Q. Yeah. Um, so they have a decent job of securing. No, uh, Jinx ult means, yeah, D-plus aren't even going to contest this one. Should just get secured, and a good fight for D-plus. It looked a little bit dangerous, Peanut, going in there, but the Rel value, pretty massive in that small choke point. Oh, 100%, and it's just it happened again. So the, the script, 100% being followed as the Drake does go over. Soul Point now up and available for Hummer Life Esports will just mean that Doran is absolutely massive. The fact that Peanut will be more difficult to kill. And uh, Viper, like Viper is Viper's gonna, yeah, he's on conditioning overgrowth, you know, and Zeri does get quite bulky. Yeah. Even those extra resists, you know, we've seen times where a few Mountain Dragons on top of an 80 carry who goes even just like GA, you can put them at uh, kind of ridiculous amounts of armor. So it's, it's valuable for everyone. But Maybe it'll remind us of the, you know, the Trinity Force Zeris that we used to see oh, that were just absurdly tanky. Uh, we're going to see this one one more time. Yeah, so it ends up being very clustered. Peanut nearly goes down uh, in the initial play, but then obviously the Rekton chases him. But the Zeri Ari is so good. You know, all you need to get is like one kill, one reset, and suddenly everyone is free pickings with that mobility. They don't end up pushing more into the Talia here, but... You know, they got what they wanted on the back of this. Yeah, it's really nicely played, and Kingen being shut down as well is a big added bonus. So he's got his Black Cleaver now completed as well, so that is a still a very scary Renekton, as Lucid decides he doesn't really want to do too much here. 2,000 gold is the lead just in the top lane. Yeah, uh, obviously a big lead for that top lane role, but it just kind of put into context, no one else really has a significant lead for D+, and then aiming is behind 800 gold. So it is all about this Renekton, and in the last fight, you know, in the clustered uh, mess, he did obviously get a lot of damage done, a lot of value, but wasn't really able to take anyone out particularly important. You know, Peanut's job was done when he died. Yeah. He had already pressed the ultimate button, made things dark, made it difficult for D+. It a bit spooky. Yeah, to carry out the fight. So, Humble Life Esports now just tidying up vision. This Baron going to be spawning in five seconds' time. You can see parking himself in there. And getting back to what he uh, really likes to do, which is taking as much money from the Rift as possible. Showmaker up here towards the top side. Haven't seen too much from him outside of uh, just narrowly avoiding death uh, a great many times. Does not have his flash. Yep, relatively soon. As 
aiming will help secure this red buff as it ticks over 20 minutes. So collecting that one for everyone. Yeah, I think Honma Life are pretty fine just waiting for this next dragon. Yeah. It's really the onus is going to be on D plus to set something up. And what we often see when it is that soul uh, on the cards, the team who are miles away from it will push towards Baron instead. They'll try and drag the enemy team up towards Baron. Uh, it's it's such a common play where like Peanut will head over to the dragon and be like, oh, they're not on this side of the map. Let's just start. Oh no, they're going Baron. They'll have to run all the way over, and then they're hoping for a fight to start a Baron that they can win. Uh, where Hunter Life is oh, from vision. Oh, oh dear. He is going to try and get himself out of here. That is a decent playback. The hook was okay too, but he is just dead. Yeah. Viper getting a third kill. Um, certification, I think, is being threatened right now. Is that tiny Vault Breaker enough to get Lucid out of the way of the charm? So he's going to be all right. Ten seconds, though, for Kellen. He was very low level, so it's not going to be as much punishment as it could have otherwise been. It's two minutes on this dragon. Got a little bit worried with all of Life Esports clustered around that, but uh, time it doesn't uh, really seem too good for taking a Drake at this point in time. Yeah, they get their Renekton TP, which is pretty big, especially since he's such a big presence in the side lane. Uh, but I also think it's it's a good call from Kellen not to flash. He was definitely in the wrong place uh, at that situation by himself. Ideally, you'd want someone else to like be face checking the, uh, the threshold to land them out. But once the Ari is in, like, in range of you after one ult and has two more charges, a uh, flash would just be massively wasted if yeah. you'd be in there. So good good restraint not to end up throwing that one away. Still will have that one for the upcoming fight. And really, summoners across the board going to be available for this next dragon, which I do feel like favors D+. Uh, I think Jinx having summoners. Oh, Charm is going to connect there onto Lucid, but uh, thankfully did get uh, a little bit of a Vault Breaker off so that the uh, Orbit Deception doesn't chunk him out. Still, D plus finally thinking about dragons. Securing Bernard Rush with control. Oh, imperative. So important. Uh, and ideally, if they can find an opportunity to take this mid to tier one, it would really help them get control. Ooh, weave as well. First time we've really seen it used aggressively to try and get these objectives as Zekka immediately has to ult. Does find a charm onto the Talia, but it is not going to be anything that they can actually follow up on. So that outer turret does go down. We've as well invested, so they won't have that for a potential dragon fight that is going to be coming up in about 20 seconds' time. But I think the trade-off is pretty good because you got Zekka's ultimate, but yeah. it's a very fine wind. I mean, look at the speed of that clock taken away in his ultimate. Oh, yeah. It's gone. It's not a long cooldown. Well, Peanut getting the bad news that I there was a Renekton in there. Is that a ward? Is that a very big ward <laughs> I see? That's a really big scaly ward. Oh, it's moving about. How? That must be one of those new fancy wards. Is it a Nico? <laughs> Uh, that's alright, Hook gonna connect onto the champion that really cares the least about getting hooked. Wow, Zekka's ult, it, it, it's back up, you know? In yeah. 30 seconds, it was basically all back up. So this is gonna be an honest 5v5. We'll just have to see who's gonna be able to come out on top. Eyes on the Paranoia, as well as D+, being able to get Kingen into the right position, stay grouped up, get the target selection working out as Delight on a good flank angle for this Magnet Storm. They are grouped. There's the paranoia to start this one off as in he goes, finds the backline, finds four. That's going to be the Mountain Soul as well. Delight taking a lot of damage, but aiming as well, getting chunked down all out from door. And he wants to be able to kill the Jinx, and he does so. That is the job done. The hook going to come through from Kellen, but he is just going to die immediately afterwards. And D+, plus, I mean, they gave it an honest crack, but it just didn't work. The disarray that the Paranoia put your team into, you could see D+, plus was so nervous when it came down. Started to peel backwards, trying to deal with Exante. Peanut didn't even actually reactivate the ult. He just took the soul, and as soon as that was locked in, Hunter Life Esports had all the confidence to keep pushing forwards. And as I said before, with this Ari zeri combo, once you start losing the fight, there's no running away and getting everyone out. You just start losing members left and right with a reset potential, with a chase down from all the mobility. Oh, Showmaker. Yeah, Zekka is going to find the charm there. Absolutely gorgeous. He had to go in, try and find some sort of attempt at a pick or a steal or something, but uh, just not to be the case. Is now King going to give him the thumbs up. And he knows 
He's not going to be able to get in there. It is still going down pretty low as Lucid. Can he get the steal? The answer's no. Peanut blocks that one down. And now Kingen does find a huge Culver Meek, but I just don't know whether it's going to be enough. There's the first kill, though, for aiming. There's Peanut taking a lot of damage. The Zap connects onto Viper, and that will slow him down. But Doran is just a brick wall. And Zekka, he has not a lot of mana, but he still has enough to get himself over this wall. And Viper is going to help lock down Lucid. Aiming now trying to... Is he doing any damage? To the answer is no. Uh, and it's a double as the ace comes in and Hummer Life Esports. I have a feeling we are moving towards a 2-0 here, Ox. Yeah, uh, I think that looks like the direction we're going. This is replay of that fight. So we see Delight has this beautiful flank angle that comes in. Uh, but Hunter Life Esports are very focused on getting the dragon. So Paranoia comes in. They start to play defensive. Look at the old. But Peanut's like, you know what? I'm just finishing the soul. Doesn't get a chance to actually reactivate, but it doesn't matter because Deep, Deep was already the back foot. We actually see Lucid go in to try and let the rest of his team get away. But we see uh, Doran just solo out aiming in the midst of four people. The value of this Cassante, massive here. And then here, you know, the game is kind of doomed if they get this Baron. So I don't fault uh, Deep was trying to contest it, but they kind of just all funnel in one by one. Lucid tries for the steal, gets pinned down. It looks like aiming has the potential to go for resets here. Does get the kill on the Delight but then isn't able to really do more, you know? Does outrange Viper, but Doran is just menacingly walking at him, and that's yeah. enough. And look at look at aiming, he's going to try and do some kiting, um, and I just don't think that that's really going to work. Yeah, but Doran is utilizing the walk yeah. strategy. And also the armor strategy. Oh man, so potent. Yeah, it's really powerful. Um, the Last Whisper is going to be there uh, for aiming now. A little bit too little and possibly too late. Yeah, maybe we should have gone for a first whisper in this game. Yeah, uh, <laughs> would have liked that. Yeah, I think the game might be a little bit over by the time he gets. I mean, to be honest, there's no, nothing else you can really do with the build for Jinx, but it's just, yeah, this this arm of this Cassante has come online way too It's exactly quick. the same goal graph, man. Precisely the same. Uh, Zekka it's, is going to take a bit of damage, but it's otherwise. The end of the season. Yeah. Two days before, the script writers oh. are going to just start reusing these while they're working on playoffs, so. You know, we can't complain. You did mention that, uh, you know, the script writers had gotten a little bit lazy towards the end of the season. Um, yeah. And I didn't want to believe you. And so have I, because I mentioned that yesterday and I mentioned it again today. I know. I've my narratives. Well, there's a cease and desist. Zekka is taking a lot of damage. There's Dominus involved as well. So 800 gold going over to the Renekton. And now Peanut could be in trouble. He's going to try and fear Lucid. Not actually going to come on through. As Showmaker is just surfing his way down. Doesn't find the flick back onto Peanut, who is just walking. Walking, walking, walking. Super Mega Death Rocket going to come on through there as well, as Lucid is going to get a little bit scared. He was very tanky. My goodness. But uh, they do manage to take him down. So that is going to delay this Baron push just that little bit. Yeah, and it's big because you don't lose any inhibitors. So the pushing power of Final Life Esports is limited, and you open up the opportunity to contest the Elder, because that is the Hail Mary that D Plus is hoping for right now. Zekka didn't have his ult available. It is such a rare window that this Ari with this build with Malik yeah. doesn't have the ult, but they find one to punish. And then Peanut, um, as you said, he takes a while to die, but he's just not getting out of this situation. He's kind of just stuck. He's sort of walking around in circles. He sort of knows that uh, it's not looking so hot. Yeah. And so he's just going to fall down. So, two kills coming through for D+. Plus. Some signs of life here, as they are still a little bit more than 5,000 gold behind. They do have a composition that could theoretically work. And we mentioned it earlier on, right? Like, this is, on both sides, compositions that can snowball teamfights very effectively. The problem is, is and I, I keep going back to something that Wolf said on the space, which is D plus just haven't looked very good in teamfights. Yeah, it feels like even that last team fight around the Dragon, like I know Honor Life Esports had just picked up Soul, but it didn't really feel like D plus did anything apart from run away. Yeah, and it also looked like Hammer Life Esports didn't do as much as they could have theoretically done. Yeah, right? I mean, like, the fact that Peanut didn't reactivate his ult, yeah. he still completely rolled that fight, says says a lot. Um, and it's, it's similar to what happened, I mean, we keep saying that it's very similar to last game, and it, and it is once again, because Peanut, even on the Maokai in the last game, it felt like he was just doing the things that he had to do to win, not necessarily having to make big plays, find out plays and things like this. That it wasn't really finesse, it was just, I have this champion that has this utility and I'm going to utilize it. And it's happening once again, although now is uh, in potentially a little bit of trouble. Doran does have access to the anti-CC. That is going to get him out of the flick. Hook going to connect this time around, though. He needs an extra few of those. 
And he is going to get thrown back now. Cease and desist as Doran once again going to get caught out. But the same thing's going to happen to Kingen. But he gets to turn into a giant angry crocodile. So it's just going to be the ultimate that he invests. And now, four versus five for this Elder fight. Hummel Life Esports, I think they still need to try and go for something. Paranoia still up and available. And Viper is still absolutely terrifying. There's a Magnus Storm into the back line. As you can see, the Jinx is the main character of this one, but he is going to get Fee, and Peanut gets on top of him. And it's a 4v5, guys, and still Homo Life Esports are winning. Viper is going to take down Lucid, and it is an absolute disaster once again for D plus Kia. This Elder is going to belong to Homo Life Esports, and Showmaker can only watch. And even then, he may have to do so from the death chamber as Peanut looking to get his his revenge after a thumbs up is thrown his way. Yeah, so well played there. I feel like from Hunter Life Esports, despite not having the top laner, they get on top of aiming, blow him up, delete him from the game, and we see Viper, you know, he gets punished in a similar way, but with the GA up, there's just no threat. You know, they kill him, he has flash still available, flashes out, able to turn it around, and this is really where you see the goal difference sink in. I honestly think D Plus did everything right. They got the initial two picks that allowed them to contest a dragon. They got this pick on a Doran that sets them up for a 4v5. You can't really ask a team to do more than this in the setup for Elder, but they just didn't have enough. And even, I want you to watch Kellen and the, the play he makes in the team fight itself. We weren't gonna see it, no. but he did this fantastic play, disengaged Delight perfectly, and it just didn't matter. It didn't at all. And oh, now, now DA is completed. We're gonna have a look at it one more yeah. time. Yeah, so you mentioned Kellen actually playing really, really well. And they managed to get the GA immediately on Viper as well, but then he just flashes away. Yeah, I think the problem is you lose the Jinx, and that is like so much of your follow through. Like the composition works on that you get a reset, you get a reset, you get the momentum. When your Jinx is the first to die, what do you do? Yeah, well, not a whole lot, as it turns out. Just didn't really have the damage there. So now, I'm Life Esports, they have the Elder. They have the Baron and they have the Soul. So it's Exodia put together once again. Very consistent Exodias. I often feel like sometimes it is no known that it's not that consistent to pick up uh, all the parts of Exodia, but we do have them back to back in this one. Damage dealt even between both Zekka and Viper. Both of them having great games. And I think I might be a, if, if I was a, a, a voter, yeah. I might be a Boom Boom Damage voter. Yeah, it could, could well be this game. Oh dear. Maybe I'm media as well. Maybe we're all media deep down. Deep down. Sometimes you just see the big number, you see Viper playing Zeri, you're like, yeah, my brain likes this. You see that? Yeah. You no, know, my brain's like, yeah. And that was also uh, pretty massive in that particular moment. As, oh goodness, the Wrath of the Dragon coming on in here as Peanut is going to take down Kellen. There is the kill for Viper, who's looking for even more. Peanut grabbing himself a double in this fight at the same time as Delight is <laughs> having, a, having a fun time throwing himself into the fountain. They'll take down these Nexus turrets. <laughs> he just wanted to kill Aiming one last time. He really did. Uh, just being the cavalry as there's the flash on forward. It's a triple in the end, I believe, for Peanut. And Showmaker actually having a bit of a, a grin on his face at the end of that one. Nothing much more he could do as Harmer Life Esports just kind of rolled over the top of them. Yeah, and I think for D+, you know, we knew that looking at the sort of third to sixth in the playoffs, Harmer Life, KT, D+, Quantum Freaks, Hunter Life Esports looks significantly above the rest, but this kind of just solidifies it. The fact that they have the choice of their opponent probably will be Quantum Freaks, and I think D Plus should count themselves lucky if that is the case, because they look very formidable on the back of this. Oh yeah, uh, and I feel like now the, the questions that we have as far as like, who is who going to choose uh, when we're going into the playoffs? I think choosing Quantum Freaks is looking pretty obvious. And then choosing not Humble Life Esports after they managed to take a win in the first round of the playoffs is also going to be a pretty obvious one. Seems a no-brainer, especially on the fact that Gen G get to choose to put T1 against Humble Life Esports. Yeah. That feels pretty nice, yep. uh, given how their last matchup went. But yeah, I think it's just been really strong performance. The early game, I will say, was a bit slower. Uh, and there were definitely points where they were put at a deficit. Definitely felt like, you know, we saw some proactive play from D+, Plus was good. But I think it's very clear that like Gen G as a whole last year were very good at playing the map, and this is a lot of that Gen G. And they had a very good understanding of how to set up for team fights, how to play the map, how to get resources on a Viper. And Viper is just rather good when you give him gold. <laughs> he is rather good, um, just in general. But all, like 
I feel like it, it always comes down to me, for Hummer Life Esports, the, the way they look with these compositions that have something like a Yone, something like an Ari in the mid lane, they just, they look almost unbeatable yeah. with Zekka on these champions that he's so incredibly comfortable on. And then you have these these corky games that sort of remind us that they can look a little bit uh, uncoordinated and uncomfortable. Yeah, and I think, you know, Zek is definitely a player who's gotten a lot of criticism in the past from us as well. This split for the corky, but I think if the team just plays to the champs that he works well on, they just look phenomenal. And he yeah. looks phenomenal, and I think ultimately, you know, you could try and change Zekka, but why fight what works? Yeah, and it does. It works really well. Yeah. So you just you just don't fight it. Yeah, you just lean into it. And I think the meta's been good. The reintroduction of Ari has really paid off. And in fairness, we're saying this, but his Talia recently was really solid as well. So I think ultimately this is looking like the final evolution of One Life Esports. For a long period of the split, looked like it was just going to be Gen G T1 finals. And I think right now, One Life Esports seeming likely to potentially break up that pairing. Yeah, well, I mean, it at least is another contender in yeah. that fight for the top two, right? And I don't think it's set in stone if they can continue playing like this because it's a blueprint, right? The blueprint is Doran absorbs pressure by dying multiple times in the early game, but it works. And then you've got Zekka who's able to then add an extra threat. And in the whole while, Viper is the one that's just going to hard carry every single fight. As we're seeing right here, he does get singled out. But uh, it doesn't actually matter yeah, this because is... the Jinx just dies and then he's able to find a better position. Both these games have just been D plus like, let's kill Viper. We win on the back of that. And then they didn't, you know? Yeah. Game one, he died a lot of times on that Lucian focused out. Game two didn't die, but you could see the plan there was obviously to blow him up and fortunately the GA saved the day. Oof. And with Baron and Elder and Sol, being able to uh, just surgically remove D-plus yeah, from their me. Nexus turrets was a pretty elementary task. Uh, okay, okay, and... <laughs> <laughs> just having a good time. I was expecting a little bit more of a giggle as he was uh, charging the enemy fountain there. Yeah, I love how Showmaker just sends it. Yeah. And some nice ooze coming out there as well. Looking pretty calm. Our uh, Hamalife Esports. <laughs> Peanut saying that it was it was his kills. Zekka actually in the end doing uh, massive amounts of damage and Viper just slightly trailing behind. But as you can see in the gold difference, this graph looking very, very similar to what we saw in uh, game number one. So it looks like the Hummer Life Esports game plan working out pretty effectively. Yeah, pretty convincing. Um, you know, I think there was maybe some thoughts, perhaps D plus, you know, after the game against Gen.G potential for them to at least put some resistance up against them, but it didn't really come out. Early game was fine, but when it got to the mid to late, just no contest. Yeah, it just didn't quite work out. And now we are going to have the POG interview with Hama Life Esports, uh, the entire team interview uh, with them. But then we're also going to have D-plus gear because, of course, this was their final match of the season. And so we're going to have uh, a conversation with them before they head towards the playoffs. But first, it's time to throw it over to the space to break down that game. Yes, up next is the space, actually, after that game number two win over <laughs> over DK from the side of Homel AP Sports. Um, pretty elementary stuff. It felt like game number two looked a lot like game number one, where stacking drakes came in and Hummel AP Sports were pretty proactive this time around and uh, were able to kind of put the nail in the coffin relatively easily this time in game two. Like game one, I thought the draft was pretty good for D+. I mean, there there were some some issues in how the execution worked out, but once again, you have a pick comp, you have Jinx, she gets excited, you win team fights, right? And that did happen once or twice where they didn't end up getting that initial pick and win the fight. Later on, uh, the re-engages and the Nocturne ultimate really messed with how they wanted to play them out. And they also just didn't get enough control of the early game at all here. Whereas in game one, they were able to get a lot of power onto Doran. It's Cassante this time around. Yes, a solo kill did go over, but they weren't able to leverage any of this Vi power really at all. Additionally, you are... They, they were actually winning early laning phase. And Vi has a pretty decent dragon take. So I just, I don't know what is happening in the DK comms. I, well, obviously part of this is due to Lucid, but just in general, the team decision to not take, they didn't take a single dragon. Like obviously they contested for souls, but outside of that in this series, even though I think in game number one, they, they had bot lane prior early on as well. Bot lane, game number two, bot lane prior to Jinx and Fresh actually does have a, a early advantage because pre six, but post first few levels, you have a bit, really big range advantage. 
just a single Drake could make a really big difference. Instead, they play towards the top side of the map, as I think you should with this draft, but it... I, I, I get why DK is like, we need someone to shot call, because right now it feels like nothing is happening at all. They're just kind of there, and then they lose a team fight to better team fight teams. Yeah, and I think we should talk about these early Drakes as well, because we're going to see in these highlights that essentially... They're kind of be gi being given up, as you mentioned, right? The Vi is on the top side of the map. The first one's okay. The second one, again, just kind of letting it go. And Homolife Esports gain a lot out of this. And there's just no, there's no cross map. You know, yeah, you got the bubs, sure, but there, there's no attempt to try to dive. It's Cassante, so that's kind of the tough part of this. You play to your Wincon bottom side. I do have this scuffle here into the third dragon, which goes very much the way of Hano Life here. And this is the moment when Viper actually starts to pull ahead massively in gold, as Kingen alone isn't going to be able to carry the later part of this fight. But the re-engages were so clean from Hano, they were so confident in every skirmish they took. What is really big for me is that it feels like Hanwha can lose a member and still be like, we are going to win this fight, we know how to play it out. And for DK, it's the opposite. Unless everything goes perfectly, doesn't work. I also think that like aiming at like four ultimates that like their peanut just flashes it in the previous play just flashes it Zekka lives with like a sliver of health I think that this game was closer than the second one weirdly enough because or the first one rather which is weird but there were a couple of moments where I think it could have changed but I don't think the outcome would have changed because the DK team fighting is just again it's so disjointed yeah, and we saw kind of a scrappy team fight there, and moving into, we had the Soul go over to Hamalife Esports, and then eventually we had the Elder Drake fight start, and a lot of the fights looked very similar. This Elder Drake fight actually started well for DK because Doran kind of just ran at them for vision, I suppose, and uh, didn't go very well. Yeah, could have just gone over the cone with Zekka there, but decides to try to get some additional information here. And even though it ends up being, as, as Chronicler put it, a, a 4v5 fight here because Doran is picked, they know they have GA with Viper. He puts in a decent amount of poke damage here over the wall, and you know that Viper is going to be able to get it done in this fight if given the agency to do so. And look at how patient Hano Life are here. Let's sit it out, back off here. Viper going to, you know... So wait, see if they're going to engage on him. Zekka's here on the cross. He can actually help heal. And Hanwha Life Esports just knew this fight was theirs from start to finish, even without their tank. You also know uh, if you are Hanwha Life that DK needs to take this. And then here, they go all in. They don't really, I think, have a great uh, position because of where Showmaker is in this fight to try and play towards aiming. Then Showmaker backing off here. I think if you actually get a... Uh, there is a window there where... Once he comes out of the GA, you can flick him back in the team with the Talia. I think that was the only win condition to have. They're down a soul. They're down like 6,000 gold at this point. So it was always going to be an uphill battle. But it felt like that kill on Doran, there are teams in the LCK that could turn that into a win and a comeback. And DK, unfortunately, just not able to make it happen. Yeah, it was kind of crazy watching that fight just to see how Homolife Esports repositioned. Like, they had position on the left side, and then they immediately came over to the right side after Viper Flash, after his GA. Just really good stuff, really good team fighting from the side of Homolife Esports. Stuff that we are getting accustomed to watching nowadays. But let's see who does pick up the POG for this game number two. And it will, in fact, be Viper, 10 0 and 10. Also, 91% KP, zero deaths, as you just mentioned, Valdez. And so many of the big moments were about him getting agency right. Fights like this, these skirmishes where Zeri operates best, is the chaos that Hunter Life Esports operated. And when Zekka is on a pick like the Ari, like Tristana, we've talked about this so much. They're so good at setting up for Viper by putting the aggression onto the front line. And then fights like this, you know, no, no threat on the Viper whatsoever. He's Zeri, and he's going to get it done. What I love about Viper is that when Viper flashes in, the fight is won. There's a lot of AD carries that I think take really big risks, and sometimes they pay off, sometimes they don't. But with Viper, whenever he is going in, whenever he, and not there because he just lost his, but in, in general, I think he really, this split has shown again how much of a consistent carry he is. I actually think these votes make complete sense as well. Delight also having, uh, having a great game as uh, we yeah, stand. The re on Rel, also yep. some of the, the setups he had on, on the objectives were really good. I thought about it for sure. I think this is a yeah. pretty good spread. Also just, uh, you were talking about the consistency, the consistency of the EN cast and analysts to go hand in hand with media every single day. Just really great stuff, guys. Um, I do agree that uh, I think Viper was the right choice this time around. But uh, jokes aside, we do have a lot of interviews on the way um, with both teams. So I'm gonna hand it over to Jisun for the translation. Thank you very much, guys. This is Jisa for the post-match interview translation. And first off, we are here joined by the winner of the final Saturday showdown of the spring season. 
and the whole player on the side of HANA Life is with me for the interview. To start off, Doran, the spring season has come to an end. Can you give us your overall thoughts on this season? I'm so glad and relieved that we managed to win the last match of the spring regular season. And this is actually the first year of us playing, of uh, all the five players playing together as a team. So I think uh, we were able to build so much teamwork together. What do you think is the biggest strength of HANA life? I think all the individual players have a very high ceiling and potential. Yeah, you guys are closing out the regular season with 15 wins. Now it's time for the playoffs, which is on a little bit of different format because you got to play in a best of five series. I think we really have to focus on the problems and issues that we kind of showed throughout the season. We only have a few days to prepare, so we also got to focus on the drafting as well. And peanut. You know, if you actually lost today, the possibility of getting second place would be completely gone, but you guys managed to get a win today. What did you focus on today? So we kind of realized Lucid, he pops off on Lee Sin for sure, and we also wanted to make sure to remove that in order to also kind of limit Showmaker's champion pool, because with Lee Sin, I think Showmaker gets to play a lot of different champions. And also today's match could actually decide our fate uh, in terms of you know locking second place, so I really, really wanted to make sure that we can get a win. And then you decided to play Nocturne after two years. Last time was 2022, and last time you actually won on this champion was 2018, and then you were on a seven-game losing streak. I mean, there were a lot of things happening ever since like 2019, but I was always kind of practicing Nocturne. So yeah, I'm glad that I got to kind of end the losing streak. Now you get to perform at the playoffs as a HANA Life player this year. What does this mean to you? Yeah, it's been a while uh, since I made it back to this org and actually brought the team to the you know playoffs. So it feels a, it means a lot to me, and I want to make sure that we can perform at the best level at the playoffs. And Zeka, you won a unanimous POG in game number one, and you closing you close out the regular season with thousand POG points. How do you feel? I'm really happy that I got to get the PUG and also won a series uh, with a clean performance. Now that the regular season is over, were you able to kind of accomplish the goals you had in mind before the season started? I feel like this is actually my first time performing with like entirely new roster. But we had a lot of, you know, outgoing players who managed to kind of cheer the entire team up. So it didn't really take a long time for us to completely gel in. And I think I'm really happy that we got to kind of improve the performance altogether. What is your resolution for the upcoming playoffs? I think playoffs, what really matters is how you feel in the day and being at your best condition. So you got to focus on that and also prepare uh, to kind of bring out the best performance possible too. And Viper, you finished the last match of the, of the regular season with a win. How do you feel about that? Yeah, I'm happy uh, to win the season with a win. And I'm pretty happy that we got to kind of show what we practiced so far for the playoffs. Viper, you really, uh, for sure, displayed an exceptional key performance in game two. How do you feel? Well, I mean, this is the end of the regular season, but playoffs is upcoming, and I think we also still have to, you know, do our best in the playoffs. So I still gotta work hard until it's actually over. 
I feel like speaking of playoffs, you just gotta win regardless of your opponent, you know? You just have to be at your best form in order to keep getting the wins uh, in order to win it all. Lastly, the light. Hana Life kind of managed to step up the performance all together as a team. How do you look back at your regular season? Yeah, early on, we were not fully on our best form and performance in terms of the teamwork and stuff, but at the end of the season, we managed to kind of bring it all together. You got to also play a lot of pocket picks like Camille Bard. Will you play any different champions at playoffs? Uh, if you check out my solo queue uh, history, you can actually see that I've been playing some weird picks there, which means I'm practicing them for the playoffs for sure. Anything you want to say to your support opponents at playoffs? I mean, I feel like they're all better than me, but I will make sure to also put up a great fight against them. And next match today is actually T1 going up against DRX, and this will decide who will get second this season. Are you supporting DRX? I mean, I like both teams, so I have no bias. I hope both teams can put up a great game together. Peanut. So, any final word as a captain of Hana Life to all the fans out there? I know early on on the season, we are not performing the best of us, you know. I know it was a little bit disappointing and worrisome, but, you know, we managed to bring it all together and prove. So, I hope to... Uh, I hope we can look forward to your continued support at the playoffs as well. Thank you so much. I really always appreciate your love and support. Once again, congratulations to Hana Life Esports players on winning the Saturday showdown of the Spring Week 9. And next up is Deep Plus Kia joining us for the team interview as they just had their very last match of the regular season. Please welcome Kingen, Lucid, Showmaker, Aiming, and Kellen onto the stage. 네, 아, 디플러스 기아 선수분들 자리로 모셨습니다. 인터뷰 한번 나눠 보도록 하겠습니다. Thank you so much for joining us. 보도록 하겠습니다. First off, Kingen, this was your first regular season on the side of Diplus Kia. How do you look back at it? 좀 디플러스 기아한테 작년에 좀 well, last year, I had a very painful memory at the end of the year up against the plus Kia, and this year, I really wanted to make a great result together. But to be honest, regular season, the result is not that, you know, great. You know, it's a little bit disappointing to the fans, but I want to make sure that we can come back stronger for the playoffs. I don't think this is like a really bad ending to the regular season because we still have playoffs, and I really want to promise that we will come back stronger and do our best. Mm, what are we going to focus on in terms of the playoffs preparation? I mean, we did have multiple issues throughout the season, but I think the most important thing is objective control, so we will try to work on that. Listen, this was your first regular season after you debuted at the LCK. How do you feel? Well, the final result, you know, it's not like meeting my expectations, so I think we left a lot to be desired. But still, you have playoffs coming, which means you can kind of show what you actually wanted to show to the fans. Yeah, because we locked playoffs, I just want to make sure that I can come back with better performance there and beat all the enemies I get to face. And next up is Showmaker. How was your new season with new teammates? Well, to be frank, the regular season results and performance were not up to par, so I think we really have to up the game at the playoffs. Then what is your resolution heading into the playoffs? 
In order to do better at playoffs, you know, we really have to focus on our issues and also different champions in order to win more at the playoffs. And aiming, how was your first regular season with the plus Kia? Well, I think we started off pretty decently, but after that we had a lot of upset losses and also comeback losses. So there were some games where we just lost powerlessly as well, so I think we kind of left a lot to be desired. Then personally, what are you going to focus on in order to refine your performance? I mean, you know, in fact, I have a lot of kind of issues to improve on. Starting from the laning phase and also objective controls, so yeah, all those stuff and especially I just keep driving the Herald. It's a completely a personal individual mistake, so I want to make sure that this will not happen again. Anything you want to say to the fans who has who have supported you throughout the season? Thank you so much for your support and playoffs is even more important so i really wish that we can work hard in order to improve all together as a team and kellen you played with aiming for the first time this year how was it well, Aiming is actually really good at telling me what he actually wants to do in games, so I learned so much by communicating with Aiming. Then, what is your goal for the remainder of the spring season and this year? Well, I know a lot of fans are having high hopes and expectations around us, but we were not able to meet those, so I really wish we can perform better and stronger and even do better up against the stronger teams in the LCK. Before we go, anything you want to say to all the D plus Kia fans out there? We have a new format of playoffs, and we ever since the new format has launched in the LCK, we never made it to the second round of playoffs, so I really wish that this time we can get to second round and then win and then win in order to make it to the finals and also win the LCK title. And that was the team interview from D plus Kia and Hana Life and back to the space. Thank you. Thank you, Jisun, for that awesome interview, that mammoth interview, both of them. It was crazy great work on that. Anyway, let's look at the standings now as we do have the uh, victory from Hamalife Esports in second place for now. But T1, of course, have that matchup later on where if they do win, they will secure second place. They're facing DRX. That is what we expect. And if you notice KT's game score, um, they, 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 get, they get the advantage. T plus is stuck. Worst finish uh, of their org's history. I can't wait for that series because uh, we all assume that's going to happen. Four versus five. I, I don't know what it'll bring, but I'm sure it'll be glorious. There is still a chance that the third place team can select the fifth place team. Um, we'll see if that happens. But guys, we do have replay two up in the break, so make sure you are watching that. And then we do have DRX up against T1 for the second match of the day. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back.
아쉽게 패하긴 했습니다만 정말 그동안에 준비하느라 고생 많았고요. 우리는 전설들의 플레이를 우리 눈앞에서 재생되는 것을 확인했습니다. 그럼 지금 저 팬미팅으로 시작하겠습니다. 1분부터 입장해 주시면 됩니다. 프로 선수들 다 이렇게 팬미팅을 해? 어떻게 해? 너네 하실 수 있는 거 아니잖아. 그럼 저도 다 선수 출연해요. 사인은 어떤 식으로 하나요? 한 장에 다 하나요? 팬이 원하시는 대로 해주시면 돼요. 아, 네 알겠습니다. 아, 예. 안녕하세요. 왜 그랬어요? 아, 신기하게 어떠세요? 성함이 정, 상, 상, 훈, 훈리. 아, 그렇죠. 아, 그렇죠. 아, 앞으로도 좋은 하루 보여줄 감사하겠습니다. 아, 감사합니다. 조심히 들어가세요. 시스템 가동 준비 완료. 안녕하세요. 네. 네, 안녕하세요. 임창현 님이시죠? 네. 안녕하세요. 감사합니다. 백사무님 네. 아, 고맙습니다. 백지님 아, 뭐야. 어제 한 대씩 못 봤어. 아, 주머니 안 떠서 이건 떠요. 안녕하세요. 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 아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아
오랜만에 보니까 되게 감회도 새롭고 여전히 멋있습니다. 당연 네. 화이팅! 아, 안녕하세요. 안녕하세요. 와, 저랑 이름이 같으시고 아유, 감사합니다. 또 저랑 성함이 같은 분. 안녕하세요. 와, 아분이 지금. 저 근데 그런 거좀 궁금해요. 제 나이인데. 아, 진영과 진영이 진짜 많거든요. 지금도 많나요? 인기가 식질 않네요, 이름이. 이지윤, 김지윤, 박지윤. 이 이름 중에 최고는 이지윤입니다. 3년정만 가능할까요? 네네 감사합니다 감사합니다 저저저저저저저저저저저저저저저저저저저저저저저저저저저저저저저저저저저저저저저저저저저저저저저저저저저저저저저저저저저저저저저저저저저저저저저저저저저저저저저저저저저저저저저저저저저저저저저저저저저저
진짜 정말 좋은 모습 보여드렸어요. 아 그럼요. 열정이네. 좋은 거 연습하는 게 맞게 해줬어요. 감사합니다. 아 제가 이제 어 진짜요? 근데 제가 요새 좀 회의해진 느낌 많이 들었는데 약간 열정 가득한 좀 더해야 돼. 잠시만요. 제가 한마디 더 드릴게요. 자, 하나, 둘, 셋! 유정호! 파이팅! 유정호! 파이팅! 잘안오셨네 사람들은 스파다 드시마 볼까? 아니 면허만 있으면 돼 이거 이렇게 시켜보고 있어 있어 육회 라면도 있어 육회 라면도 있어 육회 라면도 있어 야 육회 라면도 있어 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 육회 여기 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 어? 어? 뭐야 방금 먹기 시작했다고 아니, 아니 뭐지? 사장이랑 <웃음> 라면 하나씩 더 시켜 쌀밥을 앞에 두고 더 시켜드려요? 정말 이거 하나 더 시켜 네. 더 먹어 더 먹어 봐. 다 먹어 다 먹어 네. 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 우리 그래도 좀 저요? 저번에도 제가 했는데 수비상관이지 네, 주장님 왜 끝났는데 건배 한번 하시죠 아, 와, 다들 너무 고생하셨고 이런 자리 마련해 주셔서 감사합니다 네. 궁금한 게 있습니다. 뭐요? 오늘 저희랑 스크림을 거절한 팀이 있나요? 두명 있지. 전 200, 258% 있다고 생각합니다. 어떤 팀이 거절했나요? 일단은 첫 번째로 이구는 아, 이미 아, 스케줄링을 아, 다 해가지고 그렇죠. 시즌 시작할 때다 아, 하잖아요. 네, 그래서 약간 밀린 것도 있지. 아, 근데 원래 아, 스케줄 잡는 게 힘들어, 힘들잖아요. 저 막내 작가 시켜줬어요. 네, 지윤님이 그래도 많이 요청했어가지고 <웃음> 만약 쓰리 하게 되면 네. 작가 해가지고 네. 인원 섭외부터 한번 우와. 열심히 뛰어볼까라는 생각을 하... 오! 오! 아니 뭐 그런 거 없어요? 아니 뭐 이런 것도 모르고 작가님들은 약간 그런 언니들 그런... 등사를 견뎌야 돼. 하지마. 아니 민기님은 만약에 하면 파트너가 누구였으면 좋겠어요? 왜 캡틴님 찾을 것 같아? 대체적이면 찾을 것 같아. 그랜드 마스터 찌르면 시켜줄 수 있어. 시켜줄 수 있어. 벌써 지금 저보다 잘하는 원딜 불러와 주세요. 장영, 장영주 씨 데려와. 더 보스트 바꿀 줄 알아. 보스트님 하면 레이. 레이 레이 저녁이긴 해. 화면 하고 싶어요? 화면은 뭐 좋죠 뭐. 제가 만족하려면 일단 제가 혼자서 그 말을 찍고 나서 좀 자신감 생긴 거. 그것도 맞아요. 맞아요. 민희 씨를 딱 그만 찍어야지. 그만 찍어야 섭외 해주세요. 그만 찍어야 섭외 해주세요. 민희 한판 나왔잖아요. 그렇죠? 민희 님 제가 지켜볼게요. 거기서. 아 왜요? 그만 찍으면 제가 바로 칼 섭외. 그러니까 칼칼 고정. 야 앞으로의 계획은 어떻게 될지. 기왕 열심히 하고 앞으로 쭉 열심히 해서 높은 티어 좀 다시 찍어보고 지금 당장 걱정이 거는 리플레이 경기에 대한 이거를 티를 안 내고 방송을 해야 되는데 아 제가 숨겨질지 모르겠어요. 열심히 한번 해보겠습니다. 테스트 한번 해볼까요? 지금 리플레이 경기 어떻게 됐어요? 리플레이 경기요? 아 저희 아직 저희 안 했습니다. 경기 미뤄졌어요. 제가 잠깐 인사 마지막 인사했어요.
네. 리플레이 2 팀원들 다, 다들 많이 연습했는데 결과는 좀 아쉽게 됐긴 하지만 많은 응원해 주셔서 제가 여기까지 올수 있었던 것 같고요. 다음에 또뭐 기회가 된다면 또 좋은 모습 보여드릴 수 있도록 많이 노력하겠습니다. 감사합니다. 원석이 저랑 뭐가 다르 이거 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 뭔지. 이거 그 머리 저희 이제 마감 시간에서 마무리 좀 아, 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 네, 네. 카메라 보고 박수 한번 주세요 아 좋게 치지 마요 한 명만 있잖아 우리 지우님 이제까지 한번 벌써 치지 됐어요? 지우님 뭐 할게요 하나 둘셋네 고생하셨습니다 고생하셨습니다 고생하셨죠? 형도 없네요 탈미트를 위해서 봐요네 안녕하세요 저 리플레이 시즌3 섭외차 연락드렸습니다 일어나는군요 그런게 <웃음>
Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Elsie K Spring 2024. We're here for the second series of the evening. I'm Atlas, joined by Orcs as we bring you T1 taking on DRX. And you may look at this match and think the DRX don't stand a chance, but they are still going to head onto the rift. Uh, we'll see whether they can uh, figure something out because, of course, massive stakes for this one. This could be third or second for T1. Yeah. All they need is a win here, and they should have it locked down. I thought you were going to bring up a reference to the 2022 World Finals and do the whole, we've seen this match. No. Uh, I almost did. I wanted to. Um, that's sort of I where my mind went, but then I thought that that might have been a little bit disingenuous um, just because that is a very different DRX. In fact, that DRX is now called KT. Um, T1, as you can see, in uh, third place right now because Humble Life Esports did win the previous match. Uh, any sort of victory here for T1 will put them uh, right back up there into second and they will yep. lock that one away. They'll get a bye for the first round of the playoffs. And as you said, score just doesn't matter. They can even have a happy game if they really choose. Oh, yeah. But only one. Well, yep. they can have more happy games, but they have to win them at the end. Yes. They only have one happy game that they lose. Yeah. The yeah. Um, it has to end as a sad game um, instead of just the happy game the entire way through. Um, so the last match for both of these squads and DRX just, they did have a recent resurgence. Unfortunately, it was brought to a bit of an abrupt halt. Uh, they did manage to take a game from KT, but then getting unceremoniously smashed by Gen G, who have looked just completely unbeatable at this end of the season. Uh, we'll see whether this can be a time for them to figure it out as Yahoo versus Faker. Uh, Faker could hit uh, first place alongside Chovy in the POGs, but he's going to need back-to-back. -back. Yep, so he needs to put on a good performance two games in a row. Obviously, there's a potential, but uh, I mean, there's two factors to it. One, will DRX focus him and deny it? And two, will some of his teammates deny it from him, you or know? Or will we deny it from him? Oh, I can't because I don't have a vote. Or will um, media No, media will vote for him. No, media will vote for him every single time. Yeah. I, I think we could actually see the guns to their heads. Yeah, you know, like, they, they probably already pitched it. Yeah, know? they probably already put in the votes. Pre-submitted it. Yeah, pre-submitted it. Paper, yeah. Yeah, yeah, who's going to be possibly getting some uh, <laughs> some amazing POGs in this series if, in <laughs> fact, things have been pre-submitted and DRX managed to win. Owner going to play his 300th game in game number one of this series. Very cool stuff on his fourth year. It's a lot of games uh, to have played here professionally in the LCK. Yeah, I've been playing obviously for quite some time. Still feels relatively recent, but it really isn't, and that's just how time works. Um, yeah, I think Ultimate T1 still, this isn't really the series to do it, but in general something to prove, especially since Honda yeah. Life are looking so hot and most recently dispatched them. There has been some talk about their draft priority a little bit. This was also a concern kind of leading into last year's Worlds, and they actively said that they had gone back to the drawing board, try to sort of rehash what they thought was the their priorities on the patch, and they sort of started cooking, and it came out well. You know, carrying yeah. brought back picks uh, like the AD carry support to work fantastically. I kind of feel like they've fallen into a rut again, so potentially the chance to try out some picks and see if they can get a better read of meta before they go in the playoffs, because what they drafted in their series against Hon Life just wasn't it. It certainly wasn't. Uh, we'll see whether it's going to be it versus this team right here. DRX making their way out into Lowell Park. Of course, all the shackles are off. Nothing really to play for here outside of making a good run towards summer. That's what that fan sign, I believe, was saying earlier on when we uh, did see the, uh, the fan sign pop up for DRX. Uh, just saying, like, let's put our best foot forward. Let's see whether, you know, we can make summer look interesting for yeah. this team. And I feel like with the switch up of the mid lane, you know, we have started to see a bit more life. It's far too late uh, in the season, obviously, to change anything in terms of standings. Uh, and also, unfortunately, haven't been able to translate that into too many wins. But I definitely feel like we've seen better performances. I think the bot lane was always something we praised for a while. It was looking good when, particularly platter, <laughs> when the rest of the team struggled. But um, this is actually so incredibly cute doing uh, their little signature poses. And <laughs> they've got the little hologram. I like it a lot, as T1 are going to make their way out for their final series of the season. And by final series of the season, I mean the final series of the regular season before they head towards playoffs. The team that is here at Lowell Park uh, that is actually going to be heading over there, of course, DRX, we will have to say goodbye to after this. And thankfully, we will get that full team interview as well, so we can hear from them and their resolutions heading towards summer. 
as DRX remember when they won Worlds. They also didn't make the playoffs, I believe, in the spring. Oh, setting it set up, you know? Yeah, just, uh, just, just to put that in the back of everyone's but minds. But also, when they didn't win Worlds last year, uh, I'm pretty sure they didn't make playoffs in spring either. That's true, so it's a 50-50. <laughs> <laughs> they either win Worlds or they don't. Good odds, yeah. uh, honestly, from this position. And uh, Teddy, as you can see, pretty good stats. Oh. Uh, he's always been um, pretty good when it comes to that. Wow, this seems like an exceptionally high amount of damage. Damage uh, and damage for gold. Let's take a look at the champions. Oh! oh. Smolder's outlined in gold. Interesting. Uh -huh. What does it mean? It might mean that it does an absurd amount of damage. Really? You know, you, you might be onto something. And unfortunately for DRX is Nongshim had the opportunity to play Smolder against T1. And I'm not sure they'll let any team do that to no, them. No, not again. Not um, again. That, that must have been extraordinarily traumatic. Uh, as if you remember back to that uh, T1 series. T1 were able to win it. Um, but it took this gentleman right here landing an arrow straight through that dragon. Much like Bud did in the Hobbit. Yeah, like fight. And all of the T1 uh, challenge players are here as well. Uh, very, very cool stuff. Making sure that they're hanging out. Smash on the left looking a little bit like he is concerned about what's going on here. Taking some notes, perhaps. A lot of support coming in for this yep. pivotal match for T1 up against DRX. Indeed. Um, but yeah, last Indeed. game of the season, we have seen a lot of fan support. Obviously, with the time we had off where fans weren't able to be present. Making out. up for lost time. Yeah, yeah absolutely. That's what you have to do. Uh, Zayas furiously practicing, as we can see here. You know, I don't know if you've seen this stat. But you know, Zayas is highest for isolated deaths. Do you know how many he has? Like, average isolated deaths, he's, he's like, got the most. Yeah, no, I do know. And but you can tell it's us. 40. Yeah, it's kind of ridiculous. And remember, like, we saw in our previous series things that Doran has been doing. Yeah. And, 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 and it's larger than that. It kind of feels like so many games are, like, is it, you know, that the whole top lane is an island? Yep. I feel like they've really lent into that. And they just yeah. kind of leave Zayas to do his own thing. And they just know that he will come into team fights as a Natrox and he will be fine. Yeah. That has been like a good 70% of T1 games. It's just him on Aatrox coming in at maybe, a deficit and winning. Maybe that's exactly what Hanwha decided to go with. They're like, Doran, if you could just emulate Zayas, that would be great. And Doran was like, got it. Doran was doing but that he before knew. Zayas, you know. Oh, that's actually true. Maybe just, they've just been sharing notes. Yeah, but the thing is, I feel like for Zayas, you know, he will get ganked by the enemy jungler and mid laner and die. Doran's like, I can do it one better. I'll just die one v one. <laughs> <laughs> as uh, Carrier is having a good time, as we can see there. I think uh, having a few conversations, of course, has played with a few of the players on the side of DRX and for the organization itself. So a little bit of, uh, of a fun time here. So, of course, Teddy playing for T1 as well. So these players know each other and just see what we're going to get from this series, whether DRX are going to be able to find the upset. Because I feel like judging by the way these players are looking right now, they're not looking like they're under too much stress, not looking like they're too worried about the series. And I think they're going to come in and show us something maybe a little bit more interesting. But this is where we're going to find out as we hop into the draft for the first game of the series. Reminder that the Azir is globally banned, thankfully, in the middle of the screen right there is, uh, yeah, is ban. some carrier focus, understandable. That's not Smolder. Interesting, interesting. <laughs> well. Second ban for T1. I'm just, it's got to be in the first three. There's no way they leave Another it Another carrier ban. Okay, that, that is once again not, okay, third ban Smolder, we're looking like. Maybe the Cluster ban for, they actually go for the Orianna, so Cluster left open. Yep, carrier's Orianna. Does make picking Smolder dangerous into it. But um, hmm. I think maybe, okay, the Callista is going to be banned. Is it just the first pick? It's, it's not. It's going to be a tree. So Sponge going to be the Maokai in this game. Lucian and the Rel. So Lucian, Rel, Nami probably going to be the first three here for T1. I think you just do it. You just Karma Smolder, right? Something yeah, like that? I think Karma with Maokai is not that hot. Oh, that's true. But you might just do it anyway, you know? But I definitely think you pick up a Smolder. Yeah. You know also you're, you're going to go into Lucian Nami almost definitely. So you could take like, we've seen Smolder Lulu um, spin off to trade in that. They end up going for the Trist. All right. Actually go for it. That makes me a little bit sad. Unless. Unless they still haven't locked this in yet. 
some options. Coming. Oh, hover the top laners, then lock Smolder, so they think it's Smolder. Oh, top. do it. Genius. Genius. Yeah, hover Renekton and then lock Smolder because it's like Crocodile and then Dragon. It's like Lots similar sort of vibes. Yeah, yeah scaly, scaly reptilian thing. What? I think they're cousins. Uh, third cousins, seventh times removed. I think they're, you know, they're a different species, and like you and I aren't cousins, and we're the same species, you know? So. I think no. <laughs> okay, I'm then. gonna go with no. Thanks for the analysis on that one. <laughs> no, I was a little, a little bit unsure. Didn't know how. Yeah, no, no, no. I, I've, I've got you. Don't worry. Didn't know how uh, crocodiles and, and dragons, the family tree between them. <laughs> uh, well, Nami, as we expected, is going to be locked away, and there is a Lulu ban as well. Yeah, I think this is actually a pretty smart ban because yeah. whether you go Aphelios or Zeri or Smold or whatever, Lulu pretty good at trading into the Lucian Nami as we've seen time and time before, so we wanted to limit that. And yeah, we talked about maybe we see something interesting come out from T1, maybe we see an adaptation, maybe we see something different. Lucian and Nami was what they picked up against Conor Life Esports, uh, and it didn't go too hot then. No, I mean, I'm not a huge fan of Lucian and Nami just in general, but uh, Gumi Carrier have been pretty good at it, and uh, I've always really liked uh, Carrier's Nami just in general. Um, so, I mean, that does win it a few points back. I still hate it. Um, just want to make that abundantly clear. Just not a huge fan of Lucian Army at the moment, even after what uh, uh, Viper was able to do, even though he was focused in every single team fight in the previous like, series. I was going to say, it looks like a good Ari angle. A lot of mid laners banned who you'd normally pick into it, but they end up going for the Twisted Fate uh, for Zayas, and they're saving their mid pick till five. Ooh. I guess no pressure, it's going to get stolen away. Uh, I'm not so sure about this one. I'm not a huge fan. Uh, if there's a bottom lane that I like less than Lucian Nami, it is Zyra Khan at this point in time. Okay. Um, well, T1 get to pick now, so let's just <laughs> focus on that. Yeah. Um, it's and it's going to be a wave. wave. I mean, last time Faker played, played... Okay. You know, we would talk a little bit about... Uh-huh. Is Faker going to get the POGs? You know, what would have to happen? Are the team going to set him up? He His last way performance, he got the POG, and he honestly just kind of steamrolled the entire game. So there we go. He's off to Chovy. See whether he can actually equalize those points. Yep, and you know, you may think, oh, it's Lucian Nami for the Nami to buff the Lucian. No. Carrier will buff Faker, and then Owner and Zayas, their job is to hold people still. Yes. So he can hit them. That's how it's going to work, all in unison. Um. DRX, I think that top side is fine. Uh, I do think the Trist might have a bit of a sad time another way just because the range difference. I hate the bot lane pickup here. Uh, yeah, me cannot. Uh, you've actually picked something that is just going to suffer against Solution Nami. And, and suffer even playing... more against Huey. Yeah, Zaya into Huey sounds horrific. Also in team fights, how are you going to engage as Rakan when there's a TF on the other team? You're just going to get stun locked. Yeah, I don't think you do. And there's plenty of things to uh, stop Teddy from being able to just feather storm happily. Uh, and there weren't even ever really things that were feather stormable anyway. Normally yeah. it's like the Nautilus, the Vi, things like that. You want to pop these ultimates so that you're not actually going to be held down. And this feels like a default to Zyra Khan because we're frightened type move. And that is always the worry. Uh, for that particular bottom lane. We'll see whether Teddy and Pleda can prove us wrong as we dive towards Summoner's Rift for game number one. Oh man. T1 fans, extraordinarily loud. Uh, we are on the T1 side of uh, LOL Park right now, and we have headsets on, and I was still uh, in a bit of trouble. Speaking of trouble, uh, Sponge down to 300 health as Faker's painting some auto attacks his way. Uh, got the mana flow band stack, I believe, so. Oh, that's nailing it. Yet. Oh. Rascal has some friends, but owner, I believe, doubled back for a I'm moment a there. I'm a strong believer in just no matter what role you are, just walk towards mid level one and just fish for mana flow band stack. You know, get a stacking yep. in. Yep, 100% agree. Take the extra mana. Um, Stacks are dopamine. That's, uh, that's what we figured that out. That is something we very heavily established this season mm -hmm. of the LPL. If you've, you know, been watching or maybe you've missed some days and you're like, what's the takeaway for this regular season? Is it stacks, we established it in the great. LCK as well? Because we, you just mentioned that we established it in the LPL. Why but did you say that? I don't know. LCK. But it established. was established in the LPL also. Okay, established in every... Globally. League of Legends globally. Globally established. Stacking. stacking I actually... Good. I had the pleasure of watching some LCS uh, earlier on today. 
and got to hear from our boy Umpty. Oh yeah? It was absolutely fantastic. Makes you realize that, you know how we have like the coaches interviews and they're always pretty stale and they're not really saying too much? Umpty proves that LCK players can like trash talk. Yeah. And we've known this before. We have seen that there has been some really good trash talk videos. Fortunately, uh, just not not happening more recently. Which is yeah. You know, I was watching back um, the other day. You know the oh yeah, no, I was watching with you. Yeah. The when was it? it was the Samsung White SKT one? Yeah. Back of the day, the trash that one was peak. It was actually just ridiculous. Oh, so good. Imp did not care. No. Uh, he he would just say whatever he felt like in those interviews. <laughs> <laughs> Such a banger. Yeah. Yeah, definitely would love to see the return of those, but not sure. Ooh, Blake Cooler actually going to get a little bit of a snare onto Gamushi, and then Pleta immediately regrets his decision to go in. This is part of the problem. You know, it's definitely level three is where Zyra Khan gets a bit more strength, but... Uh, mm. Wow. Yeah. There's a lot of feathers on the ground. So uh, they're not going to move forward. Also missed a bunch of that CS. A little bit of a shame. I, I just think the problem is with this lane is you don't really have that much kill pressure on the Lucian unless Guma horrifically misplays. And they're just going to out-sustain your trades and just keep poking you, you know? And it's a pretty chill lane for, for Lucian and Nami. And then once they get to that one item point in mid lane where they can just hang around and poke you out, it's good vibes. Yeah. We'll just see where the DRX, the rest of the map, they can actually get something going on because, of course, Tristana and Maokai together has been pretty powerful, not necessarily super early, um, but can certainly get things done. And in team fights, I guess eventually things can be all right, but I am very worried. Corks, yeah. I do share your sentiment. I'm very, because the thing is, this mid lane matchup is probably the best for DRX. Um, and so far, you know, I mean, yeah, who's just a bit chunked out, nothing more, but like top lane is getting blasted right now. We haven't even looked over, but look at Rascal's We don't want far. to. Yeah, I'd, uh, I'd prefer it if we just, Jonas Strong, please just don't don't head up top lane. Yeah, it's not going too hot yes. right now for DRX. It's a, it's just like 500 goal lead already, just, just mostly from like CS gaps and top lane. Yeah, make it 700. Kind of ridiculous. Yeah, who does have this entire wave to pick up, and so that is going to be equalized somewhat. Beautifully collects all of the minions, as we can see here. As uh, cannon. Oh, <gasps> okay. No. Uh, I think I think that's it. No. I think it's done. I think you cannot recover from that. All right, game two. Uh, let's load it up. Oh man, it's a bit unfortunate. That's that's pushed the gold lead to 800. You know, oh. nearly that play is now. Uh, Gumushi's going to cleanse here. Is a bit of a bit of a battle is going on. The Aqua Prison does not really connect, but still, T1 having a pretty good trade. That ebb and flow value triple is what yep. you want to see. I like how Guma ends up low, and Kerry is like, okay, it's fine, I'll take over, I'll trade 1v2. Yep. This Ty calls blessings himself as Teddy found a little bit of trouble. There is the uh, the Maw out from the Faker. Does lock down Yehu just a little bit, but does take an explosive charge for Being, his trouble. Yehu just TP'd back. Okay, he cancel. I thought he was recalling again. I'm like, you just TP'd in. Yeah. A little bit of a worry. That was a really nice smite there from Sponge. Able to actually take away this bub from a rel. Pretty important. Uh, Owner will be able to get one for himself, yeah, so okay. it's not the end of the world. But he is tanking this, and Faker is going to have to come on over here. Does have the ulti. Not going to find it as Sponge has to flash to get himself out of the way. And in fact, Faker didn't actually use the ultimate at all. Just a whole lot of other buttons were pressed. Yep. Uh, so Sponge flashing away from that one. It was actually pretty heavily winning the 1v1 against Owner in that situation. But uh, mid lane prior makes a difference. Yeah. And top lane prior is going to be there as well. As we can see here, they're having a little bit of a look in. Uh, as Rascal is slicing and dicing. Gets on in there. As now Zayas going to have to run. Does have to use the Ghost in order to get himself out of there. Dominus from Rascal helping him here in this lane for now. Does still have the flash available. So does Zayas. Yeah, definitely take an opportunity with that level 6. It's a big power point for the Renekton, whereas the Twisted Fate doesn't get any combat power when he hits that level. So a good punish on Azaeus, and he's kind of realized he can't actually even walk up to the tower right now on this health. He will just get dove, so we'll reset. Does have the Destiny if he wants to use it get get back to lane, but he doesn't actually miss much beyond those minions under the tower already. Whoa, that's a lot of losses for Wei so far in the mid lane, but 
can see those names, not exactly uh, players that have been winning a whole lot. Yeah, Bulldog really has not been helping other stats on that no, one. No, not really. Uh, and that was during the, the real downtimes uh, of uh, Condom Freaks, before they decided that more dragons is the way that we win, and that's, uh, that's how it sort of worked. Sponge coming on over to help DRX out as Ona thinking about finding an opportunity and there is a fantastic Magnus Storm into a double bubble from Carrier. Kumiyushi now dashing in, Teddy explodes as Faker's ultimate goes off. And that is first blood for the Lucian and Faker able to pick one up on the back end of that one as well. And DRX just a little bit baffling, just didn't quite yeah. work out. I mean, it's really nice engage from Ona, but DRX are kind of just like waiting for it to happen. Uh, time and time again, you know, you clump up against the Rowl, you're gonna get punished for it very swiftly. And they absolutely just decided that they weren't gonna abide by social distance in that one. No, absolutely not. Uh, Faker as well, 20 CS uh, lead off the back end of that one at the same time. I think a POG performance uh, from the gentleman in the mid lane. What do you reckon? Uh, I, I, you know, people have been pre-voting already, so I think it's... Yeah, I think it's, pre it's pretty safe to say. You might say that Owner's Engage was absolutely fantastic or something like that, but no, no, no. I think it is, uh, it's, it's still well deserved. As Faker is going to back away from this one, full culling into Pleta. Does have that Gleaming Quill to go off and uh, have a little bit of extra health back. But this is, this is really feeling like it's traveling downhill for DRX in a pretty big way, and it is only accelerating on that path. Owner is going to come on over and guarantee some plates here for Gumiyushi as well as Carrier just clearing out vision where he can. And I, I just I just don't know where it gets better for DRX. Where is the where's the way back in? Where is the where is the copium? Game two. Um <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think the copium is that if T1 heavily overcommit and botch and engage into Zaya Maokai, there's the potential for them to turn it around. Well, well, maybe it's maybe it's a rough start. How about this? If they lose this game, it does not affect DRX's chances for playoffs. Yeah, that's fair. <laughs> On the back of that, you know, can they even lose? True. Yes, they can. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, Gumiushi now has his static shift completed. Well, that is, a, yeah, that's pretty, pretty nice timing to have it. Yep, not too bad. Nine minutes into the game, three and a half on the next dragon. As Ona's coming up towards his top side now, this guy's sort of everywhere this game as Rascal does throw down the Dominus, but he's still losing so much of his health bar. Crashdown comes on in alongside the Magnet Storm as Rascal does have the ability to slice his way out and doesn't even have to flash. But still, gonna have to vacate this area, doesn't have teleport, and so therefore the amount of pressure on this turret is going to be very, very high. Yeah, he's trying to get a heal off on those minions. Just trying to hold himself up in lane for a little bit longer. You can see Sponges on the top side are trying to defend against any potential dives, but definitely Rascal in a bit of a rough spot. But he didn't die. Didn't even yeah. in the flash, so you know, I think he'll live for another day. Yeah. Slicing on forward does find these minions as eventually the wave is going to be thinned. Uh, Sponge moves in. That is going to be a couple of the bubs going to be taken out here as uh, I think Pleto was just having a look at what was going on there with the grand yep. entrance. You know, that was the closest I felt to... Oh, maybe... No, they don't have something. Back to just farming in the bot lane. Yep. As at least Yahoo's able to shove a minion wave uh, towards Faker's turret. Still going to be able to catch the majority of those ones, though. This Gumiushi is going to push away this Rakan, the Extendo Battle Dance. I think it's utilized. even more difficult because Guma has cleanse. So even in a scenario where Platter does get on top of them with an ult, you can just cleanse, dash, out. And, and the, the other thing is, like, DRX, you can see how respectfully Teddy's playing. It's because they have just no vision at all, really, on uh, where anyone is. Didn't have a lot of information. And so Carrier coming down just to make sure that that is definitely a fact. Moving on in here as Bubble is going to connect. Featherstorm is going to be used in response as Carrier was tanking up that turret and uh, isn't really too phased by it at all. It says a lot that you get rooted in a tower and nothing comes from it. Um, yeah. Yeah, this is starting to feel very painful. They've backed off, so they're not going to end up dying to this play, but uh, they are going to lose even more plates. It's feeling a little bit rough here for DRX at this point in time. 3,000 gold and change is going to be the lead here. Is now Sponge looking for Faker. He's just going to wander northward, but yeah, who is going to be able to find that angle. There is a twisted advance in, and the explosive charge is going to be enough. Yeah, who locks that one down. So there's the first kill for DRX. 
as Rascal closing the distance onto Zayas as well, who finds himself a gold cup but still will be culled. Don't know whether he's necessarily the meek though, as Destiny going to be utilized here. Over the wall goes Sponge, no gates to be opened for Zayas. And actually some decent plating damage done there by yeah, who obviously with the Tristan, if you get some alone time on the tower, you're going to make some good progress, but uh... Yeah, a nice play to come out and return. DRX still trying to find an angle in, but uh, doesn't really mitigate the four plates down in the bot lane. Yeah. Uh, also, we already have, because Carrier got some of the plate gold, he already has Imperial Mandate completed. Look at the mid lane play. Yeah, just. I think if it. The problem is if it's flashed, you can't really flash, like, up towards the uh, Euron jungle. You kind of would have had to flash towards tower, and the roots still would have hit you, so. I think yeah. maybe was just dead by that point, especially since he was already so low. Good gank from DRX on that one. Yep. Just and not trying. only, not only do we have the Imperial Mandate, it's also the support quest completed, which feels very early. Yeah. So he's got Slay Mandate. Doesn't have any shoes, but I guess you don't need shoes when you just have a fin. Yeah. You know, kind of. If Cassiopeia doesn't need a bite, I you, know, right? Why does Nami? Yeah. We need some consistency there. And you might ask the question like, well, why does, why doesn't, what about Aurelian Soul, you know? And stuff what like about Porky? But he has little feet. You know? Yeah, I guess Porky has little feet in his yeah, plane. Yeah, exactly. There are you feet know, you're not in the plane. To, you're not supposed to drive uh, barefoot. Yeah. Yeah. Although maybe, maybe he's wearing Crocs when he drives, but even then, that you'd still have to buy the Crocs. Yeah. So I don't think that gets you out of it. So anyway, um, maybe we'll just we'll see whether we can get to a point where Nami can get some movement speed scaling oh, like Cassiopeia does. I think it it would just make thematic sense. Yeah, it, it would fit. How can you give Cassiopeia passive? Ooh. It should be like a champion type passive, you know? Every, yeah, right. Every fin champion or tail. I mean, not every tail champion, every snake champion. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, of which there is champion. one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, which isn't Rascal. He uh, still needs shoes, as you can see walking towards the lane. Gumushi does have his Rapid Fire Cannon now complete, and that is, wait, kind of ridiculous. Look at that lead! Wait, he has rap. I just, I didn't see, I'm, I'm not yeah. the whole thing. Plates are about to fall down and he has fire? two items. Yeah. Okay, uh, yeah, that is two Zayas, items. Look at Zayas's items and look at Gumushi's items. He's That's just a better um, TF. <laughs> yeah, he is. I mean, it's the Twisted Flution and Twisted Fates in the game. He's actually just stealing his shopping list. Wow, 500 gold from the plates in the bot lane. Um, so not only a ton of plates, but... And he was by gold. himself for so many of them. Yeah, too. four of them by himself. So I don't know what you're supposed to do as Teddy and Plutter. Um Well, on. maybe just not picking uh, Zyra. Yeah, it comes back to the draft. I just don't know what you're supposed to do now with the situation. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and that is what we really should focus on. Yeah. Well, Zayas is now parking himself towards the bottom side of the map. He's going to uh, start clearing out this Grom. And Gumiushi jumps underneath the turret. Teddy is at least going to be able to avoid a lot of that damage. Guys, you shouldn't be opting into a fight, DRX. Um, well, uh, they do get a lot of vision down. There's a teleport in from the Renekton as well, as Faker not able to get any sort of snare onto him. And Rift Herald is just going to be given up. Going to say they're going to respect the teleport because, of course, Zayas he can't follow. It was a little bit too far away for a uh, I guess it's a level two destiny gate. Still, he's all the way in the bottom lane, and so Rift Herald is just going to be sacrificed. And understandably so, we haven't really seen Rift Heralds do all that much. Yeah, there was uh, one in the last series, uh, powered by I believe aiming, where it just didn't seem to be that valuable of an objective. Um, was that his without? Surely that's like the worst one that he's had this season, though, right? Uh, no, it's not even. Oh, would oh. you believe? Not even the worst one he has had this season. <laughs> interestingly enough, <laughs> the other um, one was not very good. <laughs> oh dear. Uh, going back to that one. Of course, we have uh, had that conversation previously, so maybe we should <laughs> should be a little bit nicer to him. Boy, uh, he's allowed to build static shivs now. Yeah, it's okay. Uh, I, I'd forgotten about that, the illegal static shiv. Yeah, as Yehu is going to carry this ultimate underneath the turret. Good flash to get out of the Magnus Storm. Very nicely done there by the Tristana player. Would have definitely died otherwise. And so now... Are they looking for something? I mean, Yehu's really low, but... You know, Sponge and Platter are here to defend. But all they'll do is just keep him alive. They're still having to really play defensive. Yeah. yeah. 
more minions gonna die to that turret as well towards the top side as teleport back immediately from Faker trying to keep on this pressure as much as he possibly can. Seraph's embrace has been completed as well. As Gumushi has a two level lead, by the way. Um, just uh, just another another fact to yeah. throw out. I mean, I think I think we get it right. Yeah, he's very very strong, and now he's gonna demonstrate that by throwing this culling into Sponge. Not exactly the primary target. As Faker landing a lot of damage here, the interruption not going to be available on Yehu does safely rocket jump his way out. It's a lot of testing the waters here for T1, trying to find an angle, trying to get in there, and all the while just getting more things around the map. Yeah, I will say, kind of a good advertisement for Frozen Heart with how fed this Lucian is and the fact that Sponge was, even with near Frozen Heart, he was kind of taking a lot less damage than I initially expected on the back of that culling, so... Yep. Direx don't get anything positive from that, but they don't die at least. That's the take. There we go. There we go. It's uh, the positive is that it's not that negative. <laughs> Gorgeous. Yeah, that's what we're, we're looking for. And you can see the gold graph is just steadily built up over time. Uh, and now dragging up in 20 seconds is a mountain soul as well. And they already have like a 4,500 gold lead. It's only great drakes uh, so far this game as well. Really impactful. Thank you for appreciating me. Yeah, no, you've, you've done... It, it's been probably your best day. And uh, this is your last casting day of the season, right? Uh, so we're going to need to get a, uh, a Chemtech Soul in Game 2, right? Just, to, just as, old a, time as a sake. goodbye. Yeah, you know, for, yeah. All, for old time's sake. Just to remind everyone that you have been so incredibly good uh, for at least today. Just show them what I could have been, yeah. you know? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> could have been a full day of Chemtech Drakes. Uh, like, I believe we actually had... Um, only a few weeks ago, as Yahoo should be able to get the first turret for DRX. That is certainly good news. Yeah, uh, obviously just on a great take down those towers, and T1 had kind of moved that pressure down towards the Dragon. Fake had been clearing ways on the top side, he moves mid, Guma moves towards Dragon, they get that. That's the sole point, uh, just for nothing there, as Grand Entrance comes in, good battle dance from Fleta. Get himself out of the way of the tidal wave, but still, Gumushi takes half of Teddy's health bar by just pressing his R button. And, and so that's just free soul uh, point. Yeah, no real contest. And now they're trying to put the Herald down mid. They succeed. But it's difficult to really follow up and... Oh dear. Oh dear. Okay, well, Teddy is just going to charge the turret. Let's see how he's going to do it. There's a Feather Storm. That gets him up there as Ona was kind of baited into this one. He will go down as the first kill, but Sponge is traded off as well. Destiny's gonna come forward and Rascal, yeah, he is just dead. It's a double kill for the Twisted Fate. Azaeus not finished just yet. He could see some low health bars and he just caught up to Gumiyushi's build six minutes later. He finished his uh, his rapid fire cannon, what? wanted to put it to use. Unless I got it. This is why they picked Zaya, because that's the only AD carry who you could send into that situation and not immediately have them get one shot. Was it? I, I believe it may have been in error that he uh, possessed Shelly in that uh, moment. What do you think? I don't know. It looked like he was kind of like, you know, let's let's uh, let's look at it. Maybe maybe it was accidental. I don't know. Well, I feel like I would have just sent the Rakan, Honestly, probably would have died anyway. But uh, at least it isn't your Zaya, um, who obviously the ult does give you a bit of time and was in the end able to. They got a kill. Right away. But it is still a uh, two for one uh, in favor of T1. Doesn't yeah. really change the fact that things are looking a little bit dire for DRX. Yeah, it's back up to it's a, over a 5,000 gold lead, and it's three minutes until Sol. And there's, it's only been six kills in this game. You know, there's, there's not really been a whole lot that has happened. This really does show that having this amount of lane dominance and control of the map uh, really can just shut a team out of a game as Ona pressed up extraordinarily far forward. You could see that Rascal wanted to see whether there was some sort of angle of approach. Does have Dominus coming off cooldown he right is now. behind them, but pings are coming out. Yeah, gets towards the mid wave. Oh, this wave. is cheeky. Letters moving in. They do spot the fact that the Tristana is down here. Is now Faker. Not going to find too much. Ulti is going to be thrown over as Yahoo just dives on in. There's the flash forward. Quickness comes down and Faker is just going to be eliminated. That's a kill for Yehu, so something on the other side of the rift here is T1. Um, speaking of the other side of the rift, they're going to see two people in the bottom lane and say it's Baron in time. Yeah, and you know, essentially with the Twisted Fate there, they have 280 carries, so 
It is going down fairly quickly. Extremely quickly. For 21 and a half minutes, kind of ludicrous. But now, Sponge is making his way forward. Tidal Wave is going to get a lot of value as the Feather Storm comes out. And now the Magnus Storm is going to catch Teddy, and he is just obliterated. Gumiyushi, so much damage as he's dashing after the Renekton as well. They kept the Baron leashed, and they're going to look for that one now as T1. The foot is never coming off the gas this game. Yep, and the thing is, I actually like the play DRX for went on the bot side. Oh, you got to try and get something, but oh my god, okay. Uh, there's um, yeah. all three of those skills going but over to Belushi. You got to try and get something, but the problem is, typically when you go for a play like that, you know, you have the solo laner, the Tristana having TP, and then when you make this play, they can TP up to the Baron, and it's a 4v4. Yeah. And you're still able to actually contest it. The problem is, you know, this play goes you know, pretty well for them. Uh, the jump from Yehu was a little bit off, but regardless, they get the kill. But now that's two members on the bot side. Neither of them have teleport available. It's a 3v4 on the top side, and you're already at a deficit. And we'll see here, Carrier very defensive with this flash. But the ult from Carrier forces the Featherstorm, and then Rail just has free reign. Yeah, it's just so comfortable for Ona to get in there, lock them all down, and Gumiyushi is going to be able to follow up with all of that damage that he has. Quick Blades completed already as item number three at 22 minutes. Interesting, we often see like... Okay, ult going to connect onto Sponge here. The Unending Despair is named pretty well here for DRX right now, but Sponge is going to be able to keep himself alive, even able to walk back and get a bit of extra health from that redemption. But it's not going to save this inhibitor turret. T1 going to be able to break that one open. They've got five uh, Void Grubs as well, and so the little mites helping take down these structures. So they are going to be able to break open the base. Look for a bit of a reset angle. Uh, Carrier does go home. Yep, yeah, reset and soul. It's that simple. Yeah. 15 seconds until that one is now Faker is holding the fort. Yeah, and it'll be T-Rex's opportunity to try and sneak in, get some vision. I think you just have to go for an all or nothing fight on this point. You got such a deficit, I think it's very hard to expect them to win this. But Yeah. Um, oh, dear. Uh, oh. Teddy taking a lot of damage. Yeah, running low. It wasn't even on the screen. It's so unfair. Now, reacted. Oh my God, Rascal taking so much damage. Does get a decent amount of uh, health back with the Call of Meek, but he is still really dead. And Carrier now chasing after Faker, who's running real quick. Nature grasping at T1, but Faker is just going to say no, thank you, Mr. Tree. And uh, Sponge is going to join his crocodile. Now a couple of 80 carries and a Rakan is all that's left of DRX to try and help this one. Shattering Strike onto Pleta, but really do too much there and T1 have lost uh, interest in the dragon they're just going to take this in a turret while they can yep and instead of opting just to peel away take the objective they can keep pressuring you know using these sideways really effectively often it's Zayas pushing the wave in the rest of them rotate over and DRX probably just hoping they can go to, to game two at this point yeah and the inhibitor turret gonna be taken down inhibitor will follow there as well Yes, just not really too many answers that DRX have. Not too many options that could possibly be had, right? Um, over the last, feels like 10 minutes, DRX just, there's no good choice you could make. They needed to make all of those decisions far earlier on uh, if they really wanted to stand any sort of a chance as Sponge going to at least be here to try and contest this soul. As Pleta doesn't land onto Gumiyushi, he doesn't even need to use the Flash. Just Relentless Pursuit necessary to get himself out of the way as Faker going to connect some damage onto Sponge. Good Twisted Advance to avoid the Light Slinger from Gumiyushi. And T1, they will regain control around this Dragon. Control Ward in the pit, though, for DRX. There is at least that. Azeus is just oh. splitting. So this could be sold and... No, it's not. So the soul is... Okay, never mind. Still up and available. I thought the Dragon's health bar was going down very yeah. low, but that was a control ward, so Okay, so Rascal's actually come back here, but I think he loses that 1v1 pretty hard. Yeah, it's a little bit of a worry here. As Faker is going to be pushed back into DRX, he will be taken down first off as Pleta somehow survives, but Sponge not going to be so lucky. And yeah, that 1v1 like you were talking about, the Twist Fate's going to take that as Bubble going to be avoided, but that is Featherstorm now on cooldown for Teddy. He has to be very, very careful as Yahoo diving forward trying to find Gumiyushi who is just going to flash his way out. The Destiny going to be utilized as back in base. They're trying to defend against this twisted fate and yeah, he's going to be put into the bubble prison. Owner is going to take the soul. Pleta will die as these cards do find him and he will take down the Nexus. T1, an absolute flattening of DRX in game number one. Yeah, in a very roundabout way in which the game was finished, you know, with the back door, not even needing to pick up the soul. 
But in the end, it was just a crushing victory. I feel like if a team like DRX gets a good draft against G1, then you can find an angle to make it look competitive. Yep. I think they made some mistakes in the draft. I think the Zyra Recon was not it. And in that situation, you just get absolutely rolled. I think it's a little bit unfair that uh, Gumushi played so incredibly well. I don't know whether Faker is going to get it. Is he going to get it? I, <laughs> I think he's probably going to, like, I think everyone else can have an honorable mention for the POG, but I, I don't even see anyone necessarily going for him unless it's... He, he didn't have the best game. He also got no. caught in the last fight. I, mean, I think it was... Uh, it's owner and, and Guma, right? That are really Kerry fighting. Had some, and some Kerry hit some amazing bubbles. Deus, you know, finished the game. Like, I think there's there's at least little arguments you make for everyone, but Faker didn't have the most impactful game. No. So perhaps this, perhaps Chovy is watching this and grinning. Oh, oh no. Can we... We need to get it off the screen. Um, poor Teddy. Uh, the... Um, yeah, just never again. I just, just I don't play want to Mal see Maokai to carry next time. He did more damage. I don't know? want to see Zyra Khan ever again. I just don't. I'm not not even into sure. that. <laughs> no, not into anything. It's just not great. We are going to go to a short break. When we get back, the space is going to break that one down, and then we'll have game number two. あ、ちょっと、あ、なんてね、ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっと
and welcome to the space. We are back here after game number one of DRX up against T1. Not too much of a competitive game in this one. Um, DRX kind of getting smashed there in that game number one. T1 uh, having a lot of fun. Um, guys, what do you think about that first one? Let's talk about the draft. Um, <laughs> there may be one champion we're a little bit focused on. Her name is Zaya. She's 10 and 20, I believe 10 and 21 now in the LCK this season. And uh, they could have played Ziggs bottom. Would have been better. Smolder. Could have played Smolder. Could have played Ezreal Karma. Could have played a Jinx lane. Mm. Could have played a Felios. Could have played Draven. All of those are would be better. All of those. I think I'm missing a few, but you know, I mean, I think we're getting the point. At, at this point, I'm like, get Vladimir up in here. Like, get something that isn't. Seraphine? Uh, don't, yeah. <laughs> don't play Vladimir into Lucianami. You're going to get bullied. But basically, the Zaya, Rakan. Just pick Rakan if you want to pick. That, that's fine. The Rakan part of that is never the problem. But you're picking Zaya into already, like, any TF gold card is going to force out your ultimate. Because you're Zaya. And that's not even. Take into account the fact that Faker can still pick something. I hope there's no mid uh, poke champions available that have mm. long range. <laughs> we did ban the Quirky at least. <laughs> we did get that one. Um, Jace was also still available. And, and to be fair, like it doesn't matter. It's it's DRX versus T1. I, I don't think that the, the pick really is the difference maker. I don't think that there's any way that DRX, after the level of gameplay that we saw in that game, is ever going to make it work. But pick pick something that at least have some form of age, er, early agency and try to flip it because yeah, no. Yeah, uh, he didn't do very much damage either, and I don't really even think that's Teddy's fault. I mean, he had like an okay game. Uh, we are going to see his one Rift Herald moment a little bit later on. We'll talk about that in the second highlight. But starting off, we do have to talk about this fight very early on in the game, where Owner was able to get it set up uh, pretty early on for T1. Yeah, I mean, this is just a skirmish that I don't think you could take right now as DRX, especially when you're all grouping up in a brush against... Mana brush control. Just line up while he's level six. Yeah, and also Karia has a bubble available so they can turn into a combo. Way damage is layered. And the point of this banana brush uh, skirmish is, I guess, to get control of banana brush, but um, sometimes it might not be worth... <laughs> they failed to get control. They have a word in it, though. They didn't have control before. Um, and then they walked in, and they were like, well, I, they, they learned the importance of control of the banana brush. And already at that point, I forgot how much it was. They were already like 600 gold down, just after six minutes of leaning face. And then they walked three people face first into Realm of level six. If owner's five, I'm like, maybe, because because there's a little bit more possibility to outplay it, but if he has magnet so it's just not happening. Yeah, it was pretty rough. I mean, at the end of the day, it is T1, like one of our top teams against one of the teams that's really struggling this season. So we didn't really expect it to look too different. And we should take a look at this mid fight as well, where the Rift Herald was summoned. And oh, well, I, if you were I, talking about how this could have been actually a good idea. I think this is actually a intended strategy here for DRX, where they want to actually bait T1 into a fight where Teddy has his Feather Storm available, he has Flash available, and they can turn off of it. So they end up trying to use the Rift Herald here as its drop to set up this kind of, you could call it a fake, you could call it a bait, you call it a turn, whatever. But I think it's clearly intended here. And if you can engage on one target after the turn comes through using Teddy's Featherstorm, maybe this works out. But, you know, they do end up getting the, the follow up ultimate here from Sponge. They do end up bursting down Owner. The problem is that Sponge also ends up getting 100 to 0 here, and then the follow-up is not there. Rascal isn't close enough for the follow-up, so he doesn't do anything, and it just it was very disjointed. Yeah, a great bubble from Carrier there as well, and it's one of those plays where you're like, if it's crazy enough, will it work? And it's like, no, it's just crazy. And I love crazy plans, but it's like, when you start a fight with your big team fight ultimate on cooldown from the get-go, and you have to throw all your bursts into the rail just to salvage it, it doesn't end up working out. Yeah, kind of rough. I mean, they were already pretty far down in terms of the gold, but uh, you got to try to send it, and that they did. Let's see who the POG is for game number one, as we had a couple of our guys on our list, and it will be Owner who does pick it up. It was kind of Omer, Owner or Guma for this one, and Owner does get it. I mean, it's a fairly low kill game, despite the dominance, and he had a high KP. This play here, which was, again, a bit of a mistake from DRX, but was really what opened up the game for T1. They had laning advantages before this, but this is kind of it. Like, this is the play. Um, and then, obviously, this time he does help get the turn here after the attempted shenanigans from Teddy. 
I was a Guma voter. I think that he actually showcased kind of the dream scenario for Revolution. But yeah, it really felt like those two were the main ones. A Guma for his out damage output, but Owner had a ton of great engagements. His rail ever since Worlds has just been exceptional. We have obviously seen him struggle a little bit this season, but when he gets these type of games, I don't think uh, it's uh, it's happened. Ooh, I was getting a little worried there. Right? About faker votes, but uh, nobody went for the big time narrative vote. Uh, faker, unfortunately, didn't just didn't have a very good game. I mean, he laid down some damage, but he was not the PUG this time. Wasn't the main character. That's all right. It happens. He's still got potentially two more games to, to prove I that. I still can't believe. Have we double checked these votes? Is it just normal? Is it just reasonable votes? Yeah, I think reasonable. so. Yeah. Even oh. like the Guma Boom Boom damage votes that uh, I believe you went for as well, like that I feel like was pretty reasonable. He had a fantastic game on Lucian. Like the owner was kind of the one doing the obvious engage stuff. He was very flashy, but like Guma did some really nice damage and some good Boom Boom. But either way, guys, we are done here on the space for game number one. Let's go back to the casters for game number two. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for that breakdown. And I got completely I must have confused and confrazzled. <laughs> we thought that there was going to be some of the I must have mi mi miswrote my vote, you know. Ah, you know okay. I was going to vote for Faker because if you actually check. You went into the media group chat, didn't you? And they were like, no, we can't do it this time. <laughs> you did, we can't you, do it, Orcs. If you actually check, compare the amount of world titles that Faker has to the rest of his team, Uh huh. right? Him alone has the same of his rest of his team combines. I think that's why he deserves the POG. Look, you can see him. He's uh, re rebooting now. He's trying to contemplate the fact that he won't get POG for the split uh, yeah. as a result of all the bad voters there. Who are yeah, no, on, just uh, terrible voters, really. Yep. Uh, just didn't quite work out. Uh, and on Owner's 300th game, actually picking up POG. Really good stuff. Uh, so yeah. Sponge is pretty great. Yeah, that's actually fantastic. Uh, we'll see whether uh, Sponge can have a bit more of a spongiest moment in uh, in this game in comparison to the last one. Uh, not expecting DRX to switch sides of the Rift for this one, as of course they did have side selection coming into this, and they are, as we can see here, going to select blue side once again. So maybe a little bit of an adjustment when it comes to the bands or something like that, or maybe it's just an adjustment of uh, don't just, for goodness sake, pick Zyra Khan. You know, I'm, I'm honestly going to say it. I actually think there are very specific circumstances I could see, like, Zaya being good. If, like, the enemy team is all dive and they have, like, Nocturne and stuff, it can make sense. But that was a horrible yeah. place to pick it, and it, it, it was bad in the draft, and it's also just not been successful generally, so I, I don't know why. Um, I've said this many times. I think if you're trying to get an upset and you're against a team who are significantly higher in the standings, just pick Smolder and pray for the Mega Wing Con. It's what we saw... Nongshim doing it. Instead, they're going to go for the Lucian army themselves. Don't want to play against Gu Guma on Lucian. Well. Uh, <laughs> Darius! Darius AD carry? That'd be kind of crazy. Yeah, we, we we saw that in, what was it, like, quite a few seasons ago. Um, that was like Kramer on a Freak of Freaks picking it up. That's going to be Aphelios as the uh, chosen answer here. Um, Gumiyoshi did see it in our previous series, and he's like, wait, I can play Aphelios again? <laughs> Hell yeah! And he is going to lock that one away. As Ona, he steals the tree. Sponge is gonna steal the the horse pants. Yeah, the they literally they looked at T1's composition in game one and went, you know, that's pretty good. Yeah. Um, let's just do that. Well, that is precisely what they're gonna do. And now, if they pick uh, Zaya Rakan on four five, we're gonna be really confused. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm hoping with the Lucian army picked up that they won't pick Zaya Rakan on four five. But I. You know, you never really know with uh, DRX. I was going to say crazier things have happened, but they haven't. Um, that would be uh, completely absurd. That would be pretty bonkers. Yeah. Um, so the Lulu, uh, understandably, going to be picked up here. So we've got the junglers and bottom lanes. And so solo lanes going to take up these next remaining bands. What do they not want to see? I imagine a Twisted Fate band is probably going to come out from DRX. And then maybe a like, Twisted Fate Corky or something like that to be removed. Hmm. Um, I mean, I feel like we often see AD mids paired up with the Maokai, so potentially they can start to target some of those uh, if, if you're really concerned. Jack's being banned. You know, maybe the Aatrox is something that Zeus wants to go back to. He has he did say in a statement for the match that uh, he's been playing a ton of Aatrox, so he's exploring more options. But, you know, all faithful. Uh, yeah. Definitely could just bring it back. So I think we'll it's okay to be a bit committed. 
I think that's fine. Uh, you don't you don't need to always be exploring other options. Plus, you could be exploring them in scrims and perhaps not showing them in a match against DRX. Ah. Um, is also something. I'm not sure if if Zayas plays Aatrox in this game. I'm not sure anyone's going to glean a lot of information about. <laughs> Oh, Aatrox, Aatrox is a good pick for Zayas. Wow, who wouldn't have known? That's absolutely incredible. We're going to write that down in our diary, our yeah, little get notebook. That down, write that down. Yeah, try and, try and get that information so that it sticks as Talia going to be the final ban here on T1 side. And I, I still do think that you probably want to take away uh, something like a Tristan Fate, but instead the Tristana to avoid the tristana Maokai combination that straight up didn't work uh, well enough for DRX. And as we mentioned, yeah, the Tristan Fate. Yeah, which is interesting because it's not something we always see that much blind. Um, clearly, a lot of confidence from Zayas that he'll be able to handle whatever matchup. I think it's also important he knows what jungle he's gone into. Rel obviously has a lot of uh, setup for ganks and stuff, but I feel like if there was like a like a Sejuani plus Renekton, I, that's when you'd start to feel like, okay, maybe you could get ganked heavily and they could just play through top. Although, to be honest, the 1v1 is so bad, I don't think it even matters. Uh, yeah, Aatrox is going to come through Axie for DRX. You know, it's still a good matchup for the Twisted Fate, but a little bit better than Renekton. And it uh, looks like it might just be that Quarky in the mid lane. So I think I think DRX's composition is better. You know, I do think that uh, the mid and top lane matchups are going to be pretty good for T1. But, you know, it's a scaling mid jungle from T1. I think DRX have given themselves better tools. Whether that's enough for them to translate this into a win, is a different question. Yeah, for me, it actually does look like at least DRX has a time of the game where they can fight, right? They're going to hit a great mid-game spike that they can try to fight around, maybe get themselves the second Drake, third Drake, something like that, and uh, get themselves into the game. Of course, the ultra late game will belong to T1 almost exclusively. It's, uh, it's going to be very, very difficult. We know that Faker can hit these rockets very effectively. And maybe I have just been... Um, thinking too much about what T1 wants to do because I named the two champions that they picked as the bands that DRX should have gone for. Um, and if DRX then wins, then they're geniuses because yeah. they knew just better. And if they lose? Then I'm a moron. But that's fine. I mean, I think that that's just, uh, it's just one of those things. It, it sort of adds to the to the vibe. Yeah. That's what I'm sort of thinking. It also gives us a game number three, which is precisely what we want. We don't want uh, DRX just to roll over. And I think with this composition, they may not necessarily. Still, T1, a whole lot of power, um, especially around late game macro and things like that with Maokai and Twisted Fate. My goodness, the amount of vision control they're going to have is absurd. Let's jump onto the rift here for game number two. Okay, you could hear some lingering in the DRX chants there, trying to make their voices known to their team so they can have a better performance here in game number two. We'll see whether it is actually going to be enough to do so. Yeah, I think they certainly will have a better performance than in game one because it, the bar is very low. Yeah, um, it is definitely low. Yeah. <laughs> Well, that's that's the positive you can take away from this one, um, that it would struggle to be worse than game one. Um, but still, as we said, I think there's a lot of draft elements that are better here for DRX, a lot more agency in the mid game uh, and potential to at least try and make things happen. I, I think ultimately top lane, there's not a ton you can do as Aatrox against TF unless TF makes mistakes or you find a good angle. Uh, mid lane, I hope to see yeah, who, who has been a good addition to this roster. I hope to see him make his impact known on the map. If you're into a Corky, you definitely should. Bot lane's a big question mark for me, because we've seen lanes like Aphelios Lulu really bully out in the 2v2, and when it's Guma Carrier, it's uh, intimidating to go up against. So it's something we've talked about with DRX, is that bot lane has kind of been the strongest point, point over the course of the split. They really need to be in this one. Yeah, they absolutely do. Teddy and Pleta do have at least one win on Lulushin Nami, as Pleta is... Making me feel silly for saying so, because he's taking a lot of damage. Carrier playing so far forward here, throwing these Glitter Lancers out, getting picks involved. As Evan Flo going to try and even this one out just a little bit. Just a lot of fighting. Yeah, a lot no, of uh, clean uh, advantages being gleaned. We actually saw Lulu buff, so like hit Q. If both bolts hit, there's like more damage. Because it used to be the second bolt had like heavily reduced damage. It's still reduced, but not by as much. Like, uh, more shielding and damage on an E and things like that, so... Oh, 
Uh, actually, this has gone very well for DRX. T1 kind of overstepped with the trades, didn't focus down the minions, and as a result, it's it's DRX to get level two first. Oh, Sponge also wrapping around as well as Gumiyushi is stepping out into the lane. This could be an opportunity for the Rel to really try and create an advantage for the bottom lane. Flip the entire game on a level three dive? Yeah, and Teddy, see, trying to make this one happen. There is the crash down on top of Gumiyushi, who does eventually flash. That is going to keep him alive as now Owner is making his way in and Sponge is extraordinarily low. The Bramble Smash does push him away, but they're looking to turn it. Flash out from Owner is Teddy. Oh, he oh. doesn't find the double tap. And there's the flash out from Carrier. Everyone is so incredibly low as Pleta, he really wants to do it. But it's just not going to happen. Look at this sub 100 health for both of these bottom laners. And Owner can't do anything about it because he's Sponge also the hex flash. excruciatingly the hex low. Flash. Yep, the Hex Flash over as Sponge makes his way in. There it is! The crash down to interrupt it as well, but Teddy is also going to die. So it's a one for one, and uh, First Blood does go over to DRX. There is that. Um, but T1 get one back, and so it's not yeah, the end of the world. That was on the cusp of being so fantastic for DRX, but a couple of moments that went in favor of T1, and suddenly it's a one for one, uh, and it is the uh, Rel who gets the First Blood, unfortunately. Uh, Faker doesn't lose on Corky, by the way, guys. A lot of winning. Yeah. Uh, spectacular amounts of winning. Let's go back to this one once again, as I feel like, yeah, Sponge went down extraordinarily low at the beginning. I did really like how they played it early on. Yeah, you know, they get the sums from Guma, uh, get a lot of damage down into him. And then here, Owner just doesn't have the damage, and Guma and Carrier on there to support. But unfortunately, here, oh. just doesn't get the double tap on Owner. Not sure if he lost vision when he stepped in the brush. How did just... he die? Let's uh, I'm gonna keep my eye on Teddy here. Oh, he took aggro. Right. Yeah, he was the one who took aggro. So he started the trade on Guma, but didn't quite have the damage. The sponge finished him with a Q. And Teddy. The thing is, I think if they'd approached it with the mindset of Sponge getting aggro, maybe Teddy just cleans up both Guma and Carrier. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Um, obviously didn't plan out that way. Oh, more hex flash value. Here we go, Sponge. Start charging it up as Jonas Strong turns it off. And there we go. The crash down on top of him, straight into the bubble. And Teddy, he's going to be able to pick up the kill this time around. This is what I'm talking about. You know, a good return gank. You know, all the summoners are down. DRX actually making things happen. Crazy how the game plays out when you don't pick Xyrocon. <laughs> <laughs> that is, in fact, the takeaway. Um, <laughs> absolutely brilliant. And that's, that's like, I think it's also brilliant because now I feel like Lucian is a great pick because it's better than Zyrocon. <laughs> so there we wow. go. That's the selling point for Lucian. Some it's Lucian not Demption. worse than Zyrocon. Precisely. I do feel like, to be fair, today we've had some pretty solid Lucian games. Definitely a finesse pick, and you know it's a good advantage for DRX Taint here. Uh, the wave being so big, T1 don't expect to be aggressed on, but the CC layering solid. You know, good start. Whether yeah. they can transition this Lucian from this point into a win is, is is a big question, but this is definitely the direction you want the game to be going in. Yep, precisely. Good start. Uh, you can see towards the top side of the map, Zayas is making a lot of money. That's why you see T1 with still a uh, gold advantage. Sponge, though, going to be able to utilize the Rel in order to take a Void Bub. Full information over to T1, as you can see, with the ward in the pit, but not going to be able to do anything about it. And uh, You've got Ono moving towards the bottom side. He may actually just start off this uh, Hextech Drake. As we do have a Chemtech uh, for today's soul in uh, this particular game, as Faker not going to find that rocket there. As now Sponge continuing his rampage on the Rift. Going to get a Valkyrie out. And T1 actually going to back away from this, not wanting to do this Drake with Sponge in the area. He's just too scary. Yep, I mean, he has so much potential to steal it on the Rel. Also, just Corky being so weak at this point in the game. And for DRX, this is huge. Uh, giving Dragons over to a Corky team early, when you know later on the package is going to be there, uh, is really painful. So I'm glad he moved down to interrupt that. And T1 are respectful and don't overcommit for it. Yep. Not going to be uh, the Drake picked up for DRX or anything like that. Uh, Sponge could now possibly look at that as an opportunity, but you can see Owner still in the area. And there are full camps available towards the top side of the map for Sponge. So actually probably wanting to go over there, lock those down, but he's been spending so much time in this bottom lane. Hasn't been able to take it as Faker. Some damage onto Yahoo here, but he's happily soaking that one up. And Bubble gonna connect actually as Teddy dashes in. Tycho's blessing, a lot of extra damage as he is 
Turned into a critter, that Polymorph, but a little bit late. Damage had kind of been done still. You're going to yeah, lose they, out on the trade. They get the barrier from Guma, so I think d are fine with that. They'll be able to sustain back up with uh, Platter's healing. But that health is still low now, and they are doing the Dragon. Sponge should just be able to secure this. Yep. Well, Catering Strike comes in. That's going to lock that one down. So Ona in position. Doesn't actually do too much about it as Yahoo. Really good trade onto Faker here, landing the charm. As we check in on the top lane, Rascal having a rough one. As we know, we'll be able to pick up this wave and should equalize somewhat, as far as farm is concerned. So it should only be 10 behind or something like that. And in a matchup into the Twisted Fate that is so incredibly uh, lane dominant, especially in the early stages against melee champions, uh, it's not the end of the world here for DRX on the top side. Yeah, I mean, the expectation is going to fall behind. We do see uh, the Comet, which is a typical take for uh, Aatrox. We saw this originally when it was like Aatrox and our meta. Yep. But just if you're able to land those combos, get a Q in, you can just sweet spot and result in the Comet damage. Uh, but ultimately, it looks like Rascal hasn't really found any window for good trades. So Zaya's played it pretty well. Uh, and he's the only one in the game with a lead as a result. Obviously, he does cheat, so he has extra gold yeah. as a result. Bit of added money uh, for the Twisted Fate, but still. DRX definitely just looking so much better than the previous game. Maybe this is that happy game you were talking about. Maybe this is the opportunity for T1. And I hope, I, I kind of hope that it isn't because I really do like undefeated streaks. Remember, it was very sad when Faker's uh, LeBlanc finally lost. It took a, a while for that to happen. But it was uh, pretty hype. It was definitely hype in a game five at MSI the very first time of yeah. uh, that tournament Perhaps we happening. can save the hype of yeah. the Orky loss for, you know, maybe like a big playoff game. Yeah, there, there is an MSI coming up, so we could uh, utilize that one. But it might happen just here, but uh, Gumiushi is going to try and stop that as the heal does have to be utilized. You mentioned the bar barrier from earlier. That is uh, on cooldown, but actually an even trade in the end as Teddy just trades for the uh, the culling. Yep. Uh, oh, yeah, Tidal Wave actually going to be utilized here as Kerry is in so much trouble. Piercing Light comes down. That is going to be Teddy locking down the kill onto the Lulu, and no rel required for that one, really. Yep. And it was so clear that everyone watching and Carrier knew that he was dead in that situation. Doesn't yes. bring flash, doesn't bring ult, saves all his cooldowns, accepting the fate. Uh, so when he does return, which is pretty fast, he's already running back over with the home guard buff. He'll still have all cooldowns uh, if a skirmish does break out. Goom is so low already. Yeah, you can see Teddy throwing so much damage down into this Aphelios. And Sponge and Ona doing battle. Sponge, of course, knows that he has the backup from the rest of his team. His carrier does make his way down here. So Wild Growth now at the ready. As Ona going to be slowed down. Yeah, and you don't want to get baited in here. Wild Growth and Barrier back off cooldown. And Crescendum as well. Yeah, uh, definitely. Better that they just apply the pressure and don't look to capitalize more of it. It is already the Shiv Lucian. So, so much pushing power in this lane. Uh, and the thing is, if, if Guma is on a tower this low, like you're just getting chipped down by the Static Shiv. Uh, of course, they are going to go for a reset now. Yep. Platter uh, not quite able to afford the mandate, unfortunately. Not quite there just yet. That is pretty close as the chains come on through. And Rascal not going to be able to find too much more. So Zayas underneath his turret for now. So you can see that Rascal has been able to get a little bit back as far as uh, any form of control. As Faker has opted in for the uh, Hex Drinker, which we have seen more and more of. Perfectly honest. Yeah, I think before, because of the Malignant's Eclipse interaction, you were so set in those three items that people weren't going uh, Hex Drinker. Oh, Ooh, this is pretty nice. Sweet Spot does come on through there onto Zayas. Still not quite enough in the tank to really threaten a kill or anything like that, but it does look like Rascal's having a better time now. Yeah, Continue, finally found that good trade. Uh, but yeah, as I was saying, um, back then it was like the Hex Drinker delay was pretty significant, but now that three item spike isn't the same. You, so you can just build more third. And it's kind of doing a similar job to the Eclipse, where it just gives you a ton of AD. You know, the interaction between Malignance and Eclipse is gone, and as a result, isn't as big of a deal. Yep. Destiny going to be used to gate Zaius towards that top lane. Doesn't have teleport, so he has to use his ult. And now has his Static Shiv complete as well. Swifty Boots also done, so he can run around pretty quickly, get out of uh, the Infernal Chains. And now we're going to check this one out one more time. Yeah, Carrier. Like you mentioned, he just kind of knew that he was dead. Yep, and the ult obviously doesn't hit from Platter, but it's a good one, completely splitting them. So, Carrier had no choice but to walk downwards, which uh, sealed his fate. And now the mandate's actually finished, so Platter getting a recall in, specifically to pick it up there. 
Yeah. So, a lot of extra power, and already Teddy and Pleto were looking really good. As the Lucian Demption has been pretty ridiculous, as Zayas just stepping out of these sweet spots beautifully on the Twisted Fate. Not going to step out of that one as I say it, but that's a Caster Curse. And those are real. Uh, Jat reminded me of it uh, earlier on today. As Ona sidestepping really nicely, crashed down on top of him, but there's the charm to come on through from Yahoo. Ona did utilize the Twisted Fate. Uh, sorry, the Twisted Advance quite well, but now it's Sponge that's in trouble. And Faker, he delivers a package, has to flash out immediately, but the Tidal Wave not going to be enough there as the Maokai picks up the kill, and Teddy has to cleanse and flash to get himself the heck out of this one. Somehow, T1 keep themselves alive. Ends up being a huge misplay from T-Rex, just opting for the fight. Sponge misses the Q, still goes for the play anyway, but you're approaching such a dangerous position on the map, you know, going into that choke, where you don't have vision as well. It was so easy for T1 to defensively fight from there. And then the package comes in as well. And look at this. It's exactly as promised. Thank you so much. Uh, Chemtech Drake going to come on through for the soul. I did say it. Yep. That is uh, now one apiece for both of these teams. So three Chemtechs available. And with Nami and Lulu, you know, there is a bit of extra value there. Because we're going to check this fight out one more time. A bit of a mess here. Yeah, I mean... The Q misses, they approach in, but from this position, it's so hard for DRX to approach. The ult catches both carries, and also Goomer's like hitting from over the wall from complete safety. Flashes in when all the cooldowns have been burned, and it's a fantastic charm from Yehu, but it just doesn't matter. No. It just doesn't mean anything when you've already lost so much in this fight. And the, the frustrating thing is I actually think a skirmish in that 4v4 is winnable for DRX. It's what their composition wants to do. It's 14 yeah. minutes into the game. Mandate was done. You've got the first item spike for Teddy. Doesn't get much better than this. Just step one, don't focus Malka as your first target. Step two, don't engage into a sort of choke where the enemy, t enemy carries are so safe over the wall. Yeah. Um, and then don't get hit by every single button. And don't do it while Faker has package. Yeah, a lot of ifs. Yeah, there's a few things that you have to take into account, but once you do that, it that's, should be all right. That's just League of Legends, you yeah. know? You have to take a few things into account. Bish, bash, bosh, and you're good, yeah. you know? But uh, clearly slipped their mind a little bit. They the where good the part didn't actually occur. Um, yeah. That bit didn't work out. As at least Sponge going to be able to take the Rift Herald. We've seen so far today it's been, if you take the Rift Herald, oftentimes you lose the game. Is cannon secured by Rascal. Very nicely done. Yeah, I don't think it feels like Dragon, the... Higher priority objective. A lot of the time, the Herald, if you're behind, it's not even enough to break the mid tier one. Like, we know that Herald can have high value, and mid tier one's really important to try and defend, but so many times, and I imagine that's the goal for T1 again this game, is that when the Herald gets slammed down, you manage to fight them off it, and yes, the mid tier one ends up lower, but it doesn't go down. No. So, Empowered Back gonna be utilized here from Sponge. Going to be able to go back home. Does have his Frozen Heart done. Null Magic Mantle now as well, alongside it. And Teddy now just zapping minions here in this mid lane. Gumush there with red-white guns at the ready. I also love the redemption pickup from Carrier. Uh, when there's potential for a lot of poke from a pick like the Lucian, we saw uh, earlier today aiming getting poked out by Viper's Lucian and lost him a dragon. Having the redemption just being able to reset. Um, super valuable. Also got the Dream Maker. We've seen so many Lulus go the souls to slay, yeah. I hate it, right? I just, like, you're not great at proccing it on Lulu. Yeah. You know, you're gonna glitter lance them? I mean, you do have slows and your R&W, but like, Dream Maker, getting the extra damage reduction, I think has a lot more value. Yep. And in fact, I think Carrier has gone for Dream Maker more than a lot of our other supports, uh, if I remember correctly, is. All right, Ona is going to get a Magnet Storm out and is just gonna take a massive amount of damage and die. Um. Yeah, that's pretty good work here for DRX. Not a lot to fight for in the river towards yep. its bottom side, so Ona probably just wasn't expecting the whole gang to be down here. As uh, Zayas finding a gold card onto Rascal. Yeah, they, they catch him isolated, and also when... Ooh. Oh, not going to get the sweet spot on the second Q, and may just get autoed to death. There we go. Uh, Zayas going to lock that one up. That's a solo kill. As Charm, not going to be utilized, as Yehu didn't find the angle between the minions onto Gumiyushi. And we are going to see Rel charge the Rift Herald towards the inner turret. So that's a fair bit of Herald value, actually, no. as Teddy doing a lot of work on the carrier as well. I was pretty critical of the Herald usage we've had today, but that was a pretty good one. Managed yeah. to get the pick on Ona, paid off a lot. They do suffer on the top side in return. Uh, so this TF is becoming an issue, but... Yeah. Still positive play for DRX. Certainly is. 
And T1 only have a 300 gold lead at this stage of the game. This time around, and last time it was about a 6,000 gold lead. Yeah, just great angle from Sponge. And the thing is, with the uh, Knight's Vow Rush, we often see from tank junglers, a lot of your tankiness relies on someone dealing damage to give you the healing. Yeah. When you're isolating alone, you're not actually that tanky. And, uh, yeah, you know, Rascal's been trying to find these angles all game, but the Ghost is such a powerful tool in the 1v1 against the Aatrox. And they're just... Barely out of range of these Qs. Oh, Red Buffs Rascal well. look a little bit silly. Yep, and now, oh, look at the TF items, by the way. Whoa. Uh, yeah, quite a few picked up. You know, you can actually see Pretty Ted, cheesy. Ted, Teddy also has similar numbers of items, but uh, this Chef is definitely not something you want to go up against as Rascal. <laughs> no, absolutely or not. Or anyone. Yeah, uh, Sponge also not psyched about it, as we can see here. Demonstrated immediately afterwards. Uh, really glad that you mentioned that, and then we did get the immediate response that, oh, also Sponge not happy about it. We'll have to check in on Yahoo, Teddy, and Pleta to see whether they enjoy going up against the Twist of Fate, and we might get a bit of a look at that as the third dragon of the game has been started up. T1 have the banana brush control. Oh, Prime that is imperative. To start laying down poke from. Well, we do have the Scryer's Bloom, but it's actually Zayas that takes that one away from Yehu, misses the charm. It's just been so incredibly swift. It's okay, there's the steal. Sponge likely to die, but he's done his job. And there we go. Lockdown does come on through. Fans pretty psyched about how DRX are playing this one out, at least in the Stealing Dragons aspect. Faker with a package to deliver. But unfortunately, DRX just not home to really pick the... Oh, never mind. Uh, they're, they're just in their, in their summer home in the mid lane. And uh, Rascal is going to suffer the wrath of the deliveries. Yep, great move by T1. Able to turn that one around and get the mid lane tier 1. And also a kill there. Sponge trading life for the Dragon is fine. I think you'd feel a lot better if it was any other Dragon, though, uh, being honest. But you're the you're the whisperer of the of the Chemtech. Shouldn't you be the one that tells us that actually it's fine and it's a great dragon? No, that's not. <laughs> oh, that's not how that one works. Is that's not how it works. Little Snowman Teddy is immediately going to cleanse. Actually, get out of that gold card. Cullen comes on through and does a lot of damage to Zayas here as they're still looking to chase after. There's the Flash Magnet Storm as Yahoo is going to get immediately CC as he dives in and now Sponge is in trouble. Gumu she has red white and that is a dangerous time. Teddy now below 100 health. As the Destiny does come on in, and Yahoo, he's not going to survive. The Destiny doesn't really do too much as far as gate value, but still T1 going to move towards the Baron, as they love to do at 20 minutes into the game. Yeah, I mean, the fact they only got one kill isn't really the difference maker, but the fact everyone is chunked out, you know, there's an opportunity to go for this Baron. You can see Sponge moving over, but still low HP. Oh, he is very dangerous, though, as far as steals are concerned. Still slowed down by the Sapling as Faker wanting to get him out of this pit. And his setup does have the extra movement speed as well. They do have the scuttle control, and Nature's Grasp says that there is no way they're stopping this Baron from going down. So T1, give him an inch, and they will take a Baron uh, every single time. Uh, that's just how it goes. Gumushi completes his Infinity Edge as well. Item number two. Rush that one, and we're going to see this one one more time. It looked like Teddy was in massive amounts of trouble, but does manage to trade it back very well. And then things start going horribly wrong. Yeah, this is unfortunately just some difference, because if that charm lands on Aguma, I think this fight goes completely differently. But him flashing out, getting an opportunity to turn it around, dealing the DPS. And the thing is, this Ari goes to the charm, but no one's there to follow up. And the TF gets so much value in just limiting the Ari's effectiveness. Every time we've seen Yehu try and step up, it's like the threat is just there that Zeus will run at you, order you, and then also stun card you. Yeah. And the threat of this gold card has just been a bit silly. We've seen so many Twist of Fate bans over the last couple of weeks, even after the recent nerfs on this particular patch. Just wasn't enough. Uh, we kind of thought that maybe uh, Twist of Fate was kind of done, but as it turns out, and uh, from what we've seen, especially from Zeus in uh, the last couple of games, Champion is still ridiculously powerful. As Mega Cone going to deliver Carrier Gumushi towards this bottom lane. Zayas was um, pressuring the top lane. Rascal now up there by himself as Sponge and Teddy trying to convince Ona to leave the jungle. Oh, oh my god, this damage onto Teddy is getting a little bit silly. He's going to have to try and cull to stop them from doing any more damage to this inner turret as Ona suffers at least two-thirds of his health bar as all oh, the connection of the Moonshot. 
Yeah, Fake actually going to clips first rather than the malignant we typically see. Oh, kind of nutty is. Okay, Zayas just going to avoid the charm and just wanders his way out. He's so incredibly fast. The Infernal Chains do not activate and they finally... Oh, never mind. Okay, there it is. The third Q going to come on through. It took four people, not the three they initially invested as now. Rascal could be in trouble. Good Bramble Smash, but there's the crash down onto Owner as well. Still, Moonlight... Sorry, the Moonshot... What's the Moonlight Vigil? That's the one. Moonlight Vigil. The big old ultimate from Gumiushi did a fair bit of work. And T1 able to at least convince them to leave. Still, it is an advantage for DRX. They get rid of Zeus. Yeah, but it just feels kind of crazy how much had to be invested for him to finally go down. The value on that Ghost, uh, pretty massive in that situation. Able to dodge, dip, dive, duck. You know, with the... I think he could dodge a wrench. I definitely think he could dodge a wrench. Yeah. And as a result, I assume that he could also dodge a ball. Yeah, I would think so. And uh, un unfortunately, we're never going to know because none of these champions throw balls. Yeah, unfortunately, he couldn't dodge and There a are magnet. a lot of ball throwing champions. Like there's Ziggs and Oriana. And yeah, I think. Yep, cover me, cover me, cover me is what he's saying. The problem was he couldn't dodge a flat. I'll put it, I'll put it. And Aatrox, no flash. Don't worry, guys. Yep, we're um, just making sure that he lets everyone know that it wasn't because of uh, any sort of misplay. It was because flash. And that is a uh, broken ability. Wildcard's going to be avoided. And we can check in on the damage dealt. Zayas at the top of the table. And this time around, Teddy second. So some redemption for our boy Teddy. This gold card can be collected on the way oh, past actually, there from Sponge. Harry is the one who has redemption. Oh, sorry. Yes. Uh, he's also got a bell. Yep. All bells and whistles mm -hmm. put together, and, and we see DRX. I mean, the fact they got that dragon earlier kind of takes away the pressure of uh, wanted to secure all these dragons. They'll just lean top and said, "Look to take a tower." The problem is, I don't think the game necessarily gets better for them as it no. goes on. Um, so, sure, you know, by taking a dragon, you extend the game, you extend the soul timer. But do you really want to be fighting for soul at 35, 40 minutes against the T1 comp? Probably not, but I also still think that DRX, if they get into a 5v5 scenario, this composition does have legs, right? Like, yeah. you are yeah. actually able to, to always is. fight with a rel comp like this. It is Xyaless, so we're okay. Yeah, and there is no Xyaless. So it is, um, that's, it's, there are definite positives. Three items are now done for Teddy as well. Infinity Edge, Rapid Fire Cannon, and the Static Shiv, so he is very powerful. We saw that when Gumushi hit that spike in the last game, it was devastating. We'll see whether Teddy can emulate that in this game as well as we tick over 25 minutes. The end game almost upon us as the mid game is drawing to a close. Next Baron going to be up in a minute and 20 seconds. T1 wanting their second of the game. We'll see whether DRX can get themselves some vision in the area. Already you can see that control ward getting pinged out by T1 towards the top side of the map. I think Faker will be able to deal with that. I think and honestly, they will be able to make things very dark. The hardest thing when you're playing against a TF is that for a composition like DRX's, you imagine like the Aatrox, the Ari playing on a flank being so powerful. But all you have to do is plant Zeus covering the flanks. If he doesn't have vision, he can ult and just zone. Yeah. And suddenly it becomes impossible to really find those angles. So uh, on top of that, you have the saplings as well. It really is difficult. Sponge is looking for an angle here, but as long as T1 play towards this Baron side, not really much that can be done. Yeah, well, Twist of Fate towards the bottom side of the map for now as uh, Gumiushi does sacrifice his shield for Teddy. Um, and that's not the barrier shield, that's just the, the shield from Carrier. Yeah. Um, that's the value of Chemtech Drake. Just one. Yeah, that's that's the difference making. Yeah, again. that was it. Uh, and you would know better than better than most orcs, because you are you are the whisperer of the Chemtech. <laughs> in what could have been your final game of the regular season on the commentary desk. You leave us with this glorious soul. It has get to be. to see all of its value. Yep. Uh, all the shielding and healing. Oh, the and stuff. the tenacity. Everyone's so tenacious this game. Yep. There's a lot of tenacious value here. Yeah. Uh, oh, I think Faker might have Malignance, and he does have level 16. Yep. Okay. Well... And a package, if he would like it. Just gonna hold off. Have, yeah, there we go. You know, typically teams sink it with the dragon every time, but I think they've kind of realized that DRX just will opt out of contesting Chemtech Dragons. So they're like, okay, instead, Baron. We're gonna do the T1 special and just start a Baron. And you can just deliver them a package if they do decide to come on over. Much easier than going to their house, you know. Okay, with a little hop, skip, and a jump, Sponge can make it from there 
yeah. with Aaron with Flash and his W, but Kerry is looking. Yeah, they do have control vision in this area. Uh, Sponge finds himself a decent shattering strike. There's the package out from Faker. That is going to block them off entirely, and Sponge is thrown around like a ragdoll. There's the Moonlight Vigil. That's going to connect onto him as the Baron. Oh, that's going to be the cue to follow it up. As now Teddy looking for Faker here. He finds him, but I don't know whether he really wants to, as the Rockets not going to find the mark. Good sidestep there from Teddy as Destiny comes through just for the extra vision. The Mega Blast going gets them all the way away from this Baron. And Zayus, he turns up. That is going to be a gold card from a million miles away and a couple of screens. He is going to just transition into picking up the kill onto both of the damage dealers of DRX. I guess Rascal is going to be there, but he is not actually there. And uh, T1 just going to push towards this inhibitor turret in the mid lane. I, that, I felt like that play was going to work, but I didn't know it was going to work that well, you know? Yeah, I mean, I saw the angle from Sponge. I love that they try to turn into a fight instead of just going for the immediate play, but it was just so hard for them to find an avenue there. Faker raining down these rockets here as Pleta gonna have to get out of there, does flash. And DRX just, if they just stand here and take these rockets, it is just gonna be really difficult to defend this. And the first Nexus turret is gonna go down. One Siege minion remains, so they're not actually able to stand in range of the uh, Nexus turret there. So Teleport is gonna come through from a flank here, as Yahoo wants to find an opportunity. Should be able to wrap around, but I don't know what he can do as a uh, a lone Ari, as the rocket is going to connect, so not even able to come in at full health. So he's just yeah. supervising them. Oh, okay. So and he's he going to try his in. hand. Okay, and uh, tidal wave is beautiful, uh, but doesn't really do anything at all. DRX now just looking for Soul Point. If they can possibly get it. Uh, Zeus is going to say no. You're not allowed to have that. As the uh, yeah charm goes entirely wide, and Zeus just does so much damage. There is. The twisted advance forward from Ona, and Redemption going to come on through as well. Faker collects the kill onto the Nami that was delivered. And Sponge going to jump over his own base gate. Say it's just, as soon as he has that gold card above his head, he is so incredibly scary. And there it is. Stun going to come down onto Sponge. But wild cards do not connect. Not that they really do all that much damage anyway. Four items twisted fate is pretty silly. Yeah. Yeah, he has Infinity Edge as well. So, he, you know, you know if you take a lot of autos from him, it'll hit, but he just chunks now. Yeah, well, there's a Magnus Storm trying to do something here, but Ona not too worried about it, as we can see, and Sponge is just going to be taken down pretty unceremoniously. Zayas now looking for Rascal here as well as he's tanking up the turret. And the Nexus is just going to go down T1 with a very comfortable 2-0 to move them towards playoffs here. And they are going to just take a little bit of a timeout in the first round as they have confirmed second place. Yeah, managed to lock that in with this win. So it was a match of stakes here, but pretty convincing. You know, I think T-Rex, at least we saw more life in game two, but T1 still leagues ahead. And Zeus on this Twisted Fate, it's so funny because you often see like the TF does the whole, you know, destiny in a second and like a teleport to get behind them. It really feels like he kind of uses it as like a long dash, you know? Yeah. Like he throws an auto, and while it's still in the air, he turns up behind you and throws another. It was pretty ridiculous, sort of watching how incredibly quickly he was moving around the map. So I think that POG is once again not going to be a, uh, a question mark as far as is Faker going to catch up to Chovy because that one was already done. And I think this one is no question mark either. I think Twisted Fate is probably the one to vote for. Zayas looking absolutely fantastic in this game. Faker going to give a good old thumbs up. Wasn't really the main character of this particular series, but they didn't really need too many main characters. No. As like, Gumiushi also just uh, always pretty good at these celebrations. Yeah, I feel like it was a pretty convincing one. And uh, yeah, I mean, we could say congratulations <laughs> to, to Chovy for winning that one. We won't get to see him play again, but he's able to get first in POG. Yeah. Uh, so. Genji winning out from this series as well. Yep. Uh, I'm not sure whether the T1 Challenger team is really going to take too much away from this one uh, as far as, oh, that's what we should do here. That's what we, ah, this is the play. Um, because they just kind of rolled over uh, DRX in this particular game. Yeah, perhaps some takeaways from game one, like don't pick Zaya in that situation. That's true. Takeaways on the other side of things, certainly up and available. Yeah, and ultimately I think DRX that we're moments throughout the season where we saw them shine and we thought, hey, you know, maybe there's some potential here, but it just never really came through. And moments like this, which were so close uh, and yet so far away from finding success in this game, 
This one, I think, is the one that hits the most. This one is, I feel like, the play that really cemented T1's advantage, because at this point in the game, uh, they should be winning. And it's just the angle, the position where they took the fight from into that brush was so bad for them. Yeah, and Ona tanking up all of the damage, then gets a wild growth to get all of the health back, and doesn't quite work out. This was a good moment for DRX. I mean, Ona was uh, just picked up and taken down, so that's certainly good news. Is uh, Then Zayas sort of started the fancy feat. Yeah. And this, uh, this solo kill really did just start the snowball rolling, and then the Twisted Fate just threw so many decks yeah. of cards at DRX. I feel like DRX. Ona has a pretty good understanding of the range of uh, Aatrox Q. I, I wonder how he managed yeah, to... Yeah, Zayas is pretty good at that, yeah. I wonder how he managed to learn exactly the range of the Aatrox Q. Yeah. I guess maybe he has a decent amount of experience in the champion. He may have played Aatrox a couple of times. Yeah, maybe this season, you reckon? Yeah, I'd, I'd say so. Um, this season, last season, um, many other seasons as well. Yeah, uh, and this one, again, can't fault DRX for the approach on this, trying to look for the fight instead of trying to go for the steal when they've been spotted. But unfortunately, not able to find the results. I think no one was just close Which enough to the initial engage. Oh, and then here, uh, they kind of just get... Yeah. I'm going to delay their backs, is what they're sort of talking I don't know whether delaying their backs is really going to be that important. And looks like T1 are just having a pretty good time. And watch, watch out for Aatrox, watch out for Aatrox. And Kerry pulling out Polymorph cooldowns. Polymorphing Aatrox if we need to. And it doesn't look like they really need to. Yeah, yeah. I love that just Zayas teleported behind them and just cut them off. Oh, and it's like, yeah. oh, it's our Nexus now. Yep, they're like, let's just end. And they did. And they didn't celebrate too much afterwards either. This time, Teddy doing four times the damage of last game. Um, that's good news. Zayas also doing double that of his opposition and change. And this Twisted Fate. Uh, we mentioned that maybe it would have been a decent ban uh, earlier on in uh, in, in this, but... Did you mention it? I'm not sure I remember you I, uh, I, I said something about it. Yeah. Uh, but I know. think the other bands were probably also pretty valuable, and I think the nameplates on is the biggest issue here. Mm. And so now we are going to head over to the space first off. Um, yep. And then we're going to have a full interview with all of T1 and a full interview with all of DRX as well. And so let's hear from the space, see what they have to say about that game. Yes, up next is the space. Thank you so much, casters, for your wonderful work today. I give this one a thumbs up, a dabong from Faker. Uh, 11th anniversary, by the way. He did not get the POG in the game number one, so he will not get the POG of the split. That will go to Chovy, the player of the split, it's called. But uh, still a 2-0 win from T1 at the end of the day. And this time, Faker had a better game in game number two. Was a bit closer, though. Like, I felt like DRX had some nice moments earlier on, but not able to quite challenge here. Another win for Lucian Nami looking kind of okay. And another not Zaya in the draft. Hey, we're happy. <laughs> Big thumbs up. Yeah, that was, that was really our main takeaway. I, I, I'm i genuinely wondering if teams are like, okay, so next patch, playoffs patch, crit items are getting buffed, Aphelios is back on the menu, and we just pick it in preemptively. I don't know why else he would just start suddenly cropping up again, but I do actually think that the buffs that we do get on the next patch, Jinx might be back as well, so a little meta shift might be in our futures, and maybe that's why they picked it here, because I, I don't mind Aphelios. He's been gone for a while. Um, picking the Aatrox into the uh, Twist of Fate went okay for Rascal. You know, it didn't go as badly as it has in the past. Obviously, Twist of Fate's been nerfed a little bit, but, you know, obviously he still ended up winning the lane and, and popped off quite solo a bit. Solo killed, yeah. But he did get solo killed. But, like, you know, normally when we see this matchup, the Aatrox is pushed in and has no agency whatsoever. At least Rascal was able to handle that. I'm just trying to give some positives here for DRX and their final series of the split because, you know, it was otherwise just a one-sided 2-0 series. Yeah, definitely was. I I was I did cringe a little bit when I did see the Aatrox pick because in general, as you know, we expect it shouldn't do that great, but um, was okay until the solo killed, maybe a little bit too deep in the enemy jungle, and did get punished for that. But uh, this early game did go decently well for DRX. You'll see even the, even in the beginning of this fight that it was kind of close until the very end. Nicely done there by Owner on the sidestep, and they still end up going for it. And unfortunately, it's that little bit of damage that actually could have been the difference maker. Uh, Sponge also here ser uh, serves as a vehicle for owner to get out. And the problem is, as the cost is highlighted as well, 
you need to win the early game with this composition. Like, you cannot have it go to late. And it's very close. A couple of micro things and DRX. Uh, I, I don't know if it would have been enough to win the game, but at least they would have been able to maintain this lead. But from here on out, with the scaling of T1S, it just feels so tough. Yeah, and I mean, you're trying to push your advantages early because you know your comp's going to fall off a cliff in a huge way. The charm was really nice there from Yahoo. I think his Ari is, you know, suddenly becoming quite a formidable force here in the LCK. We'll have to wait and see what he does with it on Summer if it's still relevant, but pretty good fight for DRX, all things considered. Yeah, I think on the topic of Yehu, we should almost definitely see him for Summer as the main guy. He was the main guy for the second half of the split here for DRX, and feels like he's only getting better and better, so, you know, this was a 0-2 loss, but that does not it's not really indicative of what this guy is capable of. Um, let's take a look at the second highlight as well. We did have this fight around the mid lane, which, uh, again, Decently close, you know, there was a steal on this dragon, but uh, eventually T1 were able to take it down. Yeah, just a steal would have been fine if they just gave up Sponge, but a little bit more happened. I really like how Faker is just threatening here, making sure that he can come over and set up a package if anyone wants to come up and stop the mid turret from coming down. And Rascal, he stays here trying to defend said mid turret, and with the flank from Faker, which they knew that he was flanking, he was seen. I should have just given that one up because he will die and they will lose the turret. And this is, of course, opening the map up immensely. And this is a big swing of gold into T1's favor because they were, you know, decently ahead until this point. And then, yeah. I understand DRX wanting to push it as much as possible. And it feels so enticing when Guma is there. But it just... This is exactly why you pick the Athelios Lulu, right? It's these, uh, these type of turns where your initial engage just doesn't end up working out. Yehu, sick charm, fla uh, flash charm. There's no damage. There's no follow up. Uh, that the, the, he cool. was just alone. Looked cool. Did hit the skill shot. You just see in these moments the pressure uh, onto DRX. You know, it's their potentially last game of the season. Their comp is already waning. There's not really much they're going to be able to do if they don't make something happen here. So, double down trying to save the turret. Double down on how long did T1 stay? Did they stay too long? Um, but yeah, it's Aphelios Lulu. Yeah, and you know, we were seeing the TF and how much value it had in this game, even after all the nerfs to his damage. Doesn't matter. I mean, the gold card is just so oppressive. Like, I think he got three or four in that one fight alone, and he just barely dodges the bubble, moves back in, hits one more gold card, and then it's just like another kill just like that. It's kind of insane, especially because it's ranged and... That's why I think uh, this pick is still being picked, regardless of the nerfs. I don't know if you can nerf it other than like more cooldown on W or something like that, but uh, it's just the way TF functions, I guess. Yeah, we actually looked it up, and there, are, out of all the champions at the point and click CC, almost all of them are meta. Right? There's some edge cases like Ramus, where the rest of the kit doesn't work, but Vi, Nautilus, TF, uh, point and click CC, even at the highest level, is just so strong. And we even He's saw Ramus. Ryan we did. Rue, Maybe with the skin, <laughs> Durian Defender, he's coming back. I love that skin. Yeah. And I can't wait to play it. It happen. But guys, we do have the POG ready, so let's see who does pick it up here for game number two. As this time, it will be Zeus on the TF. This is not a surprise. Uh, not only did he end up crushing this lane, punishing some of the big overextensions here from Rascal, like this one, uh, but he also had some flashy plays around the map, was able to peel for Faker with Gold Card. And the spacing on this man with the Swifties and his Ghost, super insane. And then this play we've already just discussed where he helps peel for his teammates and then allows him to re-engage the sidestep on the bubble. Guy's just good at this pick. My favorite part was when he used it as like a small dash to get behind after he already set up the pick. I hope we get that one in the highlight as well because it was very funny. It's here, and right? Yeah, and wholly unnecessary, but he went for it anyway. Right here. <laughs> yeah, look at that. <laughs> He's like, we're not done. Ends up going down, but uh, it's going to do so very happily. And it's originally the spacing on his Nar that I think really made us go, man, this guy is good. So seeing him play the TF is really exciting. So based or cringe on the other two votes? What are we thinking? Uh, I think third media guy is always a little bit. I think the carry I vote, actually also kind of based, to be honest. Like, yeah, yeah. I, yeah, good wild growth. Yeah, I, I voted for Peter yesterday, so I can't. I really I can't <laughs> talk smack here. Like the wild growth vote is fine. Yeah, I mean, it was a good Lulu game. You know, there were some critical moments where he, like, just barely got the shield down. We saw that in the first highlight where he just barely kept Owner alive and stuff like that. I think it's okay. Uh, third media guy's always kind of off on his own, doing his own thing. We never really understand him fully, but um, definitely some fun times. And, guys, we do have the team interviews ready now, so I'm going to hand it over to G-Sun for the big translation.
Thank you very much, guys. This is Jason for the post match interview translation, joined by the entire T1 squad after their victory up against DRX today. Congratulations on the win, guys. Let's start off the interview with Zeus. You secured your spot in the playoffs round two with the victory of the last match of the regular season. How do you feel? We had to win in order to secure second place, and I'm happy that we got a very clean win. And you performed very well on your back-to-back -back Twisted Fate series. And Twisted Fate, in general, is sitting on a very high win rate. How did you feel when it was let through twice today? I think at this moment, TF, as long as he can, you know, scale decently, he's really strong. And he's a very versatile pick, so I think it's a really good card at the moment. And you won PUG on TF in game 2 as well. Have you practiced this champion a lot recently? I mean, the skill mechanism is pretty simple, to be honest. So you just need to have good mechanics, you know. It all comes down to the pilot. You have to warm up your fingers well in order to, you know, pull off those plays. It's not about the talent. It's more about how you are performing that day. What kind of play can we expect from you at playoffs? What is your goal? Well, to be honest, I don't think I was able to kind of display and make a big statement with my performance recently so i really wish i can come back as a strong top laner at playoffs owner second place to close out the regular season and you're heading to the playoffs round two how do you feel yeah, we had to win to make it to the second round directly. And I'm really glad that we got to get a very clean win today. And game number one was your 300th LCK game, and you even won a POG on REL. Congratulations on that as well. Are you happy with your performance today? Yeah, pretty much. You know, it was a milestone game for me, and also a very important match for T1 as well in order to to, you know, get the second place spot. So I'm really happy that we achieved a very good result. Is there any particular team that you guys are cautious of? I want to say every team that made playoffs has potential and they're pretty strong. So regardless of our opponent, I just wish T1 can display the best performance possible. And Faker today is your 11th debut anniversary. What a record! I mean, you have played so many different regular splits so far, but how do you look back at this one? We had a big meta shift this season. And, you know, there were a lot of situations and, you know, fun moments throughout the season. So I'm happy that we got to, you know, have a great time together as a team. And with this win, your Corky is now having a 22-game winning streak only in the LCK. Does Corky mean something special to you? Well, Corky requires a lot of support from your team, so... I gotta say, I got really lucky and I was in a really good circumstance in order to kind of continue that win streak. And we are so excited to see T1 perform at best of fives now. How are we gonna prepare for the playoffs? I can say we have a bit of a time to prepare, so I want to focus on our our, you know, strategy, our performance, and make sure that we are performing at the best condition. And Gumayusi, first season after winning Worlds, what was your mindset and resolution heading into this spring season? It felt like we just won Worlds and it started right away, so it happened so quickly, so I just wanted to make sure that I can perform at my best level. 
then mm, what do you want to show in the playoffs? Playoffs has a different kind of, you know, style. It, it's a very different kind of format. So I just want to make sure that we can, you know, enjoy every match, but also make sure that we can win LCK. And today, T1 CL players are here to support you guys. Anything you want to say to them? <laughs> as far as I know, they close out the season as 8th or 9th place, so, you know, you guys gotta step it up, guys. I wish they can perform better at the summer season. Uh, piece of advice coming from Guma Yusi, who just finished 2nd place uh, in the LCK regular season. And Karia, it seemed like you were in a very good mood before the game started. Uh, I was I was like smiling or like laughing before the match started like during the walk up because I did a 1v1 with Rascal and he was so bad so I thought it was so funny. <laughs> Looking back at the entire spring season, what was the good memories and what could have been done better. The good thing was that we were able to play without feeling too pressured. You know, we kind of figured out how to deal with the pressure, but still we lost three matches and I think that's a lot for us. So I think we should have played better and lost less. Any team you want to face before anything you want to face at the playoffs? I mean, I want to say all the LCK playoff teams are really strong. They are all, you know, strong enough to win LCK title. So I just don't want to let our guards down. And this TK fan sign says, Karia, let's live happily ever after." I mean. Drawings can make everything, you know, look better. They can romanticize everything, but Tom Kent is too ugly to make it happen. Too bad. And Faker, lastly, you know, today during the walkout, T1 players are holding a cute top bird with their signature pose. Anything you want to say to all the T1 fans out there? Playoffs is right around the corner. I hope we can kind of show everything we prepared and make sure that we can, you know, bring the best experience to the fans as well. Thank you so much for your support. And that was the team interview joined by the entire T1 team and now we will be joined by the DRX players. Please welcome Rascal, Frog, Sponge, Yehu, Teddy, and Plata. Please give it up for the DRX players who worked so hard throughout the season. Rascal, it was another regular season with DRX. What are your thoughts after finishing the last match? Well, personally, I feel so sorry for my teammates, you know. But still, as a team, we were able to stay strong and give it our all, so... I want to say we just closed out the series with no regrets. You know, we tried so hard until the very end. So I want to say GG's everyone, great job. What was the most regrettable part? My personal form and also as a team also, like I think I could have kind of showcased a better teamwork, but I don't think I was able to pull it off, you know. Despite the fact that I'm being the captain, I was not able to, you know, be a great leader, so I want to say sorry. What can we expect from DRX in the summer season? On a positive note, I think there were still some moments where, you know, we were able to do a decent job and we just as a team had a great time together, you know, we were able to build a really good bonding within our teammates. So I hope we can just continue this vibe, you know, and try to stay strong as a team and do better at summer season. Frog, you made your debut at the LCK at the end of the spring season. How was it? 
I was really, really nervous, you know? I really wanted to kind of prove what I can do, but I was so nervous that I could not just play at my best level. What are your goals as a top laner? I really want to just work hard in order to be remembered as one of the, you know, best pro players. Next up, Sponge. This is also your rookie season. How was the experience for you? After, you know, I was able to debut at the LCK, I got to compete with the best junglers here, so I got to learn a lot, you know. Learning lessons was the kind of the main theme of the spring season for me. Then what kind of jungler do you want to become in the upcoming summer season? You know, I just want to become a very solid uh, jungler who, no, who never loses into any junglers he faces. And Yehu, you got called up in the middle of the spring season. Looking back, how was it? Well, I cannot really say I'm fully satisfied with the performance, but still, all together as a team, we were able to grow so much. So I'm looking forward to the summer season. Then how are we going to prepare for the summer? Uh, I want to focus on my individual performance and also all five players' individual performance. And also, I want to make sure that we have kind of better teamwork and better shot calling. Teddy, you have achieved the 600 wins in the LCK and also 300 wins in the LCK and 600 games in the LCK. So what does this season mean to you? I mean, I was really happy to perform, you know, but I was a little bit too caught up with my goal, which was, you know, performing at the best level individually. So I was just solely focusing on my personal performance. So I hope uh, summer season I can also be a great team player as well. I mean, alongside with Rasko, being an experienced player on the team must have been some burden as well. What kind of role did you want to play on the side of the RX? I really wanted to, you know, be helpful when it comes to, you know, feedbacks and stuff, but I was really, you know, busy trying to improve my performance, so I was not able to be a big help for the younger players, so I really regret that, so hopefully in the summer season, I hope I can lead the team really well. Anything you want to say to all the DRX fans, though? Yeah, we are closing out the season with a loss, but I want to make sure that we can perform better in the summer season. I really, really appreciate all the support. Thank you. Lastly, Pleta, you returned to the LCK as a support player for DRX. How do you feel after finishing the very last series of the season? When I first started, I was kind of worried, you know? I was always thinking, what I should do in order to become the best player. Thanks to having Teddy by my side, a very talented and experienced AD carry player, I learned so much, you know, especially about the laning phase and also mid to late game macro. Although our result doesn't really show, the numbers don't really show, but personally, I think I was able to step up so much as a player. Then is there anything you want to say over to Teddy? Any message over to him? <laughs> you guys are literally st standing next to each other, but anything you want to say to him? <laughs> I promise I will become a better player in the summer, so let's do a great job together. Fighting! What is your response, Teddy? What was that? Oh, response? Okay. Let's work hard in order to, you know, perform better in the summer. I will make sure to, you know, come back stronger. I promise. Rascal. Now that was the last match of DRX for the season. As the captain, anything you want to say to your players or the fans? Although we were struggling a lot 
throughout the season, but I really appreciate that the fans are still coming to the little park in order to support us. So. I want to promise that we will come back stronger in the summer season in order to you know, play more matches and also just showcase a better form of us. Thank you so much for your support. And this will be the end of the post-match interview and back to the space. Thank you. Thank you, Jisun, as always, for that awesome translation as we are going to take a look at the standings now and see what we have here. We're not quite at the end of the season, but we only have two matches left, guys. So, Bro, actually are, if they lose, they will get ninth place, or rather 10th place uh, tomorrow with this result for DRX, just looking at some of the standings. And yeah, I'm, I'm looking at T1, obviously, like this is a win they needed to get top two. They are round two now. I hope you guys can't hear the weird announcement that's going on behind us. That's <laughs> given the other my my co-hosts uh, pause right now. But anyway, look at DK nine nine zero. Whoa! They reached full parity. That's crazy. I didn't realize that they did the KT equilibrium. KT DK DK KT. It, it's the same. It works. <laughs> Although KT is gonna have eleven. Uh, yeah. Right. KT wouldn't lose to Guangdong on the last day well, of first, the split. We have Firex versus OK Savings Bank Breon. Can Bro um, dodge 10th place? Yeah. I mean, that's really what it's about, right? Um, and it's a, a last match, and they'll both have their team interviews afterwards. So it's kind of a fight for pride, essentially, at the end, as there's no hopes of playoffs there. And then KT versus Quantum Freaks as well. Will it be fun to finish off the day and the split tomorrow? So we're done here today, guys. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you tomorrow.